haven't necessarily thought about correlating the streams. You know, just, a, just a, a few examples of the kind of things we hope to sort of scrape the surface on um, in, our, in our time over the, over the coming days. And then you'll see a sort of wrap up um, path forward that we'll do uh, later too. So um, I guess big picture, you know, it's hard to really say what the main takeaways are gonna be at this point, but I think it's, it's pretty much a given that um, when we walk out of here, those of us who aren't already convinced of it um, are, gonna, are gonna be um, comfortable with the notion that these small shifts in average conditions, you know, the one degree of warming to date, the less than a foot of sea level rise, have already shifted um, significantly the, the, the probability of some types of correlated extremes. And the correlation structure of these relationships could change too, even if the risk of the individual variables um, didn't change. Um, but you know, large signal relative to noise, I think, is going to be a takeaway from, from some of the talks, as is, as is the case with some types of, of, of extremes. I think we're going to learn about a lot of new methodologies. We're going to hear about paleo perspectives, just to give one example. Um, we're going to hear about advances in statistics to deal with uh, multivariate extremes. Um, and I think you know, another takeaway is going to be, in some ways, how vulnerable we may be as a society in the impact sector, how close we may be um, to some tipping points, and how, as we think about limitations of climate models, as we think about how much just a little more greenhouse gas emissions could increase vulnerability of society, as we think about our sectors, you know, I think in some cases, you know, we're going to find that we may be closer to the edge than we think, just as we may also come up with a few examples where thinking in a correlated space actually suggests a little less risk than you might think if you, if you consider uh, each variable uh, independently. So um, I think I want to leave my remarks there, but um, what I want to do uh, right now is give special attention to um, Colin Raymond, who I think most of you have had a chance to interact with so far uh, as a sort of leading um, force behind the, the organization of this meeting and also the development of the types of content uh, that I just described. So Colin is going to come up now um, and tell us a little more of, of sort of his perspective and takeaways um, as we think about the next few days and also take us through um, some of the additional uh, logistics that we'll be thinking about um, to guide us in the coming days. So with that, I'd like to call Colin Raymond up. Yeah, so uh, as I said yesterday, I guess I'll repeat some of my remarks because some of you, or a fair number of you, weren't here um, last night. So, um, you know, it's very exciting to see everyone here. We're very grateful to our sponsors and the steering group for helping organize this and um, to the different other kinds of uh, administrative and uh, sort of logistical help that we've had in putting on an event like this. Um, as Valley said, we're looking forward to um, especially, I think, the discussions, but also, of course, the great talks we're going to have and the diversity of talks. Um, and, you know, at meetings like this, it's always both the formal and the, you know, formal in terms of posters and talks and informal in terms of launch discussions, breaks, um, interactions that really are the most memorable. Um, so, you know, we've tried to sort of set up the the workshop to maximize the amount of uh, quality interaction time that there will be. Um, so, yeah, so I guess one thing to note, that's a good point, so one thing to note about the poster sessions, um, we'll have signs, but the posters, since there's a bunch of them, especially today, um, for this afternoon session, about half the posters will be outside the auditorium right here where breakfast was. And the other half would be up, uh, three floors upstairs in a, in a conference room. Um, so, you know, there'll be copious signage and people flocking between those two spaces. So <laughs> if you're upstairs, don't feel like you're in Siberia or something. Um, it looks like we have this just about set up. I wasn't sure which one you have next. Ah, uh, this one. All right, so I guess we're, um, unless there's any, like, uh, logistical questions, feel free to ask now. Otherwise, I'll turn it over to... Um, our first presenter, who um, will be introduced by Radley, Anything briefly. Yeah, so uh, we are live streaming and also recording. Um, so, you know, you can watch, or you can tell anybody who is interested to watch. Um, check the microphone here. Not sure. If it's, anyway, um, I figure out that. Um, 
Yeah, and then, so we have our, our Twitter account. Many of you have probably seen on, on the website the info for that. So um, you can, you know, uh, feel free to tweet questions or comments or whatever, and we'll respond, um, you know, at the appropriate time. All right, there we go, finally working. Um, so Radley, why don't you come up and introduce Jakob. Introduce Jakob. So um, we're going to have two keynotes this morning, sort of in the spirit of the conference. The first reflecting um, the climate science perspective, and we're going to have a chance to hear from one of the real leaders um, in thinking about uh, correlated or compound extremes. From there, we're going to have a second keynote that's a little more from the decision maker or practitioner perspective to let us hear how decision makers charged with um, managing large financial assets, charged with critical issues related to security and safety um, of US citizens, how they think about extreme events, how they think about science advances, um, and how in the policy context, new information, emerging trends, for example, about correlated extremes can be integrated over time um, into decision making. So both those perspectives, I think, are going to be, be hugely valuable. Um, for our first keynote, we are going to turn to Jakob Scheisler. Uh, Jakob is an earth system scientist with a background in mathematics, uh, biogeochemistry, and climate science. Uh, he uses sophisticated statistical approaches to infer new insights from a variety of data sets, including everything from remotely sensed products, station measure measurements, reanalysis data, um, and climate model outputs. Recent research, as I noted, has focused on better understanding compound events. This is the goal, for example, of the European Cost Action and Damocles uh, projects, which bring together climate scientists, engineers, social scientists, impact modelers, and decision makers. And he coordinates national research projects on compound events. He's currently the Ambizioni Fellow at the Climate and Environmental Physics uh, Institute, University of Bern. And he's also a member of the Oshker Center for Climate Change Research. Please welcome Jakob. Thank you, Radley. Um, I feel very honored to be the first speaker of this uh, workshop on correlated extremes. And, and I would really like to thank Radley and Colin for organizing this very interesting event here. Um, I want to talk today about uh, the challenges associated with uh, studying correlated extremes. And so let's uh, dive right in. Um, the, in the 2010 summer, the city of Moscow registered uh, a spike in human deaths shown here um, by the black line. And this coincided with a spike in air pollution shown here in blue and also with very high daily temperatures. The air pollution could be clearly seen also on photographs of the time shown is here a picture from Moscow, but also very well from satellite images from space. What satellites could also see is a, a very strong uh, browning signal over Western Russia, typically an indicator for vegetation mortality. Uh, around the same time, large amounts of Russian crops were destroyed, and a lot of those due to uh, wide-ranging wildfires in Western Russia. And those wildfires were um, facilitated by an intense drought event and by a record-breaking heat wave. And while the heat wave was due to a very persistent blocking event, um, the drought was due to a precipitation deficit earlier in the year. So overall, you could argue that most of these uh, devastating impacts um, were caused by a co-occurrence of a drought and a heat wave, and, and ultimately this caused more than 50,000 deaths and about 25% of Russian crops were destroyed. And so I kind of illustrated this event backwards in time to, to show that we study these uh, events such as drought and heat waves and their co-occurrence because of these uh, devastating impacts they cause on, on human and natural systems. Personally, my background is more um, uh, historically more in carbon cycle science, so I studied a lot extremes uh, in the carbon cycle and how they're related to climate events. And so in the first part of my talk, I want to talk um, about climate extremes and the carbon cycle as one example for an impact system and then move on to talk a bit more about correlated drought and heat and then introduce you to the more general concept of compound events. So climate extremes such as extreme frost, heavy storms, heat waves, droughts, heavy precipitation, they 
um, affect carbon cycling through various different complex pathways. Uh, let's just have a look ab about uh, into one of these pathways, starting with, with a drought. A drought can lead to drought stress, uh, affecting plant, plant growth and plant health, which then influences um, uh, photosynthesis and respiration. Um, plant growth and plant health also feeds back with uh, plant, mortality, plant mortality, again affecting photosynthesis and respiration. But drought stress also um, facilitates fire or uh, increases fire risk and damage, um, again um, affecting the carbon balance. And plant, uh, drought stress can even change also uh, pest and pathogen outbreaks or facilitate those. Uh, at the end, all of these different pathways in one way or another affect photosynthesis and, photosynthesis and respiration, ultimately changing the carbon balance and the atmospheric, atmospheric CO2 concentration. So in a way, understanding um, how these climate extremes affect carbon cycling and also the current, concurrence of these extremes affect carbon cycling um, can really help us to um, also constrain carbon cycle climate feedbacks. So we have looked um, into um, how drought and heat affect uh, carbon fluxes uh, with a bunch of, uh, with an example of uh, state-of-the-art vegetation models driven by observed climate. And what is shown here is the change in flux and pedogram carbon per year plotted against the cumulative, um, as a cumulative impact of the thousand largest uh, climate events, droughts and heat waves. And in green, you can see photosynthesis, in red, respiration, and in blue, the carbon balance. And the carbon balance is um, uh, positive. When the carbon balance is positive, it means that you are losing uh, carbon to the atmosphere from the biosphere. So what, what you can see here is that droughts uh, and heat waves actually have very similar uh, effect on the net carbon balance um, over, so at, a, at the global average, but for very different reasons. So while drought lead to strong reductions in photosynthesis and slightly smaller reductions in respiration, heat waves lead to a, a small reduction in photosynthesis and a slight increase in respiration leading to the same net effect. But now the question is, of course, also what happens if drought and heat waves occur at the same time? Um, and this is shown here as a plot where we plot, where we show the compound impact of concurrent drought and heat against the sum of the individual impacts of only drought and only heat. And you can see that all these 10 models agree that the compound impact, impact is larger than if you just add up the individual impacts. So there's some nonlinear interaction happening here, even though um, there's a, um, all these models have slightly different um, sensitivities to climate. So plotted in a different way, the carbon that we lose um, if we add the impacts of drought and heat together is, is smaller than if we have a concurrent drought and heat event. So this um, begs the question, where can we expect the highest frequency of compound hot and dry conditions? So we have started from an impact perspective and, and uh, figured out what are the important drivers here, and, and then we can study what is actually the risks uh, related to these climatic drivers. This brings me to the second part of my talk, the correlated drought and heat. So um, where, where can we expect the, the most frequent compound drought and uh, hot and dry conditions, and we have to decide a bit on a, on a time scale where we study this. So um, for this talk, we will focus just on, on hot and dry summers, so compound hot and dry summers. So basically, we average temperature and precipitation over um, three-month time periods. And we can study this by first looking just at the correlation between these two variables. Um, we look at the summers here, um, it's mid-latitude, so in, in the mid-latitudes it will be the, um, the summers, but in other regions we just look at the three warmest months, so it's slightly different months depending on where you are. Um, and you can see that the state-of-the-art climate models agree um, very well that um, over land there's basically always a negative correlation between temperature and precipitation, which means that usually warmer summers are dry and colder summers are um, moist. Um, so these, these correlations are, are typically due to land atmosphere interactions and also advection, um, but I'm, I'm not really going into these processes behind these uh, dependencies. So then how, can, how, how, does, how do these dependencies affect the occurrence of compound hot and dry summers? So basically what we are interested in is 
what is the likelihood that an event falls into this upper uh, red uh, square. And you can imagine that if your two variables, uh, temperature and precipitation in this case, if they are uncorrelated or independent, then this, this probability is really small. But if they are strongly correlated, this uh, probability increases substantially. So we can define a metric, which we will call likelihood multiplication factor, as the ratio between the likelihood with the dependence divided by the likelihood without dependence. And what this tells us is basically what is the effect of the dependence between the two variables on the likelihood of having a compound um, extreme. So we can uh, go back to uh, the model output and uh, plot this likelihood multiplication factor as the model average. And you can see these uh, kind of hotspots areas of, uh, uh, so in, in the south uh, of the US, for instance, uh, northern Australia, some parts of uh, India, Southeast Asia, um, where this likelihood multiplication factor is up to four, five, even six. So it's six times more likely to have an uh, extremely hot and dry summer in those areas due to the dependence between temperature and precipitation. And of course, this depends a bit on how you, where you start, so which uh, thresholds you start with. So here we have started with 90th percentile thresholds. So in the independent case, this would be a 100-year hot and dry summer. And due to the dependence, um, this, uh, such a summer would be then a 20-year summer uh, if you have a likelihood multiplication factor of five. Since we are already looking at model output, we can also look into future changes of uh, uh, these compound hot and dry summers. And uh, of course, if you, if you uh, look at historical thresholds, then these changes will be largely driven by long-term climate trends. So in this case, um, increase in temperature mostly. So you can see that um, uh, kind of a compound hot and dry summer of a historical time period will be uh, up to 10, 15, 20 times more likely in the future, mostly due to increases uh, in, in global mean temperatures. But let's assume for a moment that we adapt to a new climate regime, maybe a two, three degree warmer world. Is there still an effect, uh, kind of a secondary effect on, on uh, this, on the compound event, on compound dry and hot summers? Uh, we can look at this by detrending, uh, by taking out the, the long-term climate trends, detrending the data, and only looking at the change in interannual correlation between temperature and precipitation. And what we see is that um, these correlations tend to um, decrease or um, basically intensify. If you remember, we started with negative correlations everywhere. So brown areas here mean that um, in those areas, the uh, correlation is even stronger in a, in a warmer world. So especially in large parts of, north, of the Northern Hemisphere, this is the case. And we can then again translate this back into our uh, compound extremes, um, compound hot and dry summers. And we see that for some parts of the world, for example here where we are currently in the Northeast uh, US, and we have an increase in 100-year hot and dry summers of a factor of, um, they, they will become 50 year events in the future. And this is basically relative to, to the new climate regime. So in addition to long-term changes in, in climate, so even if, an, if we adapt to a new climate regime in that new climate, um, we will have in those regions more often extremely hot and dry summers relative to that climate. So it's kind of a secondary effect of climate change on the dependence. Um, it's actually not so uh, trivial to study these kind of um, effects because, um, and, and this is illustrated by this figure here. And so these are two um, bi-rate distributions uh, which have both um, the same marginal distribution. So both X and Y is, always comes from a, um, a gamma distribution. And both distributions have the same um, Pearson correlation of 0.7. So with kind of with standard statistical tools, you couldn't distinguish these two distributions. But if you look more closely into the extremes, you can actually see that the distribution on the right has a higher likelihood of having compound extremes. And this is because extremes are correlated in, that in, the, in the distribution on the, side, on the right. So it's a, there's some tail dependence in the data, so-called tail dependence, which is not there in the distribution on the left. So to study um, these, these effects and basically distinguish these type of distributions uh, in the tails, 
um, we need kind of non 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 traditional statistics like uh, copula theory or multiple extreme value theory, which also has been used in the study that I have illustrated before. So in the last part, I want to talk a bit more about the more general concept of compound events. Um, let me start again with this kind of image that we may have in mind when we study compound extremes. So we have, uh, we are looking at two drivers maybe. Um, they have some dependence, um, and we we define uh, our um, compound extreme in a certain way. So here it's defined as a, a concurrent exceedance of a high threshold in both variables. There are different ways to define um, concurrent extremes. But then we typically study how the likelihood of having such a compound extremes depends on, on the distribution of our drivers. So this is the independent case. This is the case where we have uh, some dependence in the tails. Um, but um, what is actually also important is to consider is how do we choose these drivers? So how do we choose the time scale of the drivers, the spatial and temporal scales of the drivers? It's an example that I've shown before. We have averaged over a three months periods. It's a bit of a compromise between the long time scales of droughts and the very short time scales of heat waves. But if you think about uh, coastal flooding, for instance, then you, you, you're studying uh, storm surge events and heavy pre precipitation events. There maybe you are interested in, in time scales of uh, a few days or a day only. Um, so somehow the, um, how we define these drivers and the time scales of the drivers need to be informed by some notion of an impact or, or you need to know you, have, you need to have some kind of system knowledge and if your impact is here in the in the upper right corner it's illustrated by these colors here then maybe um, your choice of drivers and your choice of how you define a compound extremes is, is is a good proxy to study the system but if your impact is somewhere down here you actually need to study some other part of the distribution so you really um, need to inform your, your choices um, through the impacts. To illustrate this with an example, this here shows um, a, a scatter plot between uh, relative humidity and temperature for a location in, uh, in Africa. And um, what is shown here in the background colors are isolines for two hazard indicators. So one is heat stress measured as wet bulb globe temperature. And heat stress increases with more humid and hotter conditions, so to the upper right. Um, the, the points in um, the red points actually highlight um, the, uh, where heat stress is above the 95th percentile. So you can see it's not, not, a, uh, not a clear um, relationship with, uh, with it just if you just look at the driver distribution. But now if you look at fire risk, this is shown in the purple uh, lines, fire risk increases with um, drier and hotter conditions. So if you are agnostic about any impacts and you just want to study um, extremes in, in the climate space, um, it, it might not be a very, um, uh, very useful notion. So you kind of need to link this to, to um, a potential impacts. So address, to address these different uh, challenges they ha that I have mentioned so far, um, we had a workshop uh, two years ago in Zurich so you can actually see some of these people uh, here in the room. Um, and uh, so, so it was a much smaller crowd than we have here now. And the first thing we did we, was to ask the people, what is a compound event to you? And um, so you can see there's some kind of agreement um, that extreme is important, multivariate um, impact. You can see that there's in the different versions how to write impact and multivariate and so on. But then also other aspects were mentioned, for instance, persistence, uh, consecutive, cascade, causally related, or just a super event. And so um, I think in, in this workshop here, we will have a dedicated sections, sessions to some of these aspects um, that are part of uh, the, the notion uh, of compound events. And um, after two days of discussions, um, Kind of the idea of this workshop was a bit to build a framework or, or think about a framework how we can kind of guide the research on, on compound events and somehow this needed a, a definition also. So after two days of heated discussions, we agreed on, on this following definition. 
compound weather and climate events refer to the combination of multiple drivers and or hazards that contributes to societal or environmental risk. And so you can see that the impact made it into the uh, definition through the term risk as it is used in the IPCC context. So we are interested in events that, that somehow has, have an impact on risk. And um, the other important aspect is, of course, this multidimensionality. So for us, compound events are events that, that are some multiple things in the climate space and that lead to some, some impact. And this is a relatively broad um, um, definition and um, basically all these sessions here um, will fit in one way or another into, into this uh, notion. So with this group uh, from this workshop we also applied then for um, a cost action, which is called a cost action in, in, uh, in Europe. It's called Damocles Understanding and Modeling Compound Climate and Weather Events. It started uh, in the last September and the cost action is basically a formalized network where we have some funding to organize workshops and um, training schools and, and also scientific exchange um, with, a, with kind of a formal plan what we, what we plan to do in, in the four years while the cost section is running. And we have um, five working groups that address different aspects of compound event research. And so the working group one um, is that the idea is to build a synthesis and analysis framework for compound events to think about the classification of events um, and, and the compendium of methods, how to study them. In working group two, um, we want to interact with stakeholders and figure out what are the events that are really relevant for society, so what are the events that need to be studied. In working group three, we aim to build a meta database of impact data sets. So I've highlighted the importance of impacts for compound event research and um, there is actually, it's, it's quite hard to really get your hands on good impact data. So we want to think, we want to f uh, see what kind of databases are out there, we need to identify um, criteria for, um, for usefulness, how we can use them, and, and then derive event impact relationships. In the working group four, we want to coordinate new development, uh, this, the new uh, development of new statistical approaches. Here again, we need to see which, which methods are useful for which kind of uh, hypotheses. And finally, in working group five, we want to um, do um, realistic model simulations of compound events. The idea behind that is to figure out how good are our current process-based models to simulate compound events. And I think this, this kind of structure could also be a, a structure for like a global compound event community, so to kind of um, look at compound event um, um, to do compound event research along these different um, categories. So with this, uh, I will leave you with uh, three take-home messages. So first, um, the dependence between drivers varies spatially and controls the likelihood of correlated extremes. Um, climate change can affect this dependence. And um, Maybe very importantly, uh, the identification of relevant drivers in their spatial and temporal scales need to be informed by impacts. Thank you. Thank you, Jakob. That was great. Um, just what we were looking for. Um, I'm next going to introduce um, our, our second and last keynote, uh, Kate White has spent 31 years uh, with the Army Corps of Engineers. She has BS, MS, and PhD um, in civil engineering. She's the lead climate preparedness and resilience um, officer for the Army Corps. She's also the 2019 Engineer of the Year. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with Kate um, on and off for several years now on some um, sea level rise task forces, some interdisciplinary um, interagency uh, groups thinking about um, sea level rise scenarios at that interface of tail risks of what the climate science tell us, but also how decision making, uh, comfortability with different risk profiles um, need to inform um, uh, the advances in those in those science. Um, Kate always provides a balanced perspective as someone who understands the science, um, but also can help orient 
um, eager climate scientists around the need to think about the actual decision questions um, that engineers face, how they deal with uncertainty, and how they've dealt with uncertainty of various types, including correlated uncertainties, um, in prior work and as they think about the sort of long-term um, perspective and needs of, of, of large agencies uh, as they evolve. So I'm really thrilled um, that we have Kate's perspective here for this keynote um, and throughout the conference. Please welcome Kate White. Thanks, Rodney. Thank so this is, this is the one that, is this the one that works here? Yeah. Okay. I don't want to stand behind here because I, A, can't see you, and B, you can't see me. Um, so yes, uh, Corps of Engineers, most people don't know what it is, so I'm going to talk a little bit about it just to give you some famil familiarity and talk about the kind of issues we're dealing with actually this week, last week, next week, and the, for the remainder of this summer. Oh, can I use this instead? Yeah. All right. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, so this is um, the Corps of Engineers, as in, in its title, Army Corps of Engineers. We work partly for Army and the Department of Defense, supporting military. And then we also work partly for Civil Works. And people sometimes question, what is the Civil Works mission? So there's 34,000 of us. Uh, about 5% are actual Army officers, so we're led by a three-star general. We have a couple of two-star generals in our headquarters, and then they're scattered around. Um, but for Civil Works, we deal with water. So it's the entire water cycle. It's from the mountains, it's down through the dams and reservoirs, it's the navigation systems and the locks and dams, and it's the harbors and ports. Um, and so we deal with a lot of these things. So we have uh, 293 locks, um, 12,000 of miles of inland navigation channel and 13,000 of intercoastal waterway. That's a lot of sand and sediment to move to keep uh, shipments going. Um, we have 556 reservoirs um, some of which produce hydropower, so that's about a quarter of the U.S. hydropower production. Um, and we also support non-federal hydropower. That's when a private company comes in and says, we want to use your dam and we want to make hydropower with it. So it's all about water for us, and it's about kind of ensuring that we can move water to be in the right place at the right time to make sure that we don't end up with the kinds of flood situations that we're dealing with today. So when, I, uh, when I'm kind of in my normal life, Looking at the world here, I'm looking at the NOAA uh, Advanced Hydrologic Pre Prediction System. And these are the USGS stream gauges in the US, and all those uh, magenta colors are in major flooding, and the dark red are in uh, moderate flooding, and then we go down to minor in orange. So I, when I look at this, I see the Mississippi River trace there in orange and magenta, and I see the red-white Arkansas to the left in the lower part. I see the Missouri Platte in, in Ohio also showing up as having a lot of issues. And the, the problem for us is that this means that our reservoirs are starting to fill up. So I'm leaving that thing up in the top so that you can see it. And this is um, Sunday when I was looking in, interior to the core and I was looking at our different reservoirs and I'm looking at the percent full of the reservoirs. All right, and this is important because if they are full, we can no longer control the water. Water coming in equals water going out. And that means that downstream areas are subject to flood. So you see a lot of dark colors up there. That means between 75 and 100% full. So here's the area around Oklahoma and Kansas, again on Sunday, and you see a lot of filled dark circles. That means we have no more capacity to control. Okay, and so for a water manager, the thing that comes to mind for me when I think about correlated extremes or successive events is, has this happened before in recorded history? It's definitely outside the observed history, but there's plenty of recorded history that we can look at to see. So at the beginning of this year, it looked like 1950. And as we started moving on, it looked a little bit more like 2011 when we had the upper Missouri and the snowpack situation. And then now we're getting into the 73 and 93, which were big floods for the U.S. So these are the kinds of things that we're looking at to try to figure out in real time how to take action and understand what we're going to be doing. So well, I guess this is my previous slide set, which is OK. Um, so when we look at the um, Mississippi River and tributaries, this was built after the 1927 <coughs> flood, which was the largest flood that the US had in, in observed history. So we had stream gauges then, although they were fairly sparse. Um, but the Mississippi River and Tributaries project really was designed to handle a large flood. And the answer that, they, that the engineers gave to Congress in 1927 was, 
not to build more dams and not to build more and higher levees. It was to move those levees away from the stream channels to give the river room to flow. And it was also to build very large floodways to divert water away from the channels. Uh, so we had some levees. We made improvements in the basin so that the flow would, would keep on um, hopefully being, uh, had the hydrograph decreased. And then we'd stabilize channels so that they wouldn't erode. Uh, but all of these things were supposed to be working together. So this is about um, a 67 to 1 benefit to cost ratio. And I put that there because federal improvements are made based on benefit to cost ratio, right? We don't make them because somebody said, there's a flood here and I'm going to build something that's going to uh, be the same height as that water level or maybe a little higher. It's about benefit to cost. If there is no benefit, it's not going to get built. So this system is actually still in, being built today. Um, right now, our New Orleans district, which is down at the bottom there, that 1250, I don't know if I have a point, it doesn't really matter, down the 1250, down at the yellow. Um, we managed the Mississippi to keep 1.25 million cubic feet per second at New Orleans and not go higher than that, because that'll cause flooding from the riverside. So right now, um, today, we've been in flood for 216 days um, uh, consecutively at New Orleans, which is, a re which is just about a record, 225 days in 1973. And we're going to definitely break that record with the amount of water coming down the river today. So we are now in an area where we're having difficulty controlling the kind of flow that's coming in. So an example is our Bonnie Carey spillway operation. So the Bonnie Carey spillway is the spillway that's closest to New Orleans, and it diverts water out towards Lake Pontchartrain. Um, the spillway takes a long time to open. These cranes have to go out on the spillway and they have to pull out the stop logs and then they have to place them safely. If we do it in an emergency, we can do it in a matter of days, but then we're just chucking all those stop logs. They just pull them out and throw them down in the river. So we try to save them because, again, federal investment. But the interesting thing about Bonnie Carey, when you look at the record, um, this was part of the 1927 flood uh, design. It was completed in 1931. Uh, 37 was the first major event that had opened, and you see on the order of years down on the left-hand side, you see that 2019 we've opened it twice. It's the first time ever we've opened the Bonnie Carey, Carey Spillway twice. And also 2018 we opened it last year, so it's the first year back-to-back. -back. So it's actually a pretty long record if you go back to 1931 of operations here. Uh, and we have, we're opened again on May 10th and we're still operating this and now we've just opened the Morganza spillway which is the next big spillway up and it's only the third time since that was constructed in 1954. So we're dealing with a lot of water and there's still plenty more to come and these are the, this is like on the ground what we care about. How do you design for this? How do you operate through this? How do you get people out of the way? And probably more importantly, how do you prepare in the future so that you're not dealing with this? This is the last, this is the first version of the talk, not the second. That's all right. So um, it's not just flooding that we care about. You know, we care about those droughts. We care about things like navigation. If there's anything that this country um, runs on, it's the economy and it's moving goods and services. And navigation is very important to that. And that's really the purpose of the Corps since about 1802 was starting that navigation mission. The thing is, though, our infrastructure is old. So this top graphic shows the dates of construction of our jetties. We have about 300 jetties. And now more than 50% were, were built 100 years ago, right? That's a long time. Sea level has been rising quite a while, right? So some of them are you know, getting around to a foot or a little more than that. But even recent construction is impacted. So this is a, one of our hurricane surge barriers on the New England coast. And on the left, it shows that it was um, designed in 1962, put into place in 69. It's already lost about a half a foot of structural height. And depending on the sea level scenarios, it's going to lose more. That means that navigation gate is going to be closed for a longer period of time. And it also means that interior flooding is going to be filling up the, the, uh, the basin behind it. So for us, it's an operational issue uh, entirely. Um, thinking about how many more times we're going to be operating this gate, which means that it has to be replaced earlier. And then, at what point do you just say, we're closed so much, we're not going to operate this anymore, right? Surge is going to come in. So even inches really matter for us. So this is the Inner Harbor Navigation Canal uh, in 2008 with Gustav. And uh, what you see there is an old eye wall, and you see in the canal water is starting to flow over that. So we didn't actually have a major event at this point in time, 
but we were just, inches really mattered. And the thing is, though, that precision of inches, what we'd, be, we'd be happier if we were, had a robust description of that, not a really precise model that told us something. We'd rather have a scenario so that we could understand what our potential risks were and then design to maybe avoid this. Because as any hydraulic engineer will tell you, when you see overtopping like this, you've already failed. This, this would be a failure. Because the more overtopping you get, the more water you get on the land side. So this is what we're dealing with. Um, so for the core, what we try to do to, to deal with this, and I think this fits in with what Jakob was talking about with these events, is prepare, anticipate, pre-plan, stockpile. Right now, it's a lot of sandbags and a lot of geotextiles and a lot of ways that we're dealing with expedient flood risk measures. But really, preparedness pays. Um, there's a National Academy study saying sometimes four to six to one payoff. The Corps' own studies show more like nine to 12. So every dollar invested maybe gives you between nine and $12 in avoided damages. And what we'd like to do is remain on the side of avoided damages. So we prepare for them. We want to absorb the failure. We want it to overtop for longer before that structure fails. We want it to fail safely when it's going to fail. Okay, so these are things that they're very messy. They're not uh, tidy numbers that you can design for, um, but they're the ones that really allow us to work. And I think for recovery, everybody wants to recover quickly, but the real issue is recovering wisely. And we have a history of not recovering wisely. We go back in and say, we're going to rebuild. And then we build exactly the thing that was destroyed this time. And we can't afford to do that anymore. Um, Bradley said last night that, you know, our, and, and Michael Oppenheimer said last night that we don't have enough money to keep doing this. We have to do a better job in this. And it's a public policy, political, socioeconomic problem that we need to start working with, whether we're scientists or engineers. And then, adapt or transform. So climate change adaptation is one way to respond to these things, but the transformation is what we're actually going to have to do. We have to transform so that we just are much less at risk than we are today. And the events that are going on today are ex exactly what's gonna to continue to happen in the future. We need to find out why these things are happening, how we can maybe predict them better. What are the long-term persistence features that are leading to these events that we can start to say, yes, you now are increasing this in this area of the country, so now that's gonna change your zoning laws. Things that federal agencies can't deal with. We can't deal with zoning, property laws, uh, insurance, or anything like that. We can simply uh, deal with the, um, the infrastructure that's required to build it. So the next for our uh, climate change adaptation policy, the idea for us is to reduce vulnerabilities and improve resilience. That's a pretty simple bottom line. And it's using the best available and actionable science. So it's not the latest science, it's the, it's the best actionable science that we have available. And this idea of actionable science means there's some kind of a consensus. It could take us 30 years to plan, authorize, design, appropriate, construct a project. We can't be shifting policies all the way through that 30-year period so that we have to stop and start all over again or make a major adjustment. We have to have a good policy that's robust enough to narrow in the same direction as we move along. That's why we want you all to be working on the correlated extremes to help us do a better job at that. So when we design these projects, again, this is kind of a mystery to people. Um, we, we start with scoping the problem, identifying the opportunities and constraints, and moving on from there. We do an uh, alternatives analysis. What are all the various things that could help us achieve this? And then we do a cost-benefit analysis. And again, we're picking the thing that optimizes the net benefits. So I would say that pulling in the socioeconomic folks into the science, the physical sciences here, is very important because we can't do a benefit-cost continue to do it the way we're doing it now, because this last night, as was pointed out, if you have more assets, if you are a rich person or a large company of more assets that can be damaged, you are going to get federal help. But the point is that for civil engineers, we are engineers for everybody. We take a, you know, when we're registered engineers, we have an, an oath we take, and that is to be for the people. So we are the engineers for all the people, not just the rich people. And we need help from other people to figure out how to make those solutions work for everybody. So again, these are the different kinds of models that we're getting into. Now, uh, I'm, I come from more of a stats background than a, 
particularly a model background, but I think about this when I was younger, when I was a dairy farmer, we had a saying and it was, you're either a strong like bull or you're a smart like a tractor. And to me, smart like tractor is the way we want to do this. We want to have an elegant solution. We want a lot of models to back that up that we can run experiments on and test what ifs. But those um, simpler solutions, those statistical approaches, we can iterate them faster and we can gain knowledge faster while still relying on the models. You can't, it's not either or. But if we spend all our time with models, it informs our risk, but sometimes it's so precise that it's inaccurate. We want to be accurate more than we want precise for those places where inches matter. Okay, so here's, here's my background right here, my bias. <laughs> all models are wrong, some are useful. I want to use the ones that are useful. I want the models to go towards useful, right? Um, so again, this is the statistician's perspective. The surprises we've heard about, we need to know what the surprises are. We're having surprises today right now. Red, white, Arkansas, Platte, Ohio, Mississippi, Missouri. I mean, these rivers are all in flood right now. That's kind of a surprise, though. It was part of our design in, back in 1927. Um, we need to begin with our existing infrastructure. What are the conditions under which it performs for which it's designed? And outside those conditions, what are the things that cause it to fail in various ways? What are the different combinations of events? Um, and then, how likely are those different combinations of events? So I think you may have heard this called the bottom-up approach sometimes, but it begins with the assets, whether they're on the ground or whether they're coming. Um, de defining the performance, and then what is that envelope of the possible universe of, of uh, disruptions outside? So this is what these combination events are really getting. So they're not all extreme in and of themselves, but the result is extreme. Um, so again, that information supporting our assessments doesn't have to be complex. It does have to be ha actionable, and it should be accurate uh, rather than highly precise. Okay, so what matters to us depends on your investment decision. If you're a commercial real estate, your five-year uh, five year investment horizon, you're going to keep building in Miami. You're going to keep building in Savannah, Charleston, Norfolk, New York, everywhere else. But if your investment horizon is 50 years, you're going to have a different point of view. In the core for major infrastructure, we're looking out 100 years. Again, because those 50% of our levies are still in place after 100 years, and it's getting close to that for our dams and our levies and our, our locks and our other kind of infrastructure. So it matters what your, um, your decision scale is and your risk tolerance. So for navigation, we did a study several years ago. And for navigation, it's much worse to have a drought than it is to have a flood. For a flood, you just kind of stop and there's lots of different supply chains. For a drought, really, you have to just totally stop on the river and it's much more persistent. So it's interesting that we care about that risk tolerance and we use that to ourselves. So we identify those performance requirements. We do an assessment of that performance. What's the likelihood of plausible future? And what's the adaptation that we need? We had special consideration for spatial and time scales, and Bradley talked about this earlier, as did Jakob. I mean, things happen at different scales, and it's when they combine, maybe something with a longer time scale and a shorter time scale, when they combine, they can really bump up the risk immediately. Um, and again, that trade-off between precision and accuracy. So if it's a short-term horizon, is it new or is it existing? That sim simplifies your decision space. Does it, does it need to be un uninterruptible? If I'm in the Army, do I need to deploy at a moment's notice? That's uninterruptible. You have to be able to get where you're going or leave where you're leaving from. Um, for midterm, do the observed and projected changes impact that reliability? And this is why, in some cases, for sea level especially, we use scenarios because scenarios require us to look at low, intermediate, and high changes. And it doesn't seem very satisfactory to people. They want to have a, they say, use a probability. Um, but, but the way I think about probabilities is um, people want just one number, but I think about it as kind of the Rolling Stones approach, which is, um, you know, you, they're asking for the one number, um, but that's not really what they need, right? So keep, keep asking for more information um, and looking at the consequences over time. And really the key here is when do we have to take another, a change from the adaptation pathway we're on today? We need to be able to, as early as possible, move off an adaptation pathway that's unsuccessful because that re results in large sunk costs. 
When you have a large sunk cost, people sometimes just want to continue doing it. Oh, we've got a levy, we've had it for four years, we just want to build it higher and keep going, right? Well, we don't really want to do that. If it's a large sunk cost, it'll never be recovered, and if the benefit cost is continually going down on that. Um, and last, for long term, you know, how is that adaptation pathway? Continually looking at it and saying, do we need to move? Do we need to relocate? Do we need to take this other step? We can't do it ourselves as a federal agency because we don't have any, uh, we don't have any purview over land use and development and zoning. But the scientists are the people who can really start to inform people about what are the, what are the issues facing people actually. Um, you know, what are the things that would trigger people to say, you know, we just have to move, right? And sometimes it might be different classes of people. Along the coastline, the rich people are going to stay. They don't even have flood insurance because they don't care. It only covers up to $250,000 of your house. What do they care? The house is worth $5 million. So they don't even bother. But the person whose entire life savings is invested in a $300,000 house, they care. So maybe we need to be targeting those people who really need to move earlier, who don't have the adaptive capacity that the wealthier people have. So some of these questions really point us in the direction of the kind of compound events that matter to us. So um, this is what I'm going to finish with, and then I'm going to have a couple comments on my slide talk that isn't up here. Um, and, and this is, in theory, theory and practice are the same, right? But in practice, they're not. So I listen to a lot of science, and I say, oh, great theory, I really like that. But what I have to do is kind of translate it down to practice because you can't go straight from theory to practice, almost in every case. Now, um, a couple of the things that we are experiencing right now for compound events, we have these successive flood events. Um, we are dealing with sea level change in these flooding events. We are dealing with um, the sea level impacting the downstream tailwater, thus conveyance, conveyance, thus raising the water levels. We're dealing with aridity and changing aridity and wildfire risks, and then followed by heavy precipitation, which impacts sedimentation. Sedimentation fills up our reservoirs, decreasing the flood storage volume and making that map of all those dark circles showing 75 to 100% full, making that happen even, even faster than it did happen before. Uh, we're dealing with ocean acidification problems. So in certain areas of the US, ocean acidification is impacting the mobilization of metals from dredged materials. Right? So it means new toxicity tests are needed. In the Pacific Northwest, where we have upwelling events in Alaska, um, that acidity during those upwelling events is, is beginning to affect cement, okay? The performance of cement, which as you all know is part of concrete, which is a very common construction material. Um, heat is impacting our materials and our materials choices. And then energy resilience, again, energy being a very large um, cons uh, consumer of, of water, especially in the middle part of the country for thermoelectric generation, we have to make sure that we're balancing all those needs. And sometimes it means that a city's going to have to build a new intake lower down for a nuclear plant so they can continue to get power to run their cooling during these events. So the kinds of events that we're dealing with in the Corps of Engineers, probably every community is dealing with maybe from a, from a different perspective. And we're just trying to balance those needs. And to do that, we need science. And we need scientists to continually talk to us and say, what are your gaps? And we have plenty of gaps. So I think I've done. So welcome back to the first session, which is on diverse approaches. We, uh, we will hear a couple of talks on different combinations of extremes. And the first talk will be by uh, Alexandre Ramos from uh, University of Lisbon, Portugal. And he's actually also the, the working group leader of working group one of this cost section that I just be present, uh, presented. Alexandra is here. Okay. He will talk about components in the Iberian Peninsula. So thank you very much, Jacob. So for me, it's a pleasure to be to be here, so far away from home, but see so familiar faces, not only from the compound event community, but also for the atmospheric river community. So my main topic will be about, I will, I will presenting two case studies, one about the extreme events in terms of floods and extreme precipitation, 
And another event on wildfires in Portugal that, that we have the huge wildfires in 2017. So the outline is just the two topics that I mentioned before, the hydro geomorphological events, the wildfires, and then the final, the final remarks. So regarding the, the extreme events that we have in terms of precipitations, we have this nice database of occurrences of floods and landslides that took, that took place in Portugal from 1865 to 2015. These events were taken from newspapers, so we have these poor guys that have to read the newspapers between 1865 to 2015, and the occurrences have to fulfill these criteria, any flood or land site, site that cause either casualties, injuries, missing, evacuated, and homeless people. So you can see that this database is highly biased towards the, the impact. This is the, they could geolocate every one of the occurrences, so the, in blue, you have the flood cases. This is Lisbon, in here, and the landslides are here in, in red. So this have a lot of cases between these these years. It was more more than 100 years of of events. In this. So what we wanted to do next, we have this kind of disaster occurrences. And we, have, and we wanted to put them into events. So to, to join them, these occurrences in events, we have at least joined three of the, at least three have to be three occurrences. These occurrences need to be three or fewer interval days, and they have some spatial coherence between, between them. Another thing, applying these three rules, we have 130 events with the total fatalities, evacuated, displaced and affected people. This is the, <coughs> the number. I want you just to stress that from these nine, 940 fatalities, half of these occurred in only one event in 67. So this is, again, highly, highly biased, this total number of fatalities because half of them only occurred in one day. So this is a, the type of events that we that we have. We have we could divide them into floods, flash floods, urban floods, landslides. Then you can have the combinations of floods with landslides, urban floods and landslides, and so on and so on. This is the percentage of events, fatalities, injured people, evacuated people, and displaced people. In this presentation, I'm only going to look at the cases where we have some floods in combination with landslides. So they correspond to 66 events. So it is more or less half of the database that I showed you before. But in terms of, for example, evacuated and displaced people, it has nearly 80% of the total number of, of people. So one thing that we looked, and I will present it here, we were interested in study what triggered uh, this kind of events. Of course, it was the precipitation, but what kind of trigger, an additional trigger that was or the atmospheric forcing that triggered this event. This is for a particular winter from 78 to 1978 and the winter of 1979. We have the event, there we have the disaster occurrences, it was floods and landslides on these, so we have also an atmospheric river which represented in these green colors here in the, in, in the main precipitation during these days. So what is important to stress here, we have this hydrological year starting from September going to the end of August. This is the accumulated precipitation, the line in orange, you can see here. This is where the event occurred. And what we have done, we have computed the climatology hydrological year. So 
we could put this 10 percentile, you have a drought or you have a not very rainy year and if you are in here in the upper part of the distribution we have a very rainy year or a very wet year so what we have done is that we took the the percentile of the precipitation before the event start in this case it was the 89 percentile and we took the final percentile where the event ended so in this case it's the 97 percentile and then we have computed this kind of kind of graph so you have the sorry so you have here the initial rainfall percentile so it corresponds to this line here this is for the events that i showed you before and you have the final rainfall percentile so it falls here in this in this case here where the end of the event finishes so what we what we can see clearly is that we have some conditional effects where we have the initial initial rainfall percentile of the event so where the event started most of the cases are in this area here so with a lot of already wet hydrological here so you have some conditional effects it is important so the soil moisture accumulated in the soil is important to trigger the event while we have this kind of events while the initial the initial rainfall percentile or the climatological hydrological year was not that rainy and but you have these kind of huge, huge jumps which is this is the maximum that we have so we started with initially 20 rainfall percentile so it was a, not a very wet year and then by the end of the period you are in the maximum here almost of the distribution and we have we, we have also separated these events having atmospheric river or not having atmospheric river the blue ones are were the ones that we have the atmospheric rivers in this case we can have persistence or clustering of atmospheric river scan occur or we can have other dynamical dynamical factors that can also play a role in this kind of events so this is what i wanted to show you for the for the floods related with the precipitation now let's look at the portugal wildfires in 2017 the portuguese wildfire is not uh, a recent problem we have in 2003 we have more than 540 hectares burn area in portugal and 2017 it was a maximum since 1980 and i think it was a maximum since since it is recorded so more than 540 hectares burned in portugal in the summer in, in 2017. So this is the burn scars of the, the wildfires. They are separated by year. So you can see two periods, one in June, which corresponds to this huge wildfire here, and another scattered one. And the, and the other one was the October in the late season, where it's kind of orange, so you have the these burn areas here, here, and also here in the center of, of Portugal. So these Portuguese wildfires in 2017, as I mentioned, it burned a lot of our forest. And one number that is very important, that it represents 60% of the total burnt area in the entire European Union. <coughs> so this number represents the 60% of the entire European Union burn terror in 2017. The June and October fires caused the, the combined then de death toll of 130 people and the economical losses for Portugal was were huge. So they <coughs> total almost 1.2 billion US dollars. However, we don't have that much insurance, so the local insurance despite being the costliest natural disaster, it only pay out to 295 million, according to the E.ON 
report. So now let's focus on the October fires. This is again the burnt area or the scars of the, of the fires. The fires occurred between the 15 and 16 October, affected not only Portugal but also Northwest <coughs> Spain. <coughs> and the wildfires caused 50, 55 deaths, includes 51 in Portugal and four in, in Spain. And one thing that is also very important is that half of this 2017 burned area occur in these two days. So it, it's in fact a huge, a huge number. So the fires occur in the late season. This is a drought index for six months, so ended in October 2017. So you can see that mo almost Portugal, the entire Portugal was under extreme drought. And if you compute the time series for this location here, you can see that it was, in terms of historical, it was the most important year in terms of extreme drought. So I want to put an animation, try to explain what, what happened to this. So I think there are some. So you have a hurricane of Ali here. And we have already some, this is 8 October, we have already here some, some fires. And then if you go, sorry about the glitches. Oh, sorry, just let me try to put this on the right position. Not to so what I, what, what I want to show you have this huge intrusion of dust air, so it was low humidity. You have the Ophelia passing by parallel to the Portuguese coast, so having the huge southerly winds. So imagine you have low humidity, huge southerly winds. It occurs late in the season, so the our firefighters were, the, at least the volunteers one, were not already in place. And we have already the, our firefighter crew in terms of helicopters and airplanes that were demobilized, so we have, compared with the regular season, we have, at least I think we have less than the firefighters that we, we needed for that time. You can see that of Ali passing by and the, and the wildfire just... So this is the, just the fire cumulus that developed in one of the, one of the wildfires. So the, the picture was taken from here. The sea, it's behind the huge cloud of, of smoke. And I just want you to, since I'm over time, I just leave you with the final remarks. Thank you very much. The next talk is given by Audrey Uyo Hi. Um, from IPSL in France about temperature and heat stress. Right? Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, attending my presentation. Uh, I'm really glad to be here, uh, even though I. Whoa, nope. <laughs> I'm really glad to be here, even though I feel like I'm a baby scientist in this room. So uh, I'm, I'm doing currently, my name is Audrey Bouillet. I'm currently doing my third and last year of PhD in France at the LSCE with Sylvie Jussom. And today I'm gonna present you a part of my work about the co-occurrence of temperature and heat stress uh, extremes. So a bit of context first, as you maybe know, a preferential warming of the hot tail of Delhi temperature distribution has been highlighted in recent decades and is also projected in the future. Uh, particularly over mid-continental areas. So the ensuing heat, stre heat stress, which is a kind of a combined effect of uh, temperature and humidity on the human health, is also projected to intensify. 
So one associated problematic <coughs> to this is that the annual and the interannual variations of the relative humidity is often overlooked when we study the heat stress uh, because uh, it is assumed, uh, we consider that temperature and uh, heat stress extreme values uh, are co-occurring during the year. So it's in this context that we, uh, we realized this work. <coughs> we wanted to answer to several research questions. First, what is the effect of the relative humidity and its variation, its projected variations in the future uh, on, the, on the, the heat stress extremes projected changes? And also how extremes of temperature and extremes of heat stress are uh, related. To do that, we study the annual occurrences and variations projected changes of both extremes between 1979 and, uh, and, the, and the end of the 21st century in CIMIP-5 simulations. So for those who are not really familiar with the heat stress, it is defined as an incomfort to a danger uh, due to the atmospheric conditions, so typically the surface temperature, the surface humidity, insulation and wind. So many heat stress indexes exist in the literature. Here we decided to focus on the uh, wet bulb globe temperature that I'll be calling afterward uh, W. And we, uh, to compute this heat stress, we use the simplified formula uh, that I display you here, uh, which uh, only use, uh, take in account the surface temperature and the vapor pressure, and the vapor pressure is computed from temperature, humidity, and sea level pressure. So how does the heat, is heat stress work? Here I present you the W uh, evolution as a function of temperature here for different relative humidity fixed. For example, in red, you have the evolution of the heat stress for a relative humidity fixed at 20%. And in blue, you have the evolution of the heat stress for a relative humidity fixed at 80%. What we can see on this uh, graph is that uh, for same increase in temperature, the heat stress won't have the same sensitivity to this warming depending on the humidity of the climate. And also, and even though I don't have the time to go in detail today, I wanted to show you the different uh, classes, danger classes that has been defined in health studies. Uh, and usually the heat stress is, com is compared to these danger classes to, to give insights, to give information on the risk, the human health risk. So to do this work, we conducted a multimodal analysis of daily simulations of 12 models from the fifth version of the coupled models intercomparison project. So between 1979 and the end of the 21st century. So for historical and the most emissive scenario for the future, so RCP 8.5. From these simulations, we took three uh, data sets, three uh, input variables, the temperature, the specific humidity, and the sea level pressure. And through different, step, different uh, steps of computation, we calculated the corresponding daily heat stress. And here I just show you quickly the list of the models we use with the corresponding number of simulations. So some results now. Uh, here I uh, show you the multi-model ensemble mean projected change of the heat stress, so between historical and the future. Uh, the steep, steep linear areas correspond to the significativity, significance. Sorry. So in our study, we define the annual extremes as the uh, average daily values above the annual 99th percentile. So here it's for the heat stress, projected change in heat stress on the left, and on the right, the projected change in temperature extremes. So what we can see is, for, is that for uh, temperature extremes, the maximum increase is located over mid-continental areas, so typically Europe, Amazonia, and Northern America. But when we look at the, uh, the projected change in extremes, uh, the maximum uh, projected change, pr pr projected intensification, are not located over these mid-continental areas and are located over Sahel, Arabia, Northern Siberia, and Amazonia. So there is a difference in the projected change in both extremes that can be explained by two main reasons. The first reason is the modulation through the relative humidity variations, the relative humidity projected change. So to assess these uh, variations, what we did was to analyze the projected change of temperature during heat stress extremes conditions. So this is a change in temperature during heat stress annual extremes conditions. 
and the same for the relative humidity, the projecting change in relative humidity during heat stress conditions. So what we can see for, for different regions, for example, over Europe, during heat stress conditions, uh, the models project in the future a uh, strong warming in, over Europe above, uh, above 7 degrees, but also project a significant drying during the heat stress extremes conditions, and this induces uh, relative moderate heat stress extremes intensification. On the other hand, for example, for the uh, Sahel region, what we can see is that model projects relative moderate warming during heat stress conditions, but a slight increase in relative humidity, and this induces one of the maximum heat stress extremes intensification uh, in the future. So that's, this is the first uh, reason explaining the difference between both extremes. And the uh, other reason is that the temperature, uh, annual temperature extremes and annual heat stress extremes may not co-occur during the year. So the, to do that, to assess, to, to investigate this, we analyze the mean seasonal cycles of the heat stress, here in red, the temperature in orange, and the relative humidity in blue. So this is for one model, and for uh, Europe, the, the mean is done on the, the European box. The dashed lines uh, correspond to the mean, season, uh, the mean seasonal cycle over uh, the historical, and the solid line represents the cycle for the future. What we can see for this region, for Europe, is that annual maximum heat stress occur when uh, there is the annual maximum temperature, so when the climate is the hottest, but also the driest. It's the same, uh, same behavior than for Northern America. I didn't show you here today. But when we in look at other regions, for example, Sahel to Arabia regions, what we can see is that first during the year, the maximum annual temperature occur when the climate is the driest, but afterward, when the relative humidity start to increase during the year, you have uh, the corresponding uh, maximum, I mean, intense heat stress season, but after the maximum uh, temperature season. What we can see in the, f in the future is that this annual bump in this region, this annual bump is enhanced uh, in the future projections and corresponds to an increase in relative humidity in this uh, specific uh, uh, region and uh, during that time of the year. So some key messages. Uh, patterns of maximum projected change in temperature and heat stress extremes do not necessarily correspond. This is explained by two reasons. The dampening effect, first the dampening effect of the drying during heat stress extremes conditions uh, over mid-continental areas and the enhancing effect of the slight wetening uh, over Sahel and Arabia. And also temperature and heat stress uh, extremes do not necessarily co-occur, especially uh, in regions with the largest uh, heat stress intensification uh, projected. So uh, main implications uh, can be, uh, can be uh, highlighted from this work. Uh, I didn't explain in detail this, uh, this idea of uh, thresholds, but I'd be glad to talk about it later. Uh, the warming effect on the human body will be worse by two to three danger thresholds, heat stress thresholds, without any change in relative humidity, especially in Northern America, Europe, and Amazonia. So we do not attenuate the severe conclusion of the warming here, just highlight the importance of considering the humidity when we, we conduct uh, impact studies on the human body. And we also argue, well, suggest to maybe consider temperature, heat stress, temperature extremes and heat stress extremes as, well, not cumulative, but consecutive, consecutive sorry, events uh, since tropical area experience successive seasons of both uh, intense metrics. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it's time for public questions. And please, yeah, please use the mic for okay. the questions. Can you hear me? Uh, toward, towards your you know, very last point there, it might be interesting to think about certain sectors like agriculture, for yeah. example, where, you know, uh, right, so sensitivity to a really high temperature, maybe early in a planting season, relatively early, followed by maybe a heat stress for outdoor laborers, farmers. Um, yeah, uh, thinking about the joint impacts there could be interesting. We have, uh, interested in, in this in, in health studies and agriculture, maybe, because uh, the heat stress, this um, indicator, the W, is uh, often used 
uh, considering labor capacity. So there is, there is a strong interest in the agriculture field. Columbia University. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Xia Zhou from Columbia University. I'm going to talk about future risks of compound drought and aridity events. I mainly assess future increases in the intensity, frequency, and terrestrial carbon costs of compound drought and aridity events. Concurrent soil drought and atmospheric aridity can cause significant damage to ecosystems and our society. Soil drought is represented by low soil moisture, and atmospheric aridity is represented by high vapor pressure deficit, or VPD. VPD is calculated as a difference between saturated and actual vapor pressure. So it also measures atmospheric water demand. In terrestrial ecosystems, Soil water supply and atmospheric water demand can regulate the opening and closing of plant stomata and then determine plant water loss and carbon uptake. Under favorable conditions, water demand uh, plant adjusts stomata conductance to match water demand and water supply. When soil drought and atmospheric aridity occur, water demand is far more than water supply Plants the matter are largely closed to reduce water loss, and photosynthesis is also limited. Thus, concurrent low soil moisture and high VFD can greatly reduce plant carbon uptake and even drive widespread plant mortality. This figure shows the coupling of soil moisture and VFD in the warm season. We use data from observationally constrained data sets Gleam soil moisture and marriage VPD. This figure shows the left hill correlation between soil moisture and VPD globally. This A is for surface soil moisture and B is for root zone soil moisture. The left hill correlation indicates low soil moisture tends to be accompanied by high VPD. Across all land grades, we find bimodal distributions of soil moisture and VPD towards both extremes, namely low soil moisture, high VPD, and high so moisture low VPD. The, the high probability in the top left thing indicates the frequency of compound extreme low soil moisture and high VPD is much higher than the expected frequency if soil moisture and VPD were uncoupled. The soil moisture VPD coupling is driven by a series of physical processes between the land surface and the atmosphere. Low soil moisture reduces evapotranspiration leading to high temperature and VPD as a result of reduced evaporative cooling and near surface humidity. <coughs> high VPD in turn enhances atmospheric evaporative demand and exacerbates soil moisture depletion. Here we use idealized simulations from three models to assess the contribution of land atmosphere feedbacks to the compound soil moisture and VPD extremes. This left figure shows the time series of soil moisture in the two simulations. The blue line is the reference simulation. Soil moisture is fully coupled with the atmosphere. It means soil moisture responds to precipitation and evaporative demand. And it also impacts atmospheric variables, such as temperature and VPD. The red line is for the experimental simulation where soil moisture is prescribed by preserving the long-term trend and the seasonal cycle of soil moisture in the reference simulation. But the sub-seasonal and interannual variability is removed. In both simulations, the atmospheric model is driven by identical forces. So it means the difference between the two simulations represents the impact of soil moisture variability on the atmosphere. Consistent with the observational relationship, we find a negative correlation between soil moisture and VPD in the reference simulation as shown in this figure. We also find the model distribution of soil moisture and VPD as shown in figure E. However, we do not find this by model distribution in the experimental simulation in this figure F. With 
as the, in the experimental simulation, we believe variability is only driven by the atmosphere. So without the feedback of soil moisture variability on Lake D, the frequency and the intensity of extreme high Lake D are greatly reduced. Here, this figure shows the frequency ratio of extreme high Lake D, refer experimental over reference simulations. As a, and this is the uh, intensity differences reference minus experimental simulations. The comparison of the two simulations indicates the soil moisture feedback on VPD is very important for enabling extreme VP, high VPD. Here, this figure further shows that the probability of compound soil moisture and VPD extremes is higher in regions with more active soil moisture VPD correlation. So this analysis highlights the importance of soil moisture VPD feedback uh, in the occurrence of compound soil moisture and VPD extremes. In following slides, we further uh, using two sentinel simulations from 15 Earth's models to assess future increases in the future changes of the compound soil moisture and VPD extremes. We use warm season soil moisture and VPD data in the historical simulations and future simulations following the RCP 8.5 scenario. In these Earth's models, we also find lacteal correlation of soil moisture and VPD and the bimodal distributions indicating these Earth's models can realistically simulate the soil moisture VPD relationship. Here we further define compound extreme events as monthly soil moisture below its 10th percentile and VPD above its 19th percentile. We use this probability multiplication factor PMF to assess the frequency of compound extreme events. PMF is defined as the ratio of the probability of com of pound extremes to the expected uh, to the reference probability when soil moisture and VPD were assumed independent. PMF above one indicates stronger dependence of soil moisture and VPD extremes than the independent distribution. The spatial patterns of the PMF and the soil moisture VPD correlations indicate that the high VPD occurs in the regions with more negative more negative soil moisture and VPD correlations such as the southeast US, South Africa, East and Southeast Asia. Compare historical and future simulations, we find small differences in PMF. If we assess the, the extreme events according to simulations in individual period, it means the threshold of 10th percentile soil moisture and 19th percentile VPD are different for these two periods. However, if we use the historical threshold for both periods, the frequency of compound extreme events is projected to increase substantially in the future to slow this much larger range of PMF values of these PMF values. This figure shows lower soil moisture threshold and mean soil moisture extremes and higher maybe this threshold and uh, maybe the extremes in future simulations. This indicates, few, uh, indicates the soil moisture and VPD extremes will become even more extreme in the future. The so increases in the intensity and frequency of compound extreme events will have important implications for the capacity of continents to act as a carbon sink in the future. We then assess the impact of the compound extreme events on the on terrestrial carbon fluxes. We use three carbon indicators, net ecosystem production, AEP, and gross primary, and its two components, gross primary production, CPP, and terrestrial ecosystem respiration, TER. Here, AEP equals to CPP minus TER. The simulated CPP anomalies relative to the mean values is uh, during compound extreme events are almost are active in most periods, in most regions except for the boreal regions where the PE is enhanced, as boreal vegetation tends to be temperature limited. And the compound event respiration is also all enhanced in boreal regions and slightly decreased in most other regions. The compilation of GPP and respiration leads to negative AEP anomalies in, mo in most land regions in the 21st century, we find 
stronger negative anomalies of this GPP and AEP anomalies because we, as we, I am sure that we have uh, higher VPD extremes and lower soil motor extremes in future simulations. If we use historical threshold to assess future extremes, the compound event GP and AEP anomalies are still projected to strengthen in the future. This figure shows the negative AEP anomalies during compound extremes are much stronger than the anomalies when only so much of VBD is considered as extreme. Then we assess additional effect of VPD or soil moisture as the NEP differences induced by compound extremes or soil moisture or VPD extreme only. In historical simulations, we find a stronger negative additional effect of extreme high VPD than the effect of low soil moisture. In, few, in the 21st century, we uh, the negative additional effect of extreme Low soil moisture is projected to exceed the effect of high VPD. But in this Amazon and Congo basins, the negative additional effect of VPD is still uh, stronger than that of soil moisture. As future warming will greatly enhance respiration costs in these tropical regions. In summary, we find strong soil moisture VPD coupling and the frequent concurrent extreme high VPD and low soil moisture caused by land atmosphere feedbacks. In the 21st century, the compound extreme events are projected to become more frequent and more extreme and exert increasingly negative effects on the vegetation production. In addition, the negative effect of extreme low soil moisture will exceed the effect of high VPD in the northern hemisphere. That's all. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. Maybe I have one. Hey. Um, do you actually know what drives the change in VPD in the future? A strong increase in VPD? What, what factors driving VPD and so much in historical? Only VPD in, in the future. So the, the models seem to project a strong increase in VPD, right? Yeah. Do you know uh, what, the, what the mechanisms are behind? I think the main factor should be the warming temperature because the temperature is the main factor of VPD. And another reason, another factor determining VPD is the relative humidity. Because we, we have seen that future soil moisture will decrease in many regions, and this soil moisture will impact the evaporative, I mean, the water input into the atmosphere. So, all this in reduce the evaporate, evapotranspiration may reduce the relative humidity. Another reason is that because the temperature going up, so the so the actual relative humidity would go down if the input water vapor keep constant, and if the input water vapor decrease, the relative humidity would decrease even more. Mm -hmm. So these two factors will lead to high VPD in future simulations. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Let's move on to. Uh, actually, there, is one. there was a question. Hi, thank you for this talk. If you if you are saying uh, BPD and temperature is correlated, so why don't you take temperature in uh, in case of BPD? Because if you you are saying aridity and drought. So mostly aridity is uh, temperature is more contributed contributed in the aridity term. So if you you are using temperature in case of VPD, so your projections may be different. Uh, I, think that, I think there are two reasons why we use VPD. The first one is that we compared the coupling of uh, the coupling between soil moisture and VPD and between soil moisture and temperature. We find a stronger coupling between VPD and same temperature. Uh, sorry, I didn't show the, figure, show the figure of the results. 
But uh, the paper I published uh, this year, I have a figure using flat flat data sets to show that the coupling between VPD and soil moisture is stronger than that between soil moisture and the temperature. Another reason is that because we assess the, the impact of compound extreme events on the carbon fluxes, uh, you know that the plant stomata conductance are regulated by so moisture water uh, supply and uh, atmospheric water demand. But so, and uh, because this VPD have stronger di direct impact on the stomata conductance than temperature. So we use the uh, soil moisture and VPD, they can, they may, we may better reflect the impact of the compound stream events on the carbon fluxes. Okay. <coughs> All right, uh, hi everyone. So I'm gonna to talk to you about um, joint heat and drought uh, in the Nile Basin and some of the impacts uh, on that region. So the Nile Basin is uh, this, this large region in, in Northeast Africa that spans from uh, Uganda all the way up through Egypt. Um, and I'm gonna be focusing on the Upper Nile Basin, uh, which is the region uh, shown in the boxes here uh, in the southern part of the region where basically all of the precipitation that feeds the Nile River occurs. And this region is really uh, quite important. Um, so for one, it's a primarily agricultural region. And in the past few decades, there have been a number of um, agricultural failures that have resulted in humanitarian crises in the region. And so these crises have had uh, diverse causes. Um, so for, on the one hand, conflict, uh, policy decisions, and then some climate component uh, as well. So this region is also really quickly growing. Uh, so the red shading on this map shows population density in 2010. And according to UN projections, population in this region could double by the end of the century. And that will be compounding uh, an already sort of borderline uh, scarce water situation um, to potentially sort of uh, compound on the, the existing threats to agriculture and water security uh, in the basin. So thinking about agriculture first, uh, like I mentioned, there's a lot of causes of agricultural failures, and it can be difficult sometimes to isolate the climate component. Um, so what I'm showing here is uh, normalized yield anomalies on the black line here uh, in Ethiopia back to 1961. So the first thing you notice is there's a ton of variability year to year. And this variability has, has lots of causes, one of them which is climate. So one way to focus on that, that climate uh, component is to focus on years with poor yields. And so those are highlighted here in red. Those are years with yields that are at least one standard deviation below the mean. When we look at what the climate conditions in those years are like, what we find is that uh, those years are basically all hot and dry. So the median temperature percentile uh, is, is about, 80, about the 83rd percentile, and the median uh, precipitation and runoff percentiles are around uh, the 20th. So this isn't to say that every hot and dry year results in a crop failure in this region, but it is to say that basically every crop failure has occurred during a hot and dry year. And we can contrast this with years with, uh, with good agricultural yields. And so in these, uh, these good years, temperature, precipitation, and runoff are all uh, pretty close to the median value, so no significant climate anomalies. Okay, so we know that hot and dry conditions are impactful for agriculture in the Nile Basin. And we also know about what <coughs> levels of sort of severity um, matter for crops. And so that's uh, temperatures around the, say, 80th percentile and precipitation around the 20th. So we can ask now, how has the climate changed in this region in the past few decades? And we'll, we'll look at this in a couple of uh, observational data sets and then also the CMIP-5 models. So on the left hand here are uh, temperature trends in, uh, since uh, the 1980s. And on the right-hand side of the plot are precipitation trends. So first, era interim, uh, increasing temperatures, decreasing precip. GLDAS, increasing temperatures, insignificant precip change, similar for a variety of other data sets, um, and also similar for uh, the suite of CMIP-5 models. So that's uh, the box plot there shows the range across 31 models since uh, 1981. So we have a region that's warming. Uh, which is, is not surprising. And we have also uh, insignificant or perhaps slightly negative precipitation change. So 
we can think about uh, hot and dry years by, by sort of like any year could be uh, could be hot and dry, it could be hot and wet, cold and dry, uh, or cold and wet. And so we know that this region has been getting warmer, but that precipitation has not really been changing. Just based on that, we would expect the chances of a year being hot and dry to go up just due to simple statistics. Because if you have a dry year and it's getting warmer, most of those dry years then will tend to be hot. So we would expect an increase in hot and dry years over this historical period. And indeed, that's, that's what we find when we look at trends um, in observed data. So if we look at joint temperature precipitation data sets, so ERA interim, UDEL, and GLDAS, they all show significant upward trends in the frequency of hot and dry years. Um, and this trend is, uh, is significant and upward <coughs> basically any time period you pick throughout the 20th century, whether you start in 1981 or all the way back to 1901. So then we can combine uh, all of the independent temperature and precipitation data sets uh, combined into an observational ensemble that sort of takes all the possible uh, temperature observations and all the possible precip observations that exist and look at the hot and dry uh, year trends in that observational ensemble. And again, we find upward trends in every combination of observational data sets. When we look at the CMIP-5 models, we find similar upward trends in basically every model and trends of a, of a comparable magnitude. So what we see is a region with increasing hot and dry years, and we also see that the CMIP-5 models seem to represent the observed historical climate trends. So now we can ask, what does the future hold for this region? And when we ask the CMIP-5 models this question, um, they tell us that the region will rapidly warm. It's, that's not surprising. Um, under RSP 8.5 in the second half of the century, they project warming of 3 to 4 degrees Celsius. But they also show a region with increasing precipitation. Uh, and so on the, the right-hand side here, uh, the hatching shows areas where there is uh, less than two-thirds model agreement on the sign of precipitation change. And you can see in the, the western half of the Upper Nile Basin, there's no hatching. So that indicates that models uh, generally agree that precipitation will go up. And so just for reference, this precipitation change is not huge. It's about 5 to 10 percent increase. Um, so it's not a, not a huge change, but it is an increase. So we have two sort of competing factors here when we think about hot and dry years. So on the one hand, the temperature increase would tend to increase your chances of a hot and dry year, but the precipitation increase, you might think, would decrease those chances. But this is where it's important to consider this from sort of a joint extremes perspective, because as we've seen uh, already today, of course, temperature and precipitation are not independent. They're strongly correlated in this region, as they are in most of the world. And we can, um, we can ask sort of in the Upper Nile Basin, what does this correlation do to the chances of a year being both hot and dry? And in the CMIP-5 model suite uh, across the historical period, the uh, temperature precip correlation tends to increase the chances of a year being hot and dry by a factor of maybe 1.5 to 2 as compared to what you would expect if temperature and precipitation were independent. So even though we have a region that's getting wetter, uh, this temperature precip correlation doesn't necessarily mean that the frequency of hot and dry years will go down. So that's what we're, we're going to look at specifically now, um, is how will hot and dry years change uh, in the region. And so just to go back to the beginning of the talk when, with, with agriculture impacts, um, we know the sort of levels of severity of hot and dry that are impactful to crops. And so we're going to use these temperature and precipitation um, percentile thresholds to make our hot and dry uh, projections, because we know that these kind of extremes are impactful to the region. So when we look in the models, in the historical period, uh, the green box plot shows the range across CMIP-5 models of the percentage of years that tend to be hot and dry. And so um, in 1980 to 2005, that percentage is about 4 to 7% of years. By the second half of the century, under uh, RCP 4.5, that increases to 10 to 17 percent and 5 to 14 percent under RCP 8.5. So you might notice that RCP 4.5 has a higher fraction of years that are hot and dry than the higher emission scenario. And that's because precipitation increases more uh, with more emissions. But under RCP 4.5, temperatures still increase enough that basically every future year is considered hot or at least above the historical 83rd percentile. 
So it's sort of interesting when you think about joint extremes, you don't necessarily get the uh, same monotonic response to warming that you get when you look at uh, either temperature or precipitation independently. So we have an increase in hot and dry years. Uh, the frequency of these years increases by maybe a factor of two across the upper Nile Basin. Um, so we've seen that these hot and dry years are impactful to agriculture. But I also mentioned that this is a, a region that's right on the verge of, of water scarcity, uh, according to UN um, per capita water requirements. So we can think about whether these changes in temperature and precipitation and hot and dry years will affect uh, water resources in the region. And since we know the precipitation is going up, we might think that runoff uh, would also go up and perhaps reduce uh, water stress across the basin. But what we find is that's, that's actually not the case. So we're looking at runoff uh, in the CMIP-5 models here across the, the rest of the century. So the blue box plots here show uh, runoff in normal years. So those are years that are not hot and dry. And the brown box plots show runoff in hot and dry years. So in hot and dry years, runoff is maybe 10 to 20% lower than it is in normal years. And when we look across the century, we see that runoff variability increases a bit, uh, along with precipitation variability but that sort of the, the average runoff level doesn't significantly change. And this is largely due to the increased evaporative demand placed on the surface by uh, the large increase in temperature. So even though we have this increase in precipitation, we don't really see this rise in runoff. But we do have a basically guaranteed large and rapid rise in population. So under a mid-range population scenario, um, population could double by the 2080s. And for a region that's already nearly water stressed, this uh, will likely make that worse, uh, especially when you, when you consider that runoff and um, that runoff is approximately constant and that the hot and dry air frequency uh, is going up. So when we factor in population, we can calculate uh, the percentage of the regional population that has unmet water demand. What we find is that in uh, in the 2020s, that's, uh, that's fairly low, maybe 10% or so, um, but it increases rapidly. And so here we show in the orange box plots um, the fraction of the population with unmet water demand in normal years, and the red box plots show the same in hot and dry years. So again, in hot and dry years, that fraction with unmet water demand is maybe 20, 30% higher than in normal years, and also it increases rapidly across the century. So. Um, when we sort of put this all together, what we see is a region that's getting hotter and wetter, but due to the relationship between temperature and precipitation, um, the frequency of hot and dry years is actually going up. And so by considering uh, the joint extremes perspective here, you get a different sort of view of, of the future of, uh, of climate extremes in this region than you might think if you just looked at temperature and precipitation independently. And then also when you Try to, try to link these joint extremes to their impacts, whether on agriculture or on water scarcity, you see that it's really important to think about um, these joint extremes and how they're changing, uh, rather than just focusing on the variables independently. All right, thanks. Thanks for this very interesting talk. There's a question there. Uh, thank you. Uh, so East Africa is an area of the world where uh, the GCMs do a notoriously poor job of simulating the seasonal cycle, teleconnections associated with precipitation. And there's good reason to believe from the paleo record and, and from, you know, just kind of basic physics that the sign of the response to the models in precipitation is, is incorrect. Why do you believe the models as far as precipitation goes? Yeah. Um, so. That's, that's a good, good question. And, you know, I mean, we can look at these models in uh, their historical performance. And I've, I've done that sort of verification analysis over the past, uh, you know, few decades. And they, uh, while they have some trouble with aspects of the seasonal cycle, they have represented the historical trends fairly accurately. Um, and so, you know, like, I would say that's, that provides some confidence that they um, at least do a reasonable job of representing the climate. 
But the other way to think about this is sort of, uh, I mean, like, if the, uh, so, I mean, yeah, that's a, if, if the models are actually wrong about the sign of precipitation change, then these results get considerably worse. Um, and so in that sense, uh, maybe it's a best case scenario. But um, yeah, understanding whether that, I mean, if, because there is it's pretty good model agreement on the sign of precip change, uh, especially in the western part of this region. So I mean, if they actually are getting that wrong, that would be uh, very important to, to figure out. Thank you. Do you know if there's a lots of lots of irrigation in the area? Because that would kind of disconnect the precipitation from temperature. Because if we think, say, of the Upper Nile River, we know that I mean there's minimal precipitation, but there's maximized yield. That's one of the regions where you have the highest yield in the world, actually. Mm -hmm. So it seems that you might be actually more influenced by temperature than precipitation, and that seems to be a little bit what you're seeing in the yield. Because when you look at your lowest standard deviation, the highest standard deviation, the main difference you have is mostly temperature and not precip because precip was still negatively anomalous there. So I was just wondering if you looked at the irrigation there. And um, so the, the southern part of the region has very little irrigation. Um, there's irrigation all up the Nile River. Um, and so the, I mean, the Nile River stream flow is, uh, is really critical to you know, continue irrigation throughout uh, the desert. Um, and all that, I looked at sort of the southern part of this region because that's where the rainfall occurs that, that allows that irrigation to happen. Um, but in sort of western Ethiopia, South Sudan, there's not much. Thanks. Um, we move on to the next talk. It's by Jana Silman from Cicero in Oslo. On... Uh, air pollution and extreme temperatures. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, I'm talking about uh, problems about air pollution and extreme temperature. Um, here I'm just uh, showing you some headlines about uh, the problem. This picture is from the Russian heat wave in 2010. Uh, where there was extreme heat combined with extreme air pollution th uh, due to wildfires uh, that affected people, the health, and the agriculture. So um, from the uh, European Environmental Agency report, we know that air pollution is number one in Europe causing premature death. We know from, from other studies that current ozone pollu pollution causes up to 227 teragrams of lost uh, crop yield annually, this, these are just random numbers, just to uh, uh, illustrate the, the, the magnitude of the problem. Then there are studies showing that there are synergistic effects of extreme uh, heat and air pollution. And we also know from climate change studies that heat extremes are increasing due to global warming. So um, that is what we are mostly interested in our um, project. Um, is the, not only the uh, individual effects of air pollution and uh, heat, climate extremes, on health and crops, but what are actually the combined effects of these two stressors. And what you find in the literature is that you find a lot of studies that focus on air pollution, like here, PM, uh, particulate matter 2.5, uh, on health um, we find a lot of studies on um, air pollution like ozone, on crop yield, and we, we find a lot of studies uh, on, for instance, heat extremes on mortality. But there's little known so far on the combined effect on uh, health and crops. But if we're starting with the, uh, if, with the, the drivers, the stressors, the hazards, so we have, we can look at it, as I said, in individually. Ozone causes uh, crop loss or premature deaths, and there's a lot of studies on that. Then we have temperatures. But then um, they, temperature can also act, and that's you, what, what you find in the health and agriculture literature, as a co confounding factor. That is, that an explained uh, uh, association between, for instance, ozone and crop loss or the changes in ozone crops could be uh, uh, due to a confounding factor 
common factor like temperature that is also increasing and has an impact on both. So that's, a, that's a, an issue that we need to consider, especially in the questions of mitigation. Where do we set priority in mitigation? Heat, for instance, uh, like climate change mitigation, air pollution mitigation. So this confounding factors and correlated extremes play a, a role in these mitigation questions and actions. So in this park and in the study that I present here, I focus mainly on ozone and temperature correlation. And uh, again, ozone uh, is uh, depending on temperature, uh, it, and, but also there are studies that show that ozone concentrations uh, are related to certain weather patterns. A lot of studies in Europe at different locations uh, where they show a certain dependence on weather patterns. But also weather patterns, like for instance atmospheric blocking, anticyclonic uh, weather situations drive temperature changes. So uh, weather patterns could also be seen as a confounding factor on temperature and ozone. Um, and that's what we have uh, investigated in this uh, study by my PhD student, Noelia Otero, um, where we examined the relevance of different uh, synoptic and meteorologic uh, variables on ozone. And so what we used was an interpolated data set of observed uh, maximum daily um, average surface ozone from Schnell et al. And they calculated uh, hourly surface ozone of a uh, one by one uh, graded data set, one by one degree graded data set. And uh, for temperature and also for the weather pattern, we use the ERA interim reanalysis data set, uh, also one by one a degree resolution graded data set. We calculated uh, a set of daily airflow indices, also known as LAM indices, based on a grid cell by grid cell classification of the LAM weather types, which is pretty a uh, new method because usually these weather types has, have been um, uh, calculated on individual regions or locations, but not screening the whole European domain. So with this new uh, um, uh, um, application of this uh, weather type classification, we can, we can look at the whole European dom domain and we looked at uh, 14 years uh, basically restricted by the availability of the ozone data set from 1998 uh, to 2012. And this is what we used as uh, meteorological and, and, uh, and airflow indices and uh, variables as predictors for ozone. Uh, a lot of like temperature, relative humidity, surface uh, solar radiation, and for instance also we used the seasonal cycle. Uh, we used wind speech, all these flow indices, but we also used lack of ozone, basically the ozone concentration that has been observed the, the, the day before. And so we built uh, several statistical models um, at each grid point for the European domain to study the relationship or the do dominance or the important drivers of ozone in Europe. So we did uh, look for the mean distribution of ozone we, looked, uh, we used multiple linear regression models. Uh, then for the more extreme tails, we looked at, uh, we, we used quantile regression methods and looked especially over the 95th percentile uh, of the ozone distribution and for the um, uh, exceedance over particular threshold. As you know, for instance, in health studies, they use particular uh, thresholds like 50 ppb or um, 60 ppb depending on the European or well, uh, WM, uh, WHO uh, standards. And so with the log logistic regression model, we could look um, at exceedance over such health relevant thresholds and it's basically a binomial distribution, yes or no, uh, exceeded or threshold. And then we did a backward st stepwise regression procedure to select the most important drivers for uh, the ozone concentrations and uh, that's the results. So looking at the uh, mean distribution or the whole distribution of ozone, uh, we see this is the, um, the spring. So we looked at spring and summer months over Europe. And this is the first uh, dominant driver and there's the second most important driver. And what you see here in the spring, it's mainly solar radiation and humidity and the rest is all the lack of ozone. So the pre uh, the the, the pre-existing con ozone concentration is a main driver of uh, peak or mean uh, uh, ozone 
concentration of the day under consideration. And in summer, we see in Central Europe, for instance, that maximum temperature is a dominant driver. And then in the second one is also seasonality, but mainly those uh, four seasonal cycle relative humidity, so surface solar radiation, maximum temperature, and lack of ozone. Uh, the same, uh, a similar picture we get for the more extreme ozone levels is again a lot of lack of ozone and um, relative humidity and solar radiation for the spring and in the summer you see it's again maximum temperature that is the most important driver for uh, extreme ozone concentration. And this is now the ozone exceedance for this health relevant tra threshold of 50 ppb uh, ozone concentration. And here you see that, again, temperature in summer, the maximum temperature, and the preceding con uh, ozone conditions are important drivers of ozone uh, peaks or high ozone levels in, uh, in Europe. And uh, we conclude from this study that uh, meteorological drivers uh, show that there is a large influence on so, uh, of, um, there's not a large influence of these airflow indices, so weather patterns don't really uh, play a big role in driving the peak ozone uh, concentrations in Europe. The most uh, important drivers uh, is uh, ozone persistent in spring and uh, the maximum temperature in summer. And we also saw in the map that there are big regional and seasonal differences uh, between where ozone per persistence and uh, maximum temperature play a role in driving peak ozone um, concentrations. So this is from this purely physical or statistical analysis of the correlation. And yes, ozone is correlated highly with uh, extreme temperatures and um, also uh, uh, um, ozone persistence. Uh, that doesn't really, if we really want to study the combined impacts of ozone and air pollution and impact on health, if we stay with these uh, statistical uh, models, like we can use uh, 2D epidemiological or empirical response, uh, exposure uh, response functions, where we use either 2D air pollution or climate, or we use 3D climate and air pollution, um, it, it only gets us so far because these things are so correlated. But what we really need to study the impact is process-based modeling uh, where we can look at crop models that incorporate both the ozone stress and the climate extremes to give us the actual impact of these two stressors because they can amplify each other uh, as we see in our project, for instance. But it's easier, of course, um, to look at the combined effect if we have agriculture because we can do experiments with plants. For health, it's very difficult to build such process uh, this model or do experiments. Um, so uh, we do, this is a small advertisement, uh, we, we go beyond the physical or the statistical aspects of ozone and temperature in our two new projects. Uh, one on health, exposure to heat and air pollution, uh, on cardiopulmonary impacts and benefits for, of mitigation and adaptation. Because as you saw, it's not only it's not en enough to just mitigate heat, because also ozone uh, persistent was a large driver, so we also need to do something against air pollution. So what are the best measures for mitigation and adaptation for health implications? And then another project uh, on crop production, where we use an incorporated uh, model into the crop models to, uh, to, to model the, the processes of ozone and heat stress on crop yield. Yes, that's uh, yeah, my um, presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Are there questions to Jana? Um, I was curious to see uh, the previous day's ozone as one of the leading predictors of ozone. Um, and I was wondering if uh, you thought that was because of uh, co-correlations with other variables, um, persistence of maybe the total amount of odd oxygen over the diurnal cycle. Um, yeah, I was just curious about possible causal links there. Uh, yeah, so we, we haven't uh, um, looked at other factors that could drive ozone persistent. We only know that it has something to do with the pollution of the precursors 
and that is high in some regions and they don't get uh, um, um, quick enough uh, dis dissolved. Uh, and so um, th we, we didn't really look into the causal effects of ozone persistence, yeah. Sure, I was curious about this exhaustion study. Is this an epidemiological study? And so I guess let's, I'll stop there. Is it yeah, so a full on epidemiology yeah, study? Yeah, so that, that project is uh, starting now and um, it includes uh, a lot of epidemiologic uh, studies. So we will have uh, health practitioners, we have epidemiologists uh, in the, in the, in the um, project that will do also, that look at to in cohort studies and these kind of things and we try to combine our physical understanding with the epidemiologic studies, yeah. So stay tuned and <laughs> look at the website, yeah. Yes, I was curious about the, the multiple regression approach where you had things like solar radiation and temperature, um, both of which affect ozone through like photochemical production and then the temperature effects. Are you able to disentangle those two when you're trying to you know, determine which one more closely affects ozone? Uh, in that approach, given uh, that those that's done by this first or second or third important driver, and we we take uh, account of the uh, multi -co uh, correlation between I mean some of the other I mean everything is basically correlated, but uh, most of uh, some of those that are really really highly strongly co correlated, some of the flow indices indices they were really really correlated. We took them out. And then uh, with the multiple linear regression and the backward stepwise regression, we extracted which of those factors had the most strongest effect. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jana. The final talk of the session is given by Michael Greener from uh, LVNL in Berkeley. Um, you can use this. I'll use this one. So I know what you're thinking, at least I am. Um, a statistics talk between me and my lunch. Um, I'll try not to be too boring. Um, what I want to show you is a methodology that um, took a long time to develop. It was a five-year funded project that ended last year. The paper appeared this month. Um, but I think it's of some general use. And, and from what I'm hearing today, I can see all sorts of applications. And so. I have to have a disclaimer. Um, but all I'm really saying is I'm only speaking for myself. So most, if not all, interesting extreme weather events are multivariate in some way. We've heard a lot about heat waves. Consider two kinds, or maybe there's more than two kinds, but consider these two kinds. Hot, moist, and stagnant. Those have a large impact on human health, particularly in urban environments. Hot, dry, and windy increases wildfire risk, which has associated uh, uh, human impacts, including health. Um, uh, myself, um, I have four friends who lost homes in uh, the Sonoma and uh, Paradise fires in California, one of whom lost their, their uh, grandmother, and, or their mother, rather. And, um, and my own health was impacted by the uh, air pollution in the, uh, in the Bay Area. Um, that persisted for about two weeks. So these are very different kinds of events, somewhat similar sim impacts in that people are, are, are uh, severely impacted in many ways. But the meteorology behind these events are very different. And so in the IPCC, in the National Climate Assessment, we really haven't looked at this at all. We've only looked at, at temperature alone. And why would we do that? And the answer is because we can. It's easy. Um, but I think there's much more richness to be looked at in, uh, in higher dimensional measures of, of extreme weather in general. Now the problem from a statistics point of view is that extreme multivariate events are generally not rare in all the variables of interest. And so go back to hot, moist, and stagnant, there are lots of days that don't have much wind. And 100% relative humidity happens every time it rains. It's a bounded variable. Fact is, you reach the bound. In hot and dry and windy, you could do the inverse of humidity, which is also bounded, but is, that bound is never reached. Um, um, but high winds happen all the time, and so you know they're not necessarily at the same time as the heat as the uh, the heat wave. And 
for single variables, we have a very well-developed statistical theory. Uh, the book by Coles tells us in, in great detail, um, generalized extreme value theory. And the way this works is you take a, a sample of the, uh, the data that you have available at the high end of the distribution. And um, the theory is valid if there's some uh, subject to some requirements, mainly that you pick this, this subset of data far enough in the tail that you're in what the statisticians call the asymptotic regime. And the problem with multivariate uh, GEV, that, as detailed in Cole's book, is that all the variables have to be in that asymptotic regime. And as we just saw, the, the ones that I just uh, outlined, that's not the case for some of those variables. So the Cole's multivariate GEV formalism is not appropriate. And, I, and I'm, I'm hard pressed to think of any case where all the variables are in the asymptotic re regime. I wrote never, never is a strong word. Um, perhaps say rarely. So since we don't have a, mul a relevant multivariate extreme value theory, what do we do? Well, oftentimes we com com collapse the multiple variables into some uh, univariate model. We heard about um, the wet bulb globe temperature today. Uh, heat index is another one. These are based on models of the effect of uh, heat and humidity and other variables on human health but they're just models, you know, they're parametric of some sort. Uh, for fires, we have a whole slew of, of burn indices that depend on temperature and humidity and other variables, um, some of which are valid in some forests and some grasslands and some of which are not. So let's get right into what data looks like. Um, this is a plot on the y-axis of relative humidity um, on, and x-axis is uh, temperature for Hyderabad. Uh, uh, India. In 2015, the, the points with the asterisk were 2015 during a deadly heat wave where thousands of people died. Um, this was a hot and dry event. Uh, a consequence of meteorology was the monsoon was delayed. A few of the days, uh, I think I can circulate, like this day here was, was uh, very near a record temperature, but it is dry. And what the what reason it was deadly was that there were a lot of the, these days here in the tail of the the high end of the, 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 the heat wave, we're all pretty much in a row. And so it was the duration that made this, this, um, this uh, um, uh, event deadly. The colors are the heat index advisories from NOAA, and you can see they're pretty irrelevant for India, which is, it highlights the problems of having a univariate model. This was the, the heat index was uh, developed using college students in Iowa in the 60s. Now oh, another, the counterexample is Karachi, Pakistan, which is just five weeks later, tens of thousands of people died in this event. And the temperatures actually weren't very extreme. They're, uh, the asterisks are the event again, but they're all at the edge of this distribution. They're high heat index. In fact, this day here was the, a record heat index. And so it's a very different kind of event. Heat index is one way of looking at this. I think there's understanding to be think when you think about this plot in particular. Now, as an aside, the two events do share one thing or two things in common. One is that the the risk of these events were dramatically increased when we had heat index by climate change for India by a factor of 30, and by Pakistan by I could have written 10,000, but I, a thousand seemed high enough um, since that was the highest ever written at that time. Um, and so they, they had a big human influence and lots of people died. That's what they had in common. And a lot of people died because of climate change, which is a horrible thing to have in common. Back to the stats. Um, there's this concept called tail dependence in the statistical literature. And I want you to think about this light correlation. It's not correlation. The statisticians don't like me to call it that. But it's kind of like correlation for extremes. And um, it's this formula. Um, Consider these two variables that should have a, a tail dependence and a correlation of one. They're two different measures of precip daily precipitation, one by the Climate Prediction Center, one by Edmar. And um, in California, they, 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 this tail dependence parameter would measure the similarity of points in the upper part of this. Um, in California, they look pretty good. In Montana, it looks pretty good. But in Kansas, it looks terrible. And what tail dependence exposed was that there was a difference in the timing, of, of the interpretation of the time of measurement in these two. Um, 
quantities. So this is the tail dependence parameter. You can see California and Montana here where they did it differently. And um, uh, clearly that's wrong. Um, and you can get away from some of this by considering pentadal precipitation instead. You'll have to read the paper to see how badly this looks for the comparison between land-based and satellite-based um, uh, estimates of extreme precipitation. This is the slide that I struggled over last night. It kept me up to about one, um, and so don't read it. Um, <laughs> it just outlines a method, and, and what I wanted to say is you basically start with some non-parametric estimate of, say, the 99th percentile, you know, using some, your favorite way of drawing isolines. Then we transform the data and um, into something that gives us the statisticians, a tool that statisticians can use called regular variation. It's hidden because you got to do this transformation. Um, and then we have to test whether it's the, the tails are dependent or independent. And if they're de independent, like we're going to see, um, you have to make an adjustment to that variation that I won't go into. So here's an example of tail-dependent data. And it's only moderately tail-dependent. This, this parameter chi, the tail-dependence parameter, is only 0.3. I consider things to be very tail-dependent when it's 0.5. Correlation, you would probably go to like 0 0.8, 0 0.9, but that's the way this thing is, is uh, interpreted. So you draw your 99th percentile ISO line using your favorite method transformed this space using uh, a Pareto distribution from general extreme value distribution, use the hidden variation, draw some more lines at higher, at higher, uh, uh, um, rarer frequencies, and then transform back. And um, because there, the, coral, the tail dependence is the fact that there are some points out here that aren't on the axes in this transformed space. Um, and so this gives us a way of estimating very rare events. These are two particular fires in California, Southern California, because this is the Santa Ana. Back to Karachi, it's tail independent. And in fact, when we transform into this space, everything's along the axis. There's nothing along this line here, which if it was perfectly tail, tail dependent was one, it would, everything would be along, oops, that, that line. And so again, we find that the Karachi event was, say, uh, um, let's see, one, two, three, four, so about a um, point triple oh zero five uh, percentile event. So what's our status now? This is real you know, new for us anyway. And so we now have a formal method. I wouldn't call this a theory. It's more like a recipe. It's not like generalized extreme value theory where there's fundamentals under, underneath it. It's a combination of extreme value theory, tail dependence, and this regular variation property that, that uh, the transformed data has. Our code's available uh, from Dan. Um, but the key here is unlike other methods, we don't have to assume this asymptotic dependence. We have the way of kludging up the, uh, the, the uh, transform, transformed uh, data for the for this regular variation to account for asymptotically independent variables of which many times this is the case So now what so I, I would argue that you know, collapsing to these one-dimensional models is useful Because we have a lot of tools we can do use that for but it is um, We do lose some of the richness of the multivariate structure um, thinking in in multiple dimensions is somewhat, somewhat difficult. I, I have a lot of trouble with three dimensions and I can't do four. Um, but it's useful to tie back to the impacts because, you know, if you went back to that Karachi plot, not all the points on the ISO lines of high index are, where, are, are events that people died. You know, those, those events happened a lot. People didn't die. So it's a very narrow range of this two-dimensional space that actually ties back to that particular impact. I was thinking more about the generalities of this conference, and um, this, this has been outlined as multivariate extremes, but I think sequential extremes could fall into this as well by thinking about the same variable, let's say, uh, rainfall in California, and then rainfall lagged by a week. You know, you have two storms in a row or three storms in a row, you get landslides, and so that kind of, uh, that kind of data um, would fall into this kind of 
formalism, it's very likely to be tail independent. Um, that's pretty much it. Let's have lunch. <laughs>
it was a little bit theory because when I look at practice, uh, let's take for instance what's going on in this region right now, uh, where you proposed you meaning the US Army or oh, engineer uh, several solutions to create barriers for the New York Harbor estuary and you mentioned there for infrastructure projects a hundred years is actually a reasonable timeline to consider yet I wonder when we take the sea level rise into account, what a project like that would be meaningful because it would be practically most of the time and I don't know how the rivers behind could be equalizing with the ocean because you get flooded from behind. So uh, if I put this in the cost-benefit analysis, how far out do we go <laughs> to the cost-benefit analysis where we have a project like that? And would we regret it 100 years from now that we did it? Good question. So first of all, I think the, the core has to follow the Office of Management and Budget Guidelines um, when we prepare information for the uh, benefit-cost analyses. And we're really going for least regrets if we can, all right? Um, certainly some of those regrets are quantifiable and others are not. Uh, we have a 50-year period of economic analysis, so that answers part of your question, 50 years for that benefits and cost. But we're also forced to use a non-zero discount rate. Right now it's running around 7.2%. So that means, and so you already get it. Okay, so that means that um, essentially any uh, benefits that you would gain after about 20 years are gone. Right? So that's where the issue of quantifiable versus non-quantifiable benefits come in. If you can find a way to, uh, to describe benefits that capture those, um, that can be captured after the 20 year period. So the other thing though to consider is that our engineering guidance, which has been in place for a long time for major infrastructure requires uh, 100 years of performance, adequate performance, meaning the authorized um, congressionally authorized uh, purpose of that project. So if indeed a surge gate is a selected alternative for the, for the New York area, that would have to take into account both the um, number of times in, of when it's closed and open, so you gathered correctly that sea level rise means it's going to be closing a lot more, meaning that there's rivering flow that are coming in that's gonna to have to be captured uh, upstream from the gate. So, uh, so our engineering uh, calculations would go out that 100-year period and we'd be looking at both changes in rainfall over the 100-year period on the uh, riverine side and we'd be looking at changes in sea level. So for the core, our first sea level guidance was put forth in 1986 and since 2009 we've really doubled down on the sea level. We are using scenarios which I know feel to a lot of scientists to be imprecise and to be they prefer to use probabilities. Our issue though is that with scenarios and by requiring people to be robust, a solution to be robust to a low and intermediate and high scenario, we're forcing them to think about the higher scenario because normally they'd want to move towards in a probabilistic um, viewpoint, they'd want to move towards an expected value which is a much lower uh, uh, sea level elevation. So we find that the scenarios may not be as satisfying to science. On the other hand, for engineering purposes and planning purposes, they do get us to have people considering the worst cases or the higher cases. Uh, so we also track sea level trends. So we do know that for, for New York, for the battery, for example, we know we've been trending intermediate to high scenario along the core scenario for about the past 20 years or so. So we're pretty realistic about what we're gonna be expecting uh, for that kind of a design. So the engineering design, 100 years, using all three sea level scenarios, and we have to cost it that way. We have to know what's the percentage of time or expected amount of time that that gate will be open and will be closed. When will we have navigation traffic? When will we have flooding problems? And those kinds of questions. It's, it's not a simple response, right? I think for New York, the question hasn't been settled. There, there's a, a great deal of um, public sentiment for a surge barrier. There's a great deal of um, ecosystem and environmental sentiment against it for very good reasons in both cases. 
Um, if we look at Galveston Bay for the core, that's another big project, similar kind of project. About 40 to 50 percent of the nation's petrochemical refining and, um, and other uh, chemi chemical industries in Galveston Harbor, we're looking at another surge barrier there. Different, different kinds of situations, but the same issues, ecosystem, socioeconomic, and then the physical, the forcing associated with uh, hurricanes and with, with uh, interior drainage issues. So not simple. Uh, we are pushing that engineering horizon of 100 years of performance, and that may mean that a surge barrier may, may not be possible. Okay, so the, the question here is, can one engineering agency say that with given, given our estimates of this 100-year performance, can we say no to everybody who wants that thing? And this is why what the people want often ends up being short term. Is that helpful? Let's go to another question. Thank you. Uh, if, if I may ask another question to Dr. White. Um, in your experience uh, collaborating with, with scientists, I was just wondering, over here, uh, what what makes a good collaboration or study in terms of making it useful and usable for you, and what makes it a bad collaboration or, or study? So um, I really love collaborating with scientists. Um, I'm an engineer, but I've done research myself. I've sponsored a lot of research. I'm sponsoring some researchers that are in the room here now. I've got PhD students. I hope that everybody continues doing all the science. I think what's useful to me is when people walk in with an open mind and they, they walk in and say, you know, there's a lot of questions we could be asking. What are the kinds of gap areas that you might have experienced that we could fill, right? So if you're in science, you want the gap areas. You want somebody to tell you what they are so you can start publishing and you know, make a name for yourself. And I want them filled because they are areas of uncertainty that mean that I'm putting forth a subpar solution. So that's the main thing, open. Um, uh, it's interesting, you know, when we, we walk into the room, I'm just gonna say this like as an analogy. When you walk into a room full of generals, there's a little bit of chest bumping, you know, people kind of putting themselves in a priority order, right? But I see that in science too, right? Oh, I went to, I'm teaching here, or I went to there. Okay, so they're starting to list off their pedigree. But what I find is it's actually the diversity of thought and the ideas of people who come from all different kinds of institutions, from highly rated and not highly rated, I'm finding as much creative thinking from the not highly rated as I am from the highly rated. So I don't, I don't walk in and look at the pedigree at all. I walk in and listen to what the person has said and did, were they thought provoking and did, do they seem like they're interested in, in, a, in a problem? So like if I'm hiring somebody, do they care about the problem? And are they careful about what they're doing? Those are the two big things, it's not about what was your grade point average, where did you post or anything like that? So I don't know if that answers the question. Thank you. Any other questions? Excuse me. I have m more of a comment, I guess. Um, the, the impacts of joint or multivariate extremes seem to pull in one direction in these talks, uh, even in Ethan's talk where there seems to be a potential for a mitigating of the impact between the increase in precipitation uh, but rising temperature. It still doesn't amount to a mitigated impact. The impact is still worse. But I wanted to flag uh, something in Yana's talk where I think there's genuine ambiguity about the ozone, joint ozone temperature impact on crops, um, just to you know, express some openness to multivariate extremes actually having mitigating consequences. And the ambiguity is that um, the temperature ozone joint impact go in one of two directions. Either when it's really hot and there's a lot of ozone, plants are pumping through water to cool, stomates are very open, and a lot of ozone is getting in. But actually, if there's a drought and the stomates close, then that could mitigate the ozone impact. So at least there's one place in this session where there's the potential for two variables to actually cancel out the, uh, the impact. So it's worth just being aware of those things, I think.
we're ready for lunch. Yeah. Give some more discussions uh, later on. Okay, let's get started again. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed lunch, have new energy. Um, this is the second part of the multivariate extreme session, and this one is designated as the um, storms and floods session because we had a pretty impressive number of abstract submissions around this broader topic of storms and floods. And we have six talks lined up in this session. The first one will be um, an invited talk given by Philip Ward from BU Amsterdam. And he will be talking about compound flooding due to storm surge and river discharge at the global scale. OK, thank you very much, Thomas. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to give the presentation here this afternoon and start this session. Uh, I'm going to be talking about some work that we've been doing in Amsterdam in the last uh, three or four years, looking at compound flooding as a result of storm surge, high sea levels, and river discharge, and doing this at the global scale. Personally, a little bit of background of, of why we're doing that. So over the last six or seven years, our group has been developing a suite of global flood risk models, so models to uh, simulate both flood hazards and where and, and when is it flooding, but also the social and economic impacts of those in terms of damages, casualties, affected people, etc. Um, and we've been doing that a lot with various scientific collaborators, also the World Resources Institute, um, World Bank to develop web tools to make this information really usable to any type of person who, who we need information on global risks. Uh, so far, we've developed GLOFRIS, which is a global river flood risk modeling suite, and also a, uh, a method to look at coastal flood risk modeling, so that builds on the global tide and surge model, GTSM. Um, and so, but that's pretty much state of the art in this field at the moment is to do that separately. So, either to simulate global river flood risk or global coastal flood risk. So this is a typical delta city, or an estuarine city. Um, could be anywhere in the world. And what our models at the moment are mainly doing, we're either, as I say, looking go back at this uh, upstream area, or we're looking at floods downstream. But we know that a lot of these really disastrous floods occur in many of these, these very highly populated estuarine areas when you get the interaction of those two processes. So these uh, compound events, these compound extremes. So in this project, we're trying to move this, uh, uh, this field of global risk modeling, or flood risk modeling, to cover uh, just that. So this, uh, you should see the US coastline on there. Uh, it seems to have disappeared. However, uh, you can kind of make it out of the spots. This is a paper by Thomas Wall from 2015 in Nature Climate Change, where they looked at the dependence between precipitation and storm surge along the US coasts. Um, and this was a really interesting paper that was one of the first to actually look at these compound extremes, I think, on a large scale. Uh, so what they did here, just to, to briefly ex explain this, this analysis we are seeing, is they took uh, observed time series annual maximum sto uh, of, 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 of storm surge and observed series of precipitation. So here they extract the annual maximum sto storm surge series from that and then on that day that you have the maximum storm surge, they extract the precipitation from the same day or, or the next day. And then what you see here is the correlation between those two time series, a uh, uh, Kendall's correlation coefficient shown. And basically the, the red um, triangles or spots or squares are those where that is statistically significant. So there's statistically significant dependence between the two, mainly down this uh, east coast seen in this picture. So we had a paper in environmental research letters um, last year where we expanded this to look at dependence between storm surge and river discharge. So not precipitation, but actually how that translates into discharge and river flows. And we did that on a uh, global scale. 
Uh, what you're seeing here is pretty much the same results as what you saw in the uh, last slide of precipitation, but here we're showing the dependence of discharge and storm surge. So this is discharge conditional on you having a high storm surge event. And so what we found, without going to go into the details here, is that we found a statistically significant dependence either between discharge conditional on surge or surge conditional on discharge in about half of the stations that we studied around the globe. So clearly this is a very important issue that we should be studying. We then um, applied copulas to actually look at the dependence structure of these. And I wasn't going to show this, this figure until I was inspired by Jakob's talk this morning. Uh, he called it the likelihood multiplication factor, which I liked, so I put that term in there. Basically, this is the, the, um, the likelihood multiplication factor of having a storm surge and the river flood exceeding the desired level of the levees uh, or dikes um, at the same time. And it's a change compared if we have if we include independence compared to if we wish to assume independence. Um, and so we're seeing, like the presentation this morning, that that can actually increase this dependence by, uh, uh, well, up to, uh, in some cases, more than a uh, factor of five, in, in many cases between two, two and five. So really, uh, we're increasing the probability uh, of, of these extreme events. The problem with this analysis, of course, is that we're using gauge stations, so a lot of the coastal, uh, coastline is simply missing because we don't have good enough observations. So Anais Kwanon, PhD student at our institute, is currently uh, doing a PhD trying to, to fill these gaps by using a modeling framework. So we simulate uh, daily discharge, daily surge, and then repeat the same kind of analysis with these uh, simulated data. Uh, and when we do that, this is the kind of results that, that you can see. And uh, in summary here, when we, do it, we find that almost a third of those locations along those coastlines still show this statistical dependence and quite some clustering along the, some of those coastlines that you see there. Now the next step was then to say um, what does this statistical dependence between these ex extremes, what does it actually mean for our impacts? And that's what Dan Islander is doing for his PhD in our group. So in this paper he is trying to look at um, water levels in deltas and estuaries and how they are affected by this compound effect of storm surge and discharge. So we force global models uh, with the same uh, meteorological climate data, so in this case it's era interim forcing, uh, precipitation, temperature, air pressure, wind. They go into some hydrological models to simulate runoff. We have a suite of uh, seven or eight models from the Earth to Observe, an EU project. Um, so we simulate runoff using those. And these variables go into the global tide and surge model uh, to simulate surge. They're added, we are add on tide from a, from a different model, a tidal model. Um, and they therefore give us for each estuary or, or, or delta, they give us downstream boundary conditions of the coastal sea level and upstream boundary conditions of runoff. They then go into a uh, hydrodynamic routing model in the, in, in the delta and we get this water level. Okay, and then we can start looking at scenarios with and without these compound effects of the different elements. So here we run these models for a time period of 30 years. Firstly, um, basically with some kind of climatology. So we run the river mod mod model using um, mean monthly discharge. So just the mean monthly discharge constant the whole time. And for the coastal boundary conditions, we just have the tide, so we remove the surge element. So we have some kind of baseline uh, water levels. Then we uh, keep the, just the tide for the, for the coastal components, but we add in the actual discharge simulation. So we can get the, uh, the water level as a result of this discharge and runoff signal alone. We can then do the same by putting the runoff back to the, the climatology but only running the surge analysis, and we get this, this orange line showing the bottom, and then of course we can run the two together. So did you have both the discharge and the, um, the, uh, and the coastal component, which, which here is referred to as the, the compound um, simulation. Well, that one's done really weird. Um, 
Anyway, yeah, so here there should be a figure which basically shows uh, this index that we've calculated for each of the high water levels, so any water level exceeding the 95th percentile. Basically, we look at the difference in the water level between that compound simulation and we, from that we subtract the water level from the maximum if we only look at the surge or the discharge. And this gives, and then we standardize with the standard deviation, and this gives us an indication of the compoundness of that particular event, of location, sorry. Luckily, this, uh, this one does work. Um, again, we don't go into details here, but what we're showing here is that mean compound flood <coughs> index, and what these red uh, dots indicate are those locations where we see that those interaction between those two drivers cause a significant increase in water level in that delta or estuary. And that uh, is the case for about 31% of the locations uh, here. Now, the last step that we, we've taken so far is to say, look at what does that actually mean for the, uh, the flood extent, so which areas have inundation. We did this in a paper in 2017 with Hiroaki Ikiuchi from University of Tokyo. And here we were simulating inundation flooding from rivers um, during Cyclone Sida in, in Bangladesh in 2007. So firstly, we run uh, a hydrodynamic model, Karma flood, where we assume that there's no surge or no tide. So we, we have the runoff from upstream, but the boundary conditions at the downstream, uh, so the coast, are set to zero meters. So the water can you know, discharge without any kind of backwater effects. And this is the inundation patterns that you get when you do that. Of course, we know that during Cyclone C that there was storm surge, and it was surge over various uh, tidal cycles. So we then couple this model to our global tidal surge model, rerun the analysis, and then uh, we see that this then would be the area that we inundated if we were to do that. And clearly, then, this simple graphic indicates that if we really don't look at this interaction between these compound drivers, then we're not going to get any uh, sensible results when we do our risk analysis. So this really shows the, to the conclusions. Uh, we found statistical dependence between surge and discharge for about 50% of, of gauge locations and 26% of model locations. Um, annual maximum water levels are significantly higher when surge and discharge interactions are included at 31% of locations. And so if you want to improve our global risk assessment and any scale risk assessment, I think it's essential uh, that we really try to integrate these two. Thank you. Thanks, Philip. Questions? <coughs> Great talk. Uh, just a, a general question about sea level rise, sort of to answer any way you want. I guess, you know, maybe in the historical analyses, have you either detrended sea level rise, but maybe in a, in a more interesting way, are you, th are you thinking about um, how sea level rise might change some of those relationships and sort of building that into some of the, some of the planning? Uh, yes. Um, so in here, we're not, so it's using the you know, current condition, assuming no sea level rise, but definitely we, uh, we do plan to do that in, uh, in the future, and we're running uh, various regional sea level rise scenarios through GTSM, which we, can then, uh, which we can go and do that. We're also working on some more stylized kind of um, simulations where we look at the sensitivity of this uh, inundation extent and, and risk uh, both the sea level rise, but also other changes uh, upstream, so deforestation, increasing urbanization, but also things like what's the shape of the basin, so how rapidly does it respond to rainfall, what kind of soil characteristics, and looking at those sensitivities as, as well. Other questions? A couple, I think, was first. Thank you for your talk. Um, I see a lot of potential here for um, storyline attribution um, of the human effect on uh, tropical cyclones um, uh, as well as uh, pseudo-global warming projections in the future. Um, how important are, is the interaction between um, um, the freshwater and the saltwater in other classes of storms other than tropical cyclones? So, so I'm interested in other classes of storms as well. I mean, so is this interaction important? You, some of your plots that show that, that they were correlated elsewhere, is it 
of the same order of magnitude, this interaction, for say like atmospheric rivers or extratropical cyclones, that kind of thing? Uh, yeah, so a um, good question. And that's something we are investigating at the moment. So with the current setup that we show here, we're forcing uh, the, uh, the Titan surge model with ERA interim. And so that means that the tropical cyclones, whilst they are in there somehow, they are not very well resolved at all. Uh, so the model performs well in extratropical regions, but not for cyclones. We are currently improving that by, um, by running best track data, you know, so actual observed uh, uh, storm tracks in, through the model, and also developing synthetic storm tracks, so hundreds of thousands of storm tracks, which we can then also uh, put through the model and then uh, be able to investigate those, those kinds of questions. Uh, something else that we're uh, we starting to look at is, is, is the opposite, the flip side, right? So not just the floods. Um, but also if you have low discharge w in combination with the high surge, which can lead to cold water intrusion and those kinds of other process-based uh, problems, in delta, especially for Delta regions. Thank you. Okay, um, I saw there were two more questions. Please hold on to these questions. We will have time at the end of the session um, for a more general discussion, but also for questions for the individual speakers again. So thanks again, Philip. Okay, the next presentation will be given by Kathy McGuinness. We are very happy that she made the trip all the way from Australia to tell us a little bit more about the efforts that have been going on um, in Australia to understand the drivers of compound events. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can people here, okay? If I move, do I just pick that one? Okay. Okay, thank you. So today I just wanted to give a, a brief uh, overview on, on a couple of studies uh, that are focusing on coastal extremes. I left the word coastal out of my title. It is meant to have the word coastal in it. Um, it'll be very brief because I'm not the lead um, investigator on either of these studies. Uh, I'm also not a statistician. I only collaborate with them, so um, I won't go into a lot of the statistical details. And, and the two studies I'll talk about too have both been published if anyone's interested in the results. Um, I do want to acknowledge all my co-authors co though, particularly Seth Wester and um, Wing and Wu from the University of Adelaide and some of my own team members uh, at CSIRO. Okay, so the motivation, my interest in compound events probably first started when I was a lead author on the IPCC SREX of Special Report on Extremes back in 2012 where we uh, our chapter first came up with a definition on compound events um, and I'm currently quite interested in them because I'm a lead author on the upcoming IPCC uh, special report on oceans and cryosphere and working on the chapter that's also dealing with compound events and cascading risk. Um, so yeah, it's a topic that I'm really interested in. Um, and of course the motivation is with the change in climate, uh, a number of different factors, elements in the climate system are working to enhance the, the, the likelihood of compound events occurring such as increasing temperature, increasing sea levels and also more energised storm systems. And of course many hazards that extre um, contribute to extreme events have some statistical dependence which increases the likelihood of those of events occurring. So just by way of background, I'll just give a little bit of a, I'll just give a few examples of some compound events that have occurred recently in Australia. That's just the background. Then I'll talk about the rainfall storm surge dependence study and then understanding factors causing extreme coastal impacts. So Australia is really prone to climate extremes. A lot of that has to do with uh, the strong influence modes of variability like ENSO have on our climate driving, causing droughts or floods and so on. And in 2018 alone, insurance companies paid out $1.2 billion in claims um, from extreme weather events. Now that might be due to droughts and, flood, um, droughts and, and extreme heat and so on, but Australia is also very, a very coastal nation with about over 80, about 85% of our population living within about 50 kilometres of the coast. So coasts, coastal extremes are very important. So here's just a few examples of some compound events that have occurred recently that have a bit of a coastal 
emphasis. So back in 2015, we had over a thousand kilometres of mangrove die back in northern Australia. Um, it's been investigated. It was during a, a strong El Nino event. Sea levels around northern Australia are lower when during an El Nino event. So we had low sea levels, ex more exposure for the mangroves, low rainfall, and of course with climate change and stronger temperatures, we had massive um, uh, dieback of, of mangroves in that area. And that's going to have important flow on effects because mangroves provide the nursery habitat for a lot of um, uh, species like prawns and fish and so on. So it'll possibly have significant flow on effects to the fishing industry in that region. The Brisbane floods is another example of a, a, of a um, it's a, a compound event that we discussed in a paper we put out, uh, Michael Leonard led back in 2013. Um, in, in this case, it was a La Nina event, very wet conditions leading up to, um, in, the, in the preceding season in Brisbane, and then a couple of, a few tropical cyclones in, in short succession meant that the, the dam levels were dangerously high and flood managers were, were forced to release water at probably the worst possible time when a, a major rainfall cell came across and it caused major flooding in Brisbane. And a third case which um, has interested me of, of recent times was the last, the 2015 El Nino, which caused major fires in Tasmania. But before even the fires were put out, we had a major marine heat wave off the east coast with an east coast low produced floods and so at the same time the emergency managers are fighting fires, they're also dealing with floods. Um, and, and this had a significant impact on the, um, the, the um, forest state product of Tasmania because there's a bit of a backstory here and that is that Tasmania relies a lot on hydroelectricity, the dam levels were very low. Um, when uh, hydropower is low, we, there's normally an interconnector to the, to, to the mainland, but unfortunately that um, went on the blink as well. So Tasmania had to import diesel generators to provide enough energy for the state. So this is sort of an example of how these events can cascade through the system and, and really compound the events. But anyway, that's not really what I was going to talk about today. Um, so now just to get on with these other studies that, that my team and um, uh, that we've, we've undertaken in collaboration. One of the studies was to look at how, how um, extreme rainfall and storm surge uh, de uh, are interdependent around the Australian coast. So it's a little bit similar to the talk that we just, just heard. And this builds on work that Seth, Seth Wester's team had been undertaking looking at coincident storm surge rainfall events for uh, Australian rainfall and runoff, in which they've used by their Ex threshold excess models to calculate the dependence. Um, and basically the idea is to look at um, quantifying the value uh, alpha, which is the dependence value on <coughs> extremes in uh, both the storm surge and the rainfall events, so the top 1% of those in, in the database. They focused their study initially on um, observations, so the rainfall observations around Australia on the left, Storm, uh, sorry, tide gauge uh, locations are on the right, and basically looked at um, um, rain, uh, looked at about a, a hundred kilometre radius to, to identify which rainfall uh, stations linked up with which um, uh, tide gauge locations. Now there were about seventeen thousand uh, rainfall stations available, but once you eliminated gappy data and um, short record lengths, 5,300 rainfall stations were used and we had about 79 tide gauges. Now in doing that, mapping that dependence parameter alpha comes up with this sort of colour coded set of spots around Australia. Basically the red spots indicate where there's high dependence between storm surge and um, rainfall extremes some dependence in the blue and yellow um, spots and then green tends to be where there's more independence so that the two events are not tending to coincide, certainly not the extremes of, the, of them. What, where we came into the, the study was that we'd, we'd undertaken a hydrodynamic hindcast, a 32-year 30, hindcast. And as you can see in this previous study, there's a lot of gaps around the coastline, so similar to the previous talk we gave, um, we, we were also interested in filling in these gaps using model data and investigating its suitability. So the, the 
um, hydrodynamic hyd hydrocast that we'd run um, was with the ROMS model at five kilometre resolution around Australia. Uh, we just, in this, although that study which has just been published was looking at um, future changes as well, our interest in this study was really just to look at the hindcast uh, and use that. Um, so when we applied the same method, we get the, the, the pattern on the right. So we picked off in the weather for, uh, in the in the run that's only forced with weather, so we don't worry about the tides in this. It's purely the storm surge component. The interesting thing is you can see that there's a pretty good um, representation in terms of filling in the gaps that we get from the observational data uh, around the coastline. And again, that shows that I think, yeah, we have strong dependence between rainfall and storm surge. We have uh, weaker dependence down on the south and, and some degree of dependence elsewhere around the coast. The other thing we did in the study was look at the kinds of weather patterns that are responsible for the coincident events. Uh, so here, uh, how we did this was to take the synoptic weather charts on the days in which um, extreme events coincided and synoptically typed them with um, a correlation based synoptic typing method based on Yarnall. Um, and so basically, in the, in the north, in the tropics, uh, unsurprisingly, that, now the paper goes into a lot more detail than this. This is just the most significant map um, for the coincident events. And basically, it's just highlighting that although it's mainly troughs along the coast that lead to the extreme rainfall, it's the closed lows, so tropical cyclones or tropical depressions that are the most common cause of coincident rainfall, storm surge events in the tropics. On the east coast, cut off lows or east coast lows. So these are lows that are cut off from the westerlies by blocking a ridge of high pressure. They're the most common cause of uh, coincident rainfall storm surge events in, on, along the east coast. And on the south coast, where there's less dependence, it's because frontal systems are the main cause of coastal uh, extreme sea levels. But although they produce rain, it's not, often not the most extreme rainfall. That comes at a different time of the year from convective systems that originate from inland. So that sort of ex helps to explain why there's less dependence um, in ex the rainfall events on the south coast. So that's just a very quick snapshot of the first st study I was going to talk about. The second study is uh, a, um, a study where we, we just, we're very interested in exploiting some of the data sets that we've developed, like wave hindcasts, storm surge hindcasts, things like this, to better explain the causal mechanisms in extreme events when they occur. Often when we're talking to coastal managers who are trying to respond to extreme events, we want to, they want to know what caused the extreme sea level. Was it um, you know, waves, was it storm surge, and so on. So this is a method that's very much built on Thomas Fowles' 2016 paper looking at extreme rainfall event, uh, sorry, at, um, extreme sea level events in the Gulf of Mexico. So basically what we've done here is um, applied a multivariate statistical analysis. Um, I won't go into the details because Alex Stevenson was involved in, in doing the statistical analysis for us. Um, and he's, he's a kind of an R, R guy, writes a lot of the extreme value packages in R. But anyway, um, basically what we were interested in is two events that occurred in, in um, one in Australia led to some pretty significant impacts along the coastline that were quite, un, quite unusual for the kind of event it was. And then a, a, an event in Fiji where uh, the Coral Coast was swamped. So what we basically did was really apply use wave energy to filter out um, the events in a time series, so the Sydney event and the Coral Coast event, applied um, uh, logistic, um, it, uh, sorry, logistic extreme value copulas to, to pull together all the different components leading to that event. But just to jump, because I'm out of time, sorry, <laughs> this is the last slide before the conclusions. So when we look at these events, uh, the, the events of interest are actually not the most extreme, not in the tail of a distribution from wave energy. When we calculate run-up using different um, empirical models, we see that the run-up contributes, helps push that more into the tail of the extremes. When we combine the total water level, which is tide and storm surge, 
Um, in the case of the Sydney case, it does become the most extreme event. In the Coral Coast case, though, not so much, and it could be that there's more local dynamics that we're not capturing in our study. But that's, we're trying to sort of improve on that method for the applications I mentioned before. So I'll just leave these summary uh, comments, uh, which are basically that we do find dependence between rainfall and storm surge, but it's different around the coast. Model hindcasts are really useful, we found, and we've, we can do a lot more work with some of our model um, data sets. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Cassie. We have time for one or two very quick questions. Kathy, I wondered if you could talk about the uh, effect of 50% of the Great Barrier Reef being uh, dead and uh, the other 50% uh, of the voters in Australia seem to be uh, dead as well. Uh, is that a function of Rupert Murdoch's uh, domination of the media to keep the people in Australia in the dark? really worries me when I go to some capital cities in Australia and I read the newspapers that they have there, although other people assure me that not many people read the newspapers anyway, anyway. but um, in, in Queensland in particular, uh, it's just amazingly polarised. Uh, it's quite phenomenal. We couldn't explain it, but the pollsters got it wrong too, I mean, and, and so did the book, bookmakers who were betting that uh, the other side of the political um, divide would get in and they got it wrong as well, which just goes to perhaps polling's not very effective anymore in capturing the sentiment of Australian voters because they're not available to answer polls via phones and things like that these days. No one has landlines anymore. If they do, they don't answer them anyway. So I don't know. Well, you're, I mean, there's you're, a lot of analysis going on in that. You're case. joining a, the club. Yeah. I, was, I was in England when Brexit happened. I came here when the current administration was elected. In between, I thought it was me, but that proves it's not. No. <laughs> uh, one more quick question, maybe? <clears throat> okay. Oh, yeah, go. Wait for the microphone, please. All right. The last slide that you were including storm surge and, and waves, uh, what do you think is the contribution of the two factors in Australia? Like how important, like how storm surge and uh, run up caused by waves, what's the main driver? Um. It, it wasn't the, the main driver, but it was it was a factor. In fact, in the Sydney case, it wasn't so much storm surge. That coast doesn't get huge storm surges, but it was the wave uh, wave height and the fact that there was a king tide playing out at the same time. But also the wave direction was a bit unusual. It was a more easterly wave rather than the more predominant southerly waves that, that impact that coastline. So I think it was um, a bit of a storm uh, king tide plus the unusual wave direction and the strong wave energy in that event that was the main driver of those coastal impacts. Tabriel in Spain, talking about multivariate stochastic modeling of long-term sea states for extreme and regular hourly conditions. Okay, thanks. Uh, well, thanks for the presentation. I'm David Lucio, I'm PC student at IH Cantabria. And I'm going to present the work uh, Multivariate Stochastic Modeling of Long-Term Sea States for String and Regular Early Conditions. This work uh, has been done with my work mates, Paula Carlos, Antonio Tomás, Javier López Lara, and Anginigo Lozada. Well, uh, first of all, I want to show you our problem. Uh, we want to study the whole flight cycle of a coastal structure and it involves that we have to analyze the port operation of the port, port terminals and the reliability of the robot. Then the word uh, multivariate stochastic modeling of long-term sea state for <laughs> string and regular conditions. This work uh, has been done with my work mate, Paula Carlos, Antonio Tomás, Javier López Lara, and Anginio Bolosada. Well, uh, first of all, I want to show you how uh, uh, to study oh the four flight cycle of a coastal structure. And Is the mic still on? That we have to analyze the port operation of the port terminals and the reliability of the robot. Then the word uh, multivariate stochastic modeling of long term sea state for string and regular conditions. This work uh, has been done with. My work mate, Paula Carlos, Antonio Tomás, Javier Lara, and Anginio Lozada. 
Well, uh... Okay. All right. I think I think I should fix that. Okay. All right. I think we're good to start again. Sorry about that. Okay. Well, uh, 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 we want to study the whole flight cycle of a coastal structure uh, with a probabilistic point of view, and it involves that we have to study the port operation of the port terminals and the reliability of the white water. So we have to study the regular conditions and the string conditions at the same time in order to verify the safety and the operational requirements. Uh, so it is, take, uh, it is taking into account that both wave climate regimes are multidimensional, <coughs> non-stationary, and self-dependent. So this is our, our goal. We have to study one port. And at this location, we have reliable uh, historical database. It makes possible to, to know uh, the temporal viability, the string regimes, or the correlation relationships. And now we, we want to study the long-term performance uh, based off on, on a climate emulator to study the future. And this climate emulator should keep the chronological processes, the stochastic behavior, the internal viability, the multivariate nature, the orbital scale, or the string nature. So this, this is the proposed methodology uh, to uh, study the long-term sea states. If this methodology takes a starting point, a uh, streaming events characterization, and in order to uh, uh, perform a, um, a temporal downscaling uh, at a hourly time scale. The, it is applied to simulate the, the hydraulic performance in the last point, and it is applied um, in the, uh, a case study in the Mediterranean Sea, and which is used to validate the methodology. Finally, some concluding remarks will, will, will be present. So I still remember that the main goal is simulating reliable wind driving events in a coastal site, taking into account the stochastic behavior and statistical relationships. But as is known, uh, sea states have a high dimensional dependence uh, relationships and a multivariate nature. To overcome this problem, we propose to use ocean copulas and clustering techniques. It enables to uh, isolate uh, climate-related events and characterize uh, the multivariate behavior of, of these sea states. These clustering techniques uh, are based on grouping the wave data according to the methodological processes. As the last speaker explained, it is taking into account the relationship between the predictor and predictor. Um, which establish a causal relationship between the methodological processes at, at a regional uh, wave generation, a wave propagation domain, and the, loc and the local wave climate. So we perform the clustering techniques over the predictor, and then we perform the Mulligan populas uh, over the, the, the wave climate. So the methodology can be performed for following the next three steps. Uh, first, we define the predictor and the predictor, and it is applied at Melike in the Mediterranean Sea. So, uh, the, the coupling method, uh, the relationship with the, between the predictor and predictor is, is relating uh, the, predict, uh, the two day mean sea level pressure and sea level pressure gradients to the daily maximum uh, significant wave height, uh, mean wave period, the storm source, and the mean wave direction. And then the temporal downscaling is performed uh, assuming a log normal distribution of the significant wave height and the mean wave period. And assuming that the mean wave direction and the storm source uh, keeps constant within the day. The first step is perform the, the, the clustering classification. In this case, we, uh, as, uh, we define set 64 daily weather types and the Markov, ch Markov chains as monthly tank scale in order to reproduce the chronological processes and the internal variability. Then we perform the multivariate characterization of the daily uh, 
of the daily predict plan. Uh, first, we, uh, we fit the marginal distribution for the daily variables, the correlation relations, the correlation uh, coefficients between these variables, and we define the 64 for the dimensional Gaussian populus. And the temporal double scaling is uh, performed assuming that the, the way mean wave direction of the state source keep, keeps cost, keep constant within the day and uh, simulating a log normal distribution for the significant wave type and the mean wave period. And the multivariate characterization is uh, performed following this relationship, as can be seen in, the, in this figure. So, uh, the, simulation, the simulation method starts by simulating the daily weather types using the Markov chains at the monthly time scale. And for each, each day, we simulate the daily maximum significant wave pipe, the daily maximum uh, mean wave period, the daily maximum uh, storm source at the mean wave direction. And then the temporal down scaling is performed, simulating a daily normal distribution for the significant wave pipe and for the mean wave period. It uh, allow, allow us to simulate 23, 23 random values of significant wave pipe and the mean wave period. And it is used to simulate uh, uh, many thousands of stations, many gears at daily and hopefully time scale. So this is the most relevant res results. Uh, as can be seen, uh, stream regimes and central regimes are in a good agreement with the intensity and frequency of the of, 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 of the data. And the multivariate nature is also simulated in both cases. So, uh, this work proposed a methodology for modeling long term uh, wave climate based on the weather time, weather time framework, in taking into account that the sea space variables are cross correlated, auto correlated, non stationary, and uh, simulating at the same time the stream regimes and the central regimes. It, is, it allows us to simulate reliable wave driving events at all written resolution with a good sensitivity level of the magnitude and frequency of the strings and regular conditions, and it is used to reproduce the whole life cycle of a coastal structure in order to reproduce from a probabilistic point of view its hydraulic performance. Thanks, David. Any questions? Hi, uh, very good presentation. Uh, I was wondering, how did you include the wave direction in the copula analysis? Uh, the wave direction is characterized by the empirical polar distribution. It, it is not fit to any uh, theoretical probability distribution. Okay. That's one more question. Hi, yeah, thank you. Uh, I was wondering why the choice of uh, Gaussian copula, since uh, in extreme events, uh, the, the, the events doesn't follow a normal distribution, so you could have well used the Levy copula instead of a uh, Gaussian copula. Gaussian copula can be used in this case if we use a clustering techniques because these clustering techniques uh, identify a, a similar wave climate data and the hypothesis of, uh, of wave of co Gaussian copula framework are valid. Okay, thank you again. Let's move on to the to the next speaker. Uh, This presentation will be given by uh, Merci Casas Pratt, and um, she will be talking about multivariate ocean wave extremes in the Arctic region. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm from uh, Environment Climate Change Canada, and I'm going to present uh, our ongoing analysis of multivariate ocean wave extremes in the Arctic region. 
So here, we are mostly focusing on the wave height and the wave period, which are two main wave parameters that characterize a wave climate. Uh, basically, wave height is the height, the wave period is related to the wavelength. And how, why is this important in the framework of causal risk analysis? So if we have both uh, high waves and long waves, we have more impacts in terms of flooding. We can also have more damaging conditions for infrastructure. And also, we can have, if we have very steep waves, uh, which means that we have high waves and low wave periods, we can have uh, more short-term coastal erosion. So it's really important to know how these two uh, we, uh, wave variables are interconnected in terms of coastal hazards. And how the dependence between the two works. In a general framework, if we have what we call fully developed wind sea states, in which we have uh, wind um, transferring energy to waste for a certain amount of uh, time, we, we have a relationship in which the wave period is more or less proportional to the square root of the wave height. But as soon as these waves start to propagate and they are no longer, they are no longer so connected, we have swells in which we can have wave periods, large wave periods, but not necessarily large wave heights. And also in areas affected by sea ice coverage, we can have um, an attenuation of the wave height and not necessarily an attenuation of the wave period. Uh, on the other hand, we have, um, when we have growth of waves and waves become very steep, so we have large values of wave heights and um, low values of wave period, waves start to break and therefore we have an asymmetry uh, of the domain here. So in a general framework, um, without dividing into cases, we would use asymmetric copulas. Um, so in the Arctic region, uh, global warming is really leading to dramatic changes. Sea ice has been retreating and is projected to continue to do so. There has been some observations uh, in the recent years seeing waves uh, as high as five meters, which uh, we have not seen before. And all the climate models project um, a summer month without sea ice coverage. So we wonder how waves will be in the future and how these waves way climate can affect the coastal the coastlines in the Arctic region. In order to answer that question, we have developed um, wave uh, climate for the future because waves are not included in the, today in, in the output of climate models. So we have used five CIMED-5 models to simulate waves in this, in this region at 25 kilometers offshore and 12 kilometers along the coastline for historical period and for the future using surface wind and using sea ice concentration. So the analysis we carry out here is uh, try to um, see um, what's going to happen with the storm events, including wave height and wave period. So we define storm events with a typical peak over threshold method. We define a threshold over which uh, we have an event, and also we define the minimum condition for this to be classified as an event, and also we define the time between uh, different events. So in order to capture in the event, uh, events that might be uh, dependent and therefore we try to just select the independent ones. Um, here we use some sensitivity analysis. We end up using uh, nine, the 90 percentile for the wave height and for the wave period and these durations. So for each event, we select the maximum value for each two these two variables. Um, for the wave height and for the wave period, we fit the general generalized Pareto distribution. Um, since we're assuming here stationary conditions, we use the three months that um, summarize the more extreme conditions for the historical and for the future. Um, since we are in the Arctic region, um, this really depends on the sea ice coverage, which is highly seasonal. So for the, for the historical, we have the summer, late summer months, and for the future, we have the, the fall months. Um, we do the same for the wave period. We have this fit, and then we try to correlate the, or to see the dependence between these two variables. Here I'm showing in, um, in black would be all the observations and in red would be the selected storms. Uh, as you can see, they do not necessarily overlap because we chose to use the maximum wave height and the maximum wave period for each event, which do not necessarily occur at the exact same time step, but we thought it was representative of, of the event. And so we try to estimate um, the dependence between these events using copulas using then that use the non exceeding probabilities that we have obtained with the marginal distributions. And we consider different type of copulas and we uh, chose the ones that are um, with a likelihood method that define that for each particular 
location. So we obtain copulas like Clayton copulas or combined copulas that are all uh, asymmetric. So once we have this, we can compute the return period. Um, in this case, we have two variables. So we have the, the uh, average time between storms, which can be computed as the number of years be divided by the number of storms. And then we have the probability of exceeding both these variables, and which can be derived from the marginal distributions and uh, from the copula. If we compare this with a univariate analysis, for example, using just the wave height, we would only have, sorry, we would only have this probability with just the marginal distribution. So here the question we ask is how much more frequent a historical extreme event uh, will be in the future. For example, like an event that in average will occur every 50 years in historical conditions, how often will happen in the future? If we use the univariate ap approach, for example, if we compute the water level, we mean many, many factors in, uh, can cause water level elevations, but here just focusing on the wave-driven uh, factor, if we just use the wave height, we would have that uh, this historical event that occurs every uh, 50 years, we can calculate the value, and then we can calculate how often this, uh, this value will happen in the future. If you look into the varied approach, uh, we would have that the water level would depend on the wave height and in the wave period. But in this case, if we set, for example, a 50 years return period, we don't know have a unique uh, um, value. We have like an infinite pairs of possible wave heights and wave periods that will occur on average every, f uh, that will be exceeded on average every 50 years. So the methodology we use is we select the pair that will be most uh, the, um, likely to occur and we, it's the maximum of the joint probability that they function uh, using the copulas and using the, the marginal distributions. So then we can put this, this, uh, this pair and we can put it in the future distribution and then we can we'll calculate how often uh, this pair of values will happen in the future. So here just an example of a location and uh, Utiagbik in Alaska, which is a location that has reported like already damaging conditions in the past years with lots of floods and, and, and erosion. So um, here just looking into the annual um, maximum value of the wave height and the wave period is projected to increase double or by 50% toward the, toward the end of the future with an increase of the number of storms by more than 50%, uh, just looking into these three months uh, of analysis. So the universe analysis it gives us a value um, that an event that occur for historical conditions every 50 years will occur every five years in the future. But if you look at the deliberate analysis, that increase of the risk is even higher because it will occur every 2.5 years. That's, we have here average all the uh, climate models we consider. So uh, if we consider the risk here, just including the increase of the probability, we'll see that if we just take the univariate approach, we are underestimating the risk. So we try to understand why this uh, risk is underestimated, why we have a higher risk, just like including more variables. And in this case, um, if we compare the plot on the left, sorry, uh, the plot on the left would be historical conditions and the right would be future conditions. And this is uh, wave uh, period and wave height. So uh, in the future, we have an increase of the wave period uh, which is not directly linked to wave, an increase of wave height, and this is because um, we have more intrusion of waves that have been propagated from different areas, and, and that means that actually we have a l lower correlation between these two variables, which is increasing the risk, because if we have high wave heights, we'll probably have high wave periods, but if we, don't, if we have medium wave heights, we can still have large wave periods, that's increasing the risk. And just to finalize, um, for example, that can also be seen here in the spatial pattern of the um, wave height on the left and wave periods on the right, we see similar patterns for the Arctic region. But if you look into the future, we see this intrusion of swell waves from the Atlantic, and therefore, which um, can have an impact in this area, leading to large uh, values of wave periods, not necessarily linked to large values of, of wave heights. So to conclude, so both wave height and wave periods play an important role in coastal hazards. And in the Arctic, the increases are really uh, notable uh, because we have an extreme um, sea ice retreat. And in the framework of coastal uh, risk assessment, it's very important to include wave period together with wave height and, of course, other 
uh, coastal drivers as, such as storm surge or uh, sea level rise, and otherwise, if we just include wave height, we could uh, be underestimating the risk we can have in the future. And thank you. Thanks, very interesting. Um, do you have any questions? Maybe uh, for a comment or a question, just curious. Think of the Arctic sea ice as one of these, the reduction in Arctic sea ice is one of these drivers um, uh, of many effects. You know, to what extent, what's your opinion on how much the models might be able to simulate how loss of Arctic sea ice could modify the, the storminess itself? I guess maybe, maybe you're alluding to that, but if, if we're underestimating how fast we're losing, our, we might lose Arctic sea ice, would we also maybe be underestimating possible changes in storminess? And then at some point, you even hit a threshold where maybe the waves are more able to break up whatever remaining sea ice is left because it's you know so compromised. I don't, I don't know. So currently, it's, um, there's no coupling of the waves with the with the climate models. So uh, actually, what we could be seeing is is more that what the, actually the models are projected in terms of uh, sea ice retreat. Um, uh, there's a, there's a lot of uncertainty in the in the models. Uh, it's still like a lot of room for improvement, but. Even that uncertainty, there is statistically significant increase of, of these wave conditions. Even if the winds are the same, just because you have a larger area and you have uh, to generate and propagate those waves, you have an impact. There was one more question in the back. <coughs> so what action is the Canadian government taking to evacuate the indigenous people that are living on the coastline in the Arctic area? I'm not sure I'm the best per person to answer that question. Uh, that's for sure something that now is a priority to study what's happening in the north. It's very important for Canadian government, which is gov uh, Canada, uh, it's a Canada um, coastal nation, and the north is a very important area. But yeah, that's definitely not I don't have the answer for that. Okay. Thanks again. All right. As you can see, our last speaker, uh, Ivan Haig, unfortunately couldn't be here um, in person, but technology makes it possible for us that he can still deliver um, his presentation on the characteristics and drivers of compound flooding events around the UK coast. Can you hear us okay, Ivan? Uh, I can hear you. Can you hear me all right? That is perfect. You can get started. Okay, first of all, I just wanted to say a big sorry that I'm not there in person. I was really, really looking forward to coming, but unfortunately a few things have prevented that. Uh, secondly, I just wanted to say a massive thank you to the conference organizers uh, for letting me do this remotely. That's very, very kind of them, and uh, it seems to be working so well so far. And finally, just to, uh, to say I've really enjoyed watching the presentations today, just a word of, word of warning, uh, watch out what you say in the breaks. Uh, I can hear everything. <laughs> okay, so let's make a start. So together with uh, one of my PhD students, Ali Hendry, and a number of co-authors, we've been looking at compound flooding around the UK coast. Now, I don't need to spend too much time on this because it's already been covered in the last natural uh, disasters. Sorry, can you still hear me okay? You cut off there for a second, but it's, it's good now. Maybe keep on going. Hopefully. Okay, I'll carry on. So as I was just saying, flooding is one of the most dangerous and costly uh, of natural disasters. Munich Reed uh, estimated that something like one trillion in losses and at least 220,000 fatalities have happened since 1980 as a result of flooding. Uh, I personally think those numbers are underestimated. Uh, I had a look at those uh, estimates in quite a bit of detail, and, and I estimate that around 50% of those deaths, and certainly a large proportion of those uh, economic losses, have occurred in coastal regions. Now, coastal regions are especially vulnerable to flooding because they're at the interface of both the marine forcing, uh, but also the terrestrial forcing as well. And clearly, as you all know, coastal regions are are home to many, many millions of people, particularly in low-lying deltas. They form 
important strategic centers, many of, it, many of the world's largest cities are on the coast. So Cloud Valley in Paris is, is a, a vital area of research. So in coastal zone, flooding occurs as a result of four main processes. First of all, we have the coastal processes, and here is a storm tide. So this is the Thames Barrier in London, holding back a, a storm surge coinciding with a large astronomical tide. In certain regions as well, we have uh, flooding due to waves. Sometimes these occur at the same time as the storm surge. Sometimes they can be separate if it's a remote, remotely generated swell, for example. Now, clearly in coastal regions like in uh, London, we can also get fluvial uh, flooding. And not many people know this, but the, the barrier there is also designed to protect from fluvial flooding. Uh, and then we also have pluvial flooding. Um, forgive me for missing out of the ground, but that's to be quite localised in some areas. Around most of the UK, we're, we're subject to one of these four flooding. And we're particularly interested in looking We've looked at all four, but I'm going to focus in this presentation primarily on the first two and mention the others uh, at the end. So we're going to look at uh, when we get storm tides and river discharges occurring at the same time. So Phil's already given you a fantastic presentation showing you some of our work at global scale. Here we've tried to really come down to the UK, use as many sites as possible, and really try to make sure patterns. So in the UK, flooding is ranked as the second highest risk for causing civil emergency. People at risk of flooding. Each year, flooding results up pounds in annual damages. So it's quite significant. And what's really interesting about the UK is compound flooding is not particularly new. Uh, so Granger is as far back as 1959, did a very localised study at looking at sort of river discharge and storm surges. And actually in the last 15 years, a number of authors, primarily Peter Hawkes and Cecilia Simpson, have looked at compound flooding. But here, what we've tried to do is build on those studies and really look at the drivers in a much more detail. And I think we've had a, a bit of a breakthrough in understanding some of the drivers and the spatial patterns. So what we've done is we've taken 33 tide gauges around the coast, showed by these uh, numbered black dots. Uh, we then looked at the National River Flow Archive. There's over 1,500 river sites, but we've looked at all the ones above a certain uh, flow rate, and we settled on 326 river sites. The triangles discharge the west coast. Also to the, uh, to the south coast, the circles uh, into the east coast. And then in addition to that, we've looked at meteorological uh, data. Uh, now with each uh, river discharge site, we've paired it to the nearest tide gauge site. Sometimes this is done automatically, uh, but sometimes that can pair it to the wrong site. So we've very carefully looked at each of the 326 in turn, make sure it's corresponding to the right, uh, roughly the right catchment. Uh, so there are the pair of sites there. And what I'll do is I'll illustrate it with a site. I'll illustrate our method with a site on the south coast. So this is Devonport or Plymouth, as, as many people know it. So what we've done is we've taken the daily maximum storm surge or skew surge on the x-axis, and we've plotted that against daily maximum river discharge on the y-axis, total water level, storm plus the tide. So you can see there definitely appears to be some sort of dependence. And what we've done is we've looked at three regions. Zone one, where we had high skew surges, but not high river discharge. Zone two is what we're primarily interested in, the red dots there, it's about eight red dots, where we've had high skew surges and high river discharge at the same time. And then zone three, where we just have high rivers, river discharge. And what we've done is we've looked at two methods. The first method is a dependency approach, where we use the Kendall's rank correlation coefficient, tau, to, to statistically measure the dependence and its significance at 95% confidence interval. And then we've done something very, very simple, which, we, which is just to simply count the number of joint occurrences per decade. We've normalized it per, by, per decade just because some sites have different uh, data lengths. Now, this is another site uh, on the east coast of the UK. And here you can see it's very different. The dependency is much lower. And actually, there's no joint occurrences in that zone too. So what I'm going to do now is show you a spectral plot. So this spatial plot shows the dependency between the, between the tide gauge and each of those 326 river discharge sites. Now this is the dependency between river discharge and high water levels or total water levels, which is a combination of the tide and the surge. 
And this is the spatial pattern of dependency, that, that this is the joint occurrence per decade. So we see that we're, at some sites, we're getting about two occurrences per decade when we have both high river discharge and high storm surge. Now, this is between total water level. And one of the problems with total water level is it contains the deterministic tide, which isn't related to the storm. And if we remove the tide, we get much higher dependency value shown, uh, shown here. So just flicking back, uh, and actually the area uh, on the west coast there is actually where the tide is very low. And that's probably why there's a high dependency there. But this is now just purely the storm surge component. And what's really nice is we see this very, very clear east-west pattern. So on the west coast of the UK, there's high dependency and a high joint number of occurrences between storm surge and high river discharge, about between five and six occurrences per year. Uh, but what you see very clearly is on the east coast, there isn't that high uh, dependency. Now, this is at time zero. But what we've done is we've looked at a lag dependency as well. So we've lagged it from minus five uh, to plus five days. And here we're lagging the, the storm surge on the river, river discharge. And what's really interesting is we see a spatial pattern again. On the west coast, we find that the, the storm surges tend to occur two to three days before the high river discharge. Uh, on the east coast, particularly in this region here, we find that the river discharge occurs about two days after the peak storm surge. The gray is where they occur uh, together. And certainly you can see a number of coastal sites where they are occurring uh, together, particularly in South Wales, for example, down, down here and on the south coast. And if we just pick up a particular Tidegate site, Devonport, you can see that there's quite an interesting pattern with the dependence. As we go from minus five days up to zero, it, uh, the dependence increases quite rapidly, but then it sort of uh, tails off. And I think this is because the discharge stays high uh, for a longer period of time after the sort of peak river, river discharge. But it's quite interesting. If we pick another site uh, in Scotland, we see a similar sort of similar sort of pattern, which is very, very interesting. So if the river discharge was to stay high and you've got a second storm surge occurring three or four days later, again, that could be another mechanism uh, for getting compound flooding. Now, what's really interesting is looking at this east-west patterns and what we've done is we've picked these three zones and each of the three zones, we've looked at the weather conditions during every storm. So in zone two here, for example, we have eight storms. We've looked at the atmospheric pressure, the sort of weather conditions each of those storms, and we've produced a composite plot, kind of averaging down through the storm to give us our average conditions. So on the top panel, I'm gonna show the sur storm surge only. So these were events where it was a high, high storm surge, but not a high river discharge. And this is the events that affected Devonport on the south coast. But what you can see is there's a low pressure system to the north of Ireland uh, developing there. And this low pressure system generates very, very high winds. So we get very high winds to the south of the storm, uh, which push water up onto the south coast to generate that, that high storm surge. Remember, these are average conditions. This is the average of 41 events here, 41 storm surge events, high storm surge, but not high river discharge. This is a proxy for rainfall. We've used precipitable water content. And here you can see the precipitable water content is rel relatively low. And this is why these 41 events that all had similar characteristics were storm surge only. We can then look at the 11 events and look at the composite plots for those where we had joint occurrence. Here, and you can see that the, the events are very similar, actually. The storm is situated uh, just to the northwest uh, of Ireland. But the difference now is we get this sort of band of pressure here. Uh, we get the high winds again, but now we get this front of rainfall. So we get this band of rainfall coming in. And so you can see this is why we get both a, a storm surge, but also high rainfall. Whereas if we look at the river only events, these tend to be a slightly weaker storm often uh, a bit further away from Ireland, uh, but the wind patterns uh, aren't as strong, but we still have that band of high rainfall. And what's really interesting is on the west coast, when we look at all the sites on the west coast, there's very, very similar patterns. And the storms are quite similar in characteristics. There's just subtle differences, uh, particularly when we get this nice band of rainfall coming that lead to a joint event. Whereas what you can see if we look at the west coast, the storms are completely different. So with storm surge only, the storms pass to the north of Scotland. It's actually when the storm is over Scandinavia, it's winds at the bottom of the storm 
that generate your large storm surge, but no rainfall. Whereas storms that generate, so here there's no joint occurrence events at this particular site. Storms that generate lots of rainfall and river discharge tend to pass over the, the center of the UK. And actually you can see that here. So the surge only events here, we've digitized all of the tracks uh, and the blue shows the average track. So storms tend to pass over and it's actually when the storm is over Scandinavia that you get your storm surge with river discharge only. It's a much weaker storm crossing the center of the UK. So you can see that on the East Coast, we very rarely get storm events that are compound because they're completely different storm systems. Uh, now, that helps to explain this east-west divide. Just very quickly, we see some regions even within that where we get lots of compound events, others that don't. So just very quickly at the end, we've also looked at three other things. We've looked at base flow. Uh, so the higher the base flow, the less flashy the system is, the lower the base flow, we have a system that's We've looked at the catchment area of the rivers. Is it big? Is it small? And we've looked at the altitude variation. Is that catchment steep or is it gentle? And our hypothesis is that the smaller catchments that are steep with lots of flashiness are more likely to experience compound events because the, the water can get to the coast quicker, uh, similar to the time of the storm surge. So what we've done is for each catchment, uh, this shows the base flow index, very, very high base flow index in these sort of clay soils and solvent. This is the size of the catchments. So you can see the Thames catchment is quite big. This is the altitude variation. So on the south coast, the catchments are quite gentle. Up north in Scotland, they're very steep. And what we find is if we plot the base flow index against the dependent, we do see a statistically significant correlation. And typically, the more flashier the catchment, the lower the baseline index, the higher the dependence between storm surge and river discharges. It's weaker with area, but again, we see that the smaller the catchment, typically the higher the correlation, uh, whereas the larger catchments tend to have a lower dependence. Uh, if we look at the altitude variation, it's much more spread, but, but again, we see that the steeper the gradient, the higher the dependence is. Obviously, the water is getting quicker tide edge site. We don't see as clear a relationship with the, with the lag times. So just in summary, just coming to an end, we found that there's definitely this very clear difference between the east and west coasts. Uh, we see that we've been able to explain much of this variability by looking at the storm characteristics. We also find that higher storm surges and tend to occur at the same time as river discharge in catchments with a lower base flow index, which is very flashy, smaller catchments and steeper gradients. Uh, whereas the large catchments, shallow gradients, the discharge tends to occur sometime after the ski surge. You can read this results all in this paper that's just been published in the last few days. We've actually recently expanded this to look at waves and river discharge, and we're hoping to publish that shortly. And just to mention, we have two funded projects just starting called Chance with Thomas Wall uh, and Compound Flooding, looking at flooding around the North Atlantic coastlines and in coastal Vietnam. Hey, thank you very much, um, and I hope you can hear me too. Thank you, Ivan. Do we have any questions for Ivan? Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I was wondering uh, if, so in, in your, I guess on the last slide you mentioned, you're going to look at how um, these, these compound extremes might change in the future. So presumably that's going to be using models. And I was wondering how well these models, how well the global climate models represent some of the processes that are associated with the compound extremes, either the characteristics, the storm characteristics, or um, both the, the river discharge and, and um, storm surge events. Thomas, could you just very briefly quit? Clearly, I'm afraid. A uh, question was about um, how confident you are I have to say we are because I'm also on this project. Um, when we look at future changes in compound flooding, we supposedly will use some kind of model output. How well do we think these models represent the processes that can lead up to, to compound flooding? Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, sure. Thank you. That was a very good, uh, very good question. So in this, we deliberately focused on the, the measured data. We really want to focus on the measured data first. In this chance project that Thomas is involved in, we'll be looking at the, the sort of model in cars. Uh, we have 
Print, we don't know how accurately they represent particularly the compound flooding, but again, that's part of the, uh, part of the chance project. And we're hoping to uh, extend some of Philip's stuff, look at this all around the coastline. But one of the really interesting things is now that we know the types of weather patterns that cause, look at meteorological analysis, even future climate models and see, uh, do those types of weather events become more frequent? More questions? Maybe this one yeah, seems sure to be pretty, work, no. working pretty well. Hi, Ivan. Great talk. Um, I'm just wondering, this work seems like it has a lot of applicability for thinking about improving flood warnings at site-specific locations. And so I was wondering if you've actually started to link any of these events to flooding, and if you see some of these areas that have more regional dependence, um, if there are certain characteristics in specific regions that actually are driving flooding. Yeah. More likely Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Katie. Again, uh, uh, I've developed a, a code for investigations, and we do find that there's a number of significant flood events at different parts of the UK that we can be uh, to coastal flooding. We haven't yet uh, looked at the sort of probability or characteristics of those, but again, we're hoping to do that as part of this chance uh, project. So uh, keep in touch with me, and if we've got any results, um, I'll be happy to share it with you at that point. But what's really interesting is the UK Flood Forecasting Centre have 30 uh, sort of weather conditions around the UK that they can actually, uh, based on mean sea level, that they can actually forecast between 10 and 30 days out. And what we've been doing is helping them look at particular weather patterns that favour these compound events. And again, we're hoping that, that will sort of aid the forecasting of the compound events. Um, it's quite an exciting. Okay, was that, did you get the last part? Okay, then thanks again, Ivan. Please stay on the line, we have a couple more minutes, um, actually 10, 15 minutes. Um, before I open the, the floor for more general questions, kind of following up on what Katie was asking about applicability, and I'm not sure if you realized it, but the six speakers that we had represented six different countries. We had the Netherlands, Australia, the US, Spain, Canada, UK, and if you count me and let me represent Germany, that makes seven. I know there are many other people in the room from, from different countries. Um, so one thing that I want to know, and that's just my curiosity, and it may not be a fair question for a room full of climate scientists, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. So by show of hands, I want to know how many of you know for certain that in your country there is some kind of guidance in place at the federal level, state level, local level that at least includes some aspect of compound extremes that is used for risk analysis, that is used for design, that is implemented in codes, uh, zoning and stuff like that, um, for flood risk purposes, for example. So who knows that for certain? Okay, we have that's Australia, and that is Switzerland. Okay, so there are some kind of guidelines that include um, compound extremes. How many of you know for certain that in your country there are no guidelines yet that include compound extremes? Okay. How many of you are not so sure? Okay. And I think that is maybe one of the things where we have to improve to better connect the climate science with practitioners, engineers. If we don't even know whether or not in our country we already have guidelines in, in place that tackle compound events in a certain way, um, it's hard for us to come up with something that, that is directly applicable um, to, to uh, extend on that. And then Kate mentioned it. It's not about the, the best and the newest science, it's about applicable science. So I think we are probably still far away from really implementing all of the stuff that we have seen here today. But the recurrent themes that came up in almost all of the talks were populous. So over the last 15, 20 years, and Carlo was the one who published the first paper, at least in the water resources world, 
the copulas were used. So they have been developed and further developed and applied a lot over the last 15 to 20 years, and tools have been developed. Amir Agakucha's group um, has been developing a method towards um, Carlo and John Faust and others have been developing R code. So I think we are relatively close to at least use these kind of tools in a, in a better way in our, in our design concepts. And, and that is just um, something that I kind of expected um, this distribution between knowing, not knowing, and not so sure. But maybe the two examples that we have, can you mention or very briefly explain how? Let's start with This one. Okay, yeah, this is working. Here we go. Yes, so the examples that I'm aware of, they're from uh, the DDR community. So I think we are, as a climate science or meteorology community, lacking behind the natural disasters communities where these cascading events have been of major concern for a long time and they have been thinking about ways how you can develop storylines of such cascading events and also include that in yeah disaster risk reduction and uh, preparedness of of the um, intervention forces that need to deal with these events Um, in Australia, the, we're unaware that um, coincident or compound events are taken into account is in the guidance for um, uh, flood engineers, the Australian rainfall and runoff, and that's the work that um, one of my co-authors, Seth Westra, had been involved in um, developing the guidance around how to include coincident storm surge in assessment of uh, extreme rainfall runoff. That's the only example in Australia, though, that I'm aware of, them, um, that it's through uh, Engineers Australia in their guidance material. Okay. I didn't see Ivan. Uh, did you raise your hand behind me? Is there anything in the UK? I'm really sorry. I'm. Are you aware of anything in the UK where compound extremes, flooding um, in particular, have been included in guidelines already? Uh, not that I'm aware of yet, no. So um, on the risk register, they're ignored. Uh, they're starting, we're starting to talk about it quite a bit. We've had a number of sort of workshops. But in fact, the government just recently did a review on compound flooding, but nowhere is it sort of officially in any sort of policy yet that I'm aware of. Okay, um, then I would open up the floor for general comments regarding this applicability of science, asking specific questions. We had a few specific questions that we couldn't take um, during this session for, for some of our speakers, so maybe start with those. Anybody who has questions? There's one here. Uh, so my question started with uh, the presentation by Professor Ward, but really this is open to any of the speakers. Um, we've mentioned a lot about the issues potentially with uh, the models that we use, and so I noticed that the models only uh, underestimated the, 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 the core occurrence of these events. I think it was like 20, like 50 percent of the sites had, uh, from the observational data, uh, strong core occurrence, but the models only showed 25 percent of the sites or something like that. So I guess the question is, um, why is next for the models? Is it high resolution? Is it processes that we're not capturing? What do you think is next uh, for, for do we then to be able to use this for climate change studies? Yeah, good question. Um, so I think it, you know the discrepancy between the, the, that model, the, what was it, the observed 50% and the model 26%. That's also, of course, because we have different uh, locations. So that was one of the, 
the things about that study is, is we simply don't have data for a lot of the, the coastline. So that could be one discrepancy. Uh, but on the other hand, you're, you're right, of course. There's many things which are not included uh, in those models. As I said, that, that particular analysis was based on era interim data, so we're not resolving a lot of those tropical uh, kind of processes. We're already making advances now by using uh, era 5 data, which already gives you a they represent it somewhat better. Um, and then also with this representation of actual synthetic storm tracks, which takes us, I think, um, closer to what we, mean, what we, what we need. Uh, but, but that's all well and good, but I think a lot of the work that we've been doing on our global risk modeling as well is, is very top-down modeling, you know, do the whole world at once. And another of the issues, major issues, is the exposure and vulnerability data that we're using, right? So we have land use maps or population maps of one kilometer grids to represent whole uh, social and economic uh, sectors. Uh, because we don't have the better data at global scale to be able to do that. Um, whereas now, at least in our group, we're trying to move towards more uh, globally applicable approaches so that you could, for example, use global hydrology or, or, or surge models to force more local hydrodynamic models in those lake locations that you're interested in, get a lot better higher resolution of both the hazard, but also using local data sets of exposure, so actual building level data, asset level data, and information on vulnerability where and when you have that. So substituting the best data that you have, if you don't have it, use the global data. If you do have it, use the uh, more local data. So really trying to bridge those, that, that the scale between the global and the local studies, I think. Yes, there's another question in the back. Well, Philip's got the mic. I've got a question for Philip. Uh, I noticed on your uh, PowerPoint that you had a number of uh, dots around uh, Scandinavia, Sweden, Norway. We haven't heard much about that area. What uh, information can you share with us about uh, the situation there? Um, do we have I can pull it up. <laughs> uh, so um, I don't have the exact dots in my mind. So that's one of the issues working globally, of course. Uh, I don't know all of those, but hopefully Thomas can, can pull those up. Um, probably going up a bit. These ones. ones the model ones yeah. or the observations? These ones? Or maybe go to the observations if there's anything uh, in there. That's one. Yeah, so we're seeing uh, this area here where we, um, you know, we're missing a whole load of, of the, the Scandinavian regions, right? So in, in that sense, we just don't have a much of an impression there. Maybe if we skip through to the, the model data. Um, at least along those, um, those coasts that I'm seeing there, our simulations are, are, are not picking up uh, much of a compound signal in this particular region. Um, I would certainly be interested to hear from anybody in this room who might uh, be working more locally in that region if that uh, is also something that people are finding in their own studies or not. There is another question. I'm um, also having a question for uh, Professor Ward. Uh, so um, uh, I, I see there, uh, there is uh, uh, the uh, session, uh, section of uh, modeling of the tide uh, in your model. And uh, it seems like you use the uh, GTSR model to model the search. And then before going to the common flood, you uh, uh, superimpo uh, superimpose the tide with the um, uh, FES 2012 model. I will uh, wonder, uh, 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 could you explain a little bit of the choice and if the model is sensitive to the different choice of the uh, tidal, uh, tidal modeling schemes and input data? Thank you. So thanks for the good question. So I, I'm not the person who ran either GTSM or uh, or, or the VES model. So I can I can give you the knowledge that I I know of how that worked. Um, the reason in this analysis that we because because GTSR the GTSM sorry the global tide and surge model uh, as the name says has tide and surge in it. 
In the version of the model which we were using for this analysis, which was the first version, um, we discovered that those tides were not particularly well represented, or at least they were better represented in the FES uh, simulation data. One of the reasons for that was that the first version of GTSM did not well uh, represent self-attraction and loading, a very important tidal um, uh, process. Uh, in the new version of GTSM, which is uh, now being developed at Delta Aris, that, that has been uh, included, so there's many of these processes have been included. So we would, if we were to rerun this analysis, just use the GTSM also for the tidal component. Um, and that's also important because uh, now we're simply adding on the, the, the tide at the, the end, right? So you're assuming there's no interactions between tide and, and surge. Um, so an analysis that Sana Mouse is doing at the moment is, also with other people here, is to look at those interactions between side, tide and surge, which, which do exist. So um, it's also a, uh, a joint process that we are now examining as well. Okay, we have time for one more last question, comment, all the way in the back. <clears throat> Thanks. So my question is, in uh, most of the studies, uh, the dependencies between storm surges and, and pluvial or river and flooding is considered. Uh, so I wonder why um, dependencies between wave, for example, wave run-up, and these meteorological forcings are not that much studied and how we can study them, considering that the cycles in the wave is pretty short. Anybody wants, I mean, I know it has in, in, in many cases to do with data availability. So wave records are often even shorter than, than the overlapping tide gauge and precipitation or, or river gauge uh, records. So that is, that is one thing, but that's basically the focus of the project that Ivan mentioned, um, where we want to extend this analysis to for the entire North Atlantic Basin, include, include waves, um, wave height, wave period um, into the analysis. And I think, uh, Philip. Just, just to mention, Marta Marcos has done a, a study of waves recently globally that's just been published in GRL. So she's looked at wave and storm surges globally. And I, Frank Seifen, I was going to add that also there's some work uh, at the European scale by the Joint Research Center in, uh, in, in Ispra. Uh, Michaelis Bustukas and, and colleagues are also trying to incorporate this, uh, this aspect as well. Yeah. So that is oftentimes the, looking at the correlation between wave parameters and like search the paper from Marta um, that was published recently. Um, and then with wave run-up um, or wave setup, that often is a tricky thing if you do it at large spatial scales. Um, wave setup, we often use a very simplified assumption of 0.2 times the significant wave height to represent the wave setup. Wave run-up, we need, we need information on the, on the beach slope um, before we can really use simplified models again, like the one by Stockton um, et al. Um, to, calculate, to calculate the wave run-up. But it is a an important driver for coastal hazards in many regions like the, uh, the west coast of the United States. Katie has done a lot of work um, showing the importance of waves. So I think it is, it is work that's underway and it is work that is important. Okay, um, I think we are just five minutes behind schedule, so let's please um, thank all the speakers one more time. I would just start. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back and welcome to the evening session. I hope you've all had a good dose of coffee so that you're refreshed and eager to learn about concurrent events. And our first presentation is an invited presentation, which will be given by Thomas Wahl, and he will introduce uh, multivariate statistical tools that allow to assess spatial footprints of global storm searches. So the floor is yours. We're looking forward. Thank you very much. I'm back. Last time, I promise, after that, you don't have to see my face again. Um, so this talk, as you can see from the title, is about the spatial footprints of storm searches, which we have analyzed here at the global scale. And it's very important to mention that the work that I'm presenting was actually done by Alex, who is a PhD student at IMIDEA in, in Spain with Marta Marcos, and she came visiting us at UCF for a couple of weeks last year. That's when we started doing 
doing this work. And she would have liked to present it herself, but she's very busy um, wrapping up her thesis, so you're stuck with me um, walking through some of the results that we have obtained so far. So what we are looking at here, and this is now the concurrent extreme session. First, I was a little bit hesitant whether or not this would fit into this workshop scheme. But what we are looking is at, we are looking at one extreme, one type of extreme event, storm surges. And we are looking at correlation in the way that we are assessing spatial um, footprints of these storm surges. So that makes it actually suitable um, for this session. And to begin with, I want to go very quickly through some of these types of um, images that we typically see, um, especially in the States, um, when a hurricane or a tropical cyclone is approaching. This is an example um, of Hurricane Harvey. Hurricane Harvey in itself was an interesting event from a compound flooding perspective because of uh, storm surge and precipitation interaction. But that's not what I'm focusing on here. I'm focusing on the spatial extent of just the surge component of this event. And you can see how we have a relatively large area with high surge potential. Um, Hurricane Michael um, affected the panhandle in the west coast of Florida. And you can see again high surge potential all the way from Pensacola down here to St. Petersburg. Matthew um, affected the Florida East Coast. Um, we have surge potential from Miami all the way up to the Carolinas. Um, so a very large portion of the US East Coast um, was affected by this hurricane in 2016, even though it didn't really make landfall. And then Florence, another interesting event from a compound flooding perspective. Again, precipitation and storm surge interaction but also another example where we have relatively high surge potential over a relatively long coastline stretch here from South to North Carolina. It's not just these tropical cyclones and hurricanes that affect large coastline stretches. In fact, extra tropical storms, um, nor'easters like the storm of the century here in the US in the 1990s, or storm Xaver in Europe in 2017, often affect even larger areas. In this case, we had storm surges here, Germany, Netherlands, um, Scandinavia, even the northwestern part of the UK. So this is an example where we have basically unconnected coastlines that were affected by the same storm event. So what we want to do is we want to analyze the spatial footprint of these storm surges using historical data. We start by using um, tight gauge observations from the Gessler 2 database, and you can see here the red dots, that's where the tight gauges are located. And we have the problem, very well known problem, of um, having a lot of data in the northern hemisphere, but almost no data in the southern hemisphere, especially when we are looking um, for relatively long records. So that's why we complement the analysis with some model hindcast data from the global tide and search reanalysis that I don't have to introduce anymore. Um, Philip um, spoke about that in, in great detail, and it has been discussed um, at the end of the session. So this is a reanalysis that provides 35 years of, of search data, search information, um, everywhere along the global coastline. And that provides a very good database in combination with our observations to perform this kind of analysis. We used three different methods um, to assess these spatial footprints. We started with a um, k-means algorithm to identify clusters, to identify coastline stretches that have experienced relatively often storm surges simultaneously in the past. So that's a way to more or less automatically create um, clusters that identify these coastline stretches that are often affected at the same time. And it also provides us information on reference locations using the centroids of these clusters. And I'll come back to that in a second. The second approach is what we call the match level. In this approach, what we do is we look at one reference location. We identify the thresholds, the threshold exceedances. And then we look for all the other locations and compare um, whether or not um, there was a threshold exceedance at the same time or very, very close to the time where the threshold was exceeded at the reference location. And the third approach is a copula analysis, again, back to copulas, um, that helps us to identify joint probabilities and come up with joint return periods. And we perform this analysis, as I said, um, for the storm surge component. So we are using search data after we remove the tidal influence from the observed or modeled water levels. In fact, the GTSR contains the search signal. 
and for the tide gauges we performed a harmonic analysis to remove the tidal influence and then we use a 95th percentile threshold and everything above that threshold we consider to be a surge and that is what we analyze here. This is just an example from a paper that Paula Camus published in, in 2011. Um, an example of um, k-means clustering, I don't want to go into detail here. It's an example of having a multivariate data set and in this case it turns out to have 16, um, 16 clusters that look like um, what we see here and importantly for each of these clusters we also get um, information on the centroid which is what we use here as our reference gauge. So we use different techniques to, to estimate how many clusters we would need and then um, we perform this k-means clustering and we store the information on which location, which tight gauge or which coastal grid point from the GTSR reanalysis is the centroid and that is what we consider to be our reference location. This is um, how it looks like for the U.S. East Coast, Gulf Coast, the Caribbean. Um, we can see here as larger circles, those are these centroids, these reference locations. And then the smaller color-filled dots show us which areas belong into the cluster that is represented by this circle. For example, here we have um, Florida, Carolinas. And this is an example. Here is a panhandle. Um, it's the same cluster as down here in Mexico. So that shows us that even though these two areas are not directly connected, they are often affected simultaneously by storm surges, which has to do with the tracks of the storms that cause these storm surges. Um, the second approach, the match level, um, as I said, we are using now these um, reference stations that we identified before, and we look for threshold exceedances, and then we match it with all the other locations, and if there's a threshold exceedance at one of the other locations within a three-day window, that's this independence criterion that we use that has been used by many other people in the past, then we consider it to be a match. And then we can estimate the percentage, for example, of, of coincident um, threshold exceedances between two different locations. Again, we can also um, infer similar maps as the one that I just showed. I'm not showing that here today, but if we, for each location, we have a certain number of match levels with all the reference locations, and if we assign each location to the reference station with which it has the highest match level, then we get a similar, a similar spatial picture to compare with um, the maps that we create through the k-means clustering. This is an, an example where our reference location is um, in the panhandle here in, in Florida. And um, then if we look at that, we see that it very much resembles um, the observed situation um, during Hurricane, Hurricane Michael. We have high match levels, not surprisingly, almost 100%, very close to the reference station. So it's very likely that a location that is only 10 or 20 kilometers away from a landfalling hurricane also experiences a storm surge, but we can also still see relatively high match levels of 50-60% all the way down here to Florida, west coast of Florida, and again up here in, in the Carolinas. Um, this is um, the example um, where we have a reference station here close to Jacksonville in, in northeast Florida, and again we can see how the match levels decline as we go further away, but we have very high match levels here, 50, 60 percent um, in the Caribbean, um, for example, in the, in the Bahamas. The last approach that we use, the copula analysis, in that case we, we use a set of bivariate copulas that allows us to estimate the joint probabilities, the joint return periods. We are focusing here on the AND case, so we are looking at the probabilities at two thresholds are exceeded um, at the same time. This is an example. We have Hook van Holland in the Netherlands and Coxhaven in Germany. And this is the result from this copula analysis. So we have the joint return periods from very low to very high. And again, we can show the results as maps, but and then we have to focus on certain events. So what I'm showing here is the joint return period for two 10-year storm surges being exceeded at two locations simultaneously. So what is the likelihood that we have a 10-year storm surge in New York and in Boston, for example? 
This is our reference location here, and again, we can see how it resembles this observed or actually um, individual event that occurred in, in, in the past. Um, and you can see here, if there is perfect dependence, which means we have a correlation close to one, then we would have a 10-year um, joint return period, which means whenever there is a 10-year surge exceedance at our reference location, there's almost always a 10-year surge exceedance relatively close to that area. If the two locations are completely independent, then we would have a joint return period of 100 years. We have a cutoff here at 70 years because then we get very close to this independence assumption. And you can see that for relatively long coastline stretches, large areas, we have joint return periods that are much lower than what we would expect if we assume that storm surges at these locations are independent. This is just another example. It's hard to see this red dot here. That is, um, I zoom in. This is the northeastern US. Actually, now we put um, the, the reference station here to Manhattan, where we are located. And um, we look at the joint return periods with, with all these locations. And you can see that we have relatively low joint return periods, which means we have a relatively high likelihood that storm surges, 10-year storm surge events, occur simultaneously all the way south here to Delaware Bay and all the way up um, to northern Maine, the, the, Canadian, the Canadian border. Um, finally, and I don't want to go into details here, we, we did some kind of, of, of validation. We compared the results from using different methods, and we found that in especially the match level and k-means approaches lead to very similar results, 80 to 90 percent overlap in how the gauges are assigned or the locations are assigned to the reference locations. Um, the copula analysis, a little bit less, 70 percent. But more importantly, we can show that when we compare Gessler to the observations and GTSR, when we just use GTSR at the observation locations, there is 80% overlap, which tells us that GTSR is very well capable of capturing these, these spatial footprints. Just some um, very quick conclusions. Um, first of all, and that's something we expected to find, spatial correlation um, stretches over relatively long distances, sometimes even across unconnected coastlines. With that approach, we can identify representative search time series that we can then use as proxy. We can analyze that in more detail and assume that the results are applicable for other areas within the same cluster. Um, we found that the GTSR reanalysis captures these spatial footprints relatively well. That is a type of validation that we typically do not do with our storm search models. Usually we have one location, we look at the observed time series, compare it with the model time series, and see if the model is capable of getting the timing and magnitude of the search. But we very rarely, at least as far as I'm aware, look at whether or not um, these models, especially when they are broad scale models, um, also capture the spatial extent of the search. Now why is that important? Um, we believe that um, if we continue working on this, um, the results can become very relevant for spatial planning critical infrastructure operations, for example, looking at what is the likelihood that two airports are affected at the same time, what is the likelihood that two ports have to be shut down at the same time, multiple military installations may be affected and shut down, limiting the response um, opportunities, um, or multiple power grid elements are affected at the same time. So we can overlay what we find here with, with infrastructure networks and, and see what the impacts are, and hopefully that can help us in emergency preparedness and, again, spatial planning, making sure that we do not put um, very important infrastructure elements in two or three locations that have often been affected by storm surges in the past. And, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm sure there are questions. Uh, the interesting analysis in extending this uh, bi-rate analysis into the spatial dimension. Have you thought about actually using a single spatial model, like using a, um, you know, there are these spatial extreme models that you, you could actually model the whole dependence in a single uh, model, which would maybe be a bit more, more easily interpretable? Yeah, we actually discussed that, but none of us has ever done anything like that. Um, but we knew very much 
how to apply this initial copula, mix of bivariate copulas. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something um, to look into. Okay. And I'm sure we will as soon as we learn more about it. <clears throat> so um, maybe two comments about interesting ways to extend the analysis, maybe. One, you know, at a very different time scale, is sea level rise already starting in some regions, maybe, to, to change these statistics? Maybe not in the big hurricane surge areas, but maybe in some of the places where there's, there's less, of a, less of a tail. And I guess the other comment uh, could be interesting to not just look at sing, single events, but maybe places where across a season, for example, there could be correlation between an above normal sea level rise, sea, above normal sea level season, and maybe higher than normal storminess, sort of like the Chris Little um, paper from a few, a few years ago. So it would basically widen the storm window. Instead of just looking in a three-day window, we would look at um, a season or a month right. or a couple of months. Yeah, that's, some of that is part of the project, again, that Ivan mentioned. We will also bring in other variables like waves um, into this analysis. So we look at the spatial extent, but also at multiple drivers. Um, so that will be a mixture of, of different types of models that we have um, discussed here today. But yeah, the sea level component is very interesting. And we have a NASA project that hopefully allows us to reconstruct storm surges much further back. And then we have, um, I think, a better data base to see if sea level rise signals are already showing up in the spatial, the spatial extent. Thank you. There was another question in the very back. Okay. One last question over here. You still need to wait. So if you had to ballpark a guess, is New York City on a 10 or a 20 year cycle to take the next hit? No, I'm not taking a guess on that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. Both, yes. Thank you very much. And we will now move on to the second presentation given by Martha Vogel from ETH Zurich on the concurrent hot extremes across the Northern Hemisphere in 2018. And uh, Martha, the floor is, is yours. Good afternoon or good evening uh, from my side. I'm uh, very happy to attend this uh, meeting remotely. So. Today, um, I will present work I have done with Jakob and Richard, Dick D and Sonja Seniviratne. And uh, I will share my main insights on the concurrent 2018 hot extremes across the Northern Hemisphere due to human-induced climate change. And I'm sure that most of you can uh, remember uh, last year's very hot spring and summer, which was associated with very hot and record-breaking temperatures across the Northern Hemisphere but also with uh, really uh, strong impacts. So uh, this picture should illustrate some of the impacts which were reported in 2018. So firstly here you can see um, wildfire in Sweden, uh, which was destroying large amounts of forest. Here on this picture you can see crop loss in the United Kingdom. So uh, there was really um, heat also affected crop yields in many regions. Yeah, this picture should illustrate there was even um, power shortage and also cut of power production on one hand side because of the lack of cooling water for coal-fired power plants or nuclear power plants, but also on the other hand due to the overuse of air conditioning. And here this picture also should illustrate that people were actually directly affected by extreme heat. So here you can see a person in Japan cooling his face and also lots of um, heat deaths were reported because of heat strokes. So it is really clear that in 2018, there were strong impacts reported in spring and summer. And this really motivated us um, to have a closer look on the 2018 event. And the first question we were asking was where actually and what heat related impacts were reported in 2018. And in order to answer this question, we were collecting media articles on reported heat-related impacts. 
And this figure shows uh, the synthesis of uh, our um, analyzed and you categorized uh, heat related impacts into five categories. And we found impacts in at least 18 countries across the whole northern hemisphere. Firstly, here you can see uh, heat strokes, heat death, and heat warnings, which occurred in the US and Canada, but also in Europe and even in, in Asia, like South Korea and Japan. Then there were strong fires in places in 2018, which were also occurring in uh, British Columbia, but um, mainly also in Scandinavia, which we have seen a picture from, but also in Southern um, Europe and uh, until uh, Japan and Korea. Furthermore, there was like agricultural damages, which were reported mainly in Central Europe, but also in Russia. And then there was also damages to infrastructure, meaning buckling of the train tracks or of the roads or melting of buildings, which was occurring in the Netherlands, for example, or also in the United Kingdom. And as I said before, there was power production reduction or shortage also in many countries across the Northern Hemisphere. And what was really remarkable that these um, impacts were reported concurrently in 2018 across multiple regions in the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, these strong impacts then uh, motivated us to have a look actually um, on the climate related um, in 2018. And we were asking then which area was concurrently affected by hot extremes in 2018, because we saw strong impacts in multiple regions. And in order to determine this area which was affected concurrently, we had to define the extreme temperatures. So we looked at hot days, and these are temperatures exceeding the 90th percentile of a reference period climatology. And we used 1958 to 1988 because we could use observation-based data from era 40 and era interim and merge product, and it started in 1958. So we used 1958 to 1988 as a reference climatology, and then we computed hot days in the northern hemisphere. And this can be seen here on this um, figure. So we have a map of the whole northern hemisphere, and we see that there are large areas in reddish color, so a large number of hot days between May and July in many regions. And now um, I highlight only uh, areas which are densely populated and key agricultural regions in the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, these areas are strongly exposed to extreme heat. So we now focus on this um, region, which we call NH egg pop area. And what we can see here also is again that multiple regions experienced uh, until two months uh, of hot days in um, 2018, between May and July. So um, there's multiple regions in this um, exposed uh, region which experience hot days simultaneously. And when we now um, want to focus on the area, we compute the area fraction over this study region. And this plot shows then a time series, um, uh, annual time series, and the uh, purple line is indicating the year 2018. And uh, gray lines show the reference period climatology from 1958 to 1988. And it's shown the area fraction of concurrent hot days in this study region. And what we can see is that um, 2018, the area was much larger and it was an average uh, two times as large as in the reference period. So we have a large daily area which is under concurrent heat in 2018. And in the next step, we focus now on the area between May and July, where the peak area was around uh, more than 77% of the study region. And we, we uh, compute the average over my, this period. And we now show a time series showing average between May and July for every year from 1958 to 2018. And so this is again this area fraction of concurrent hot days in our study region. And what we can see here is that there's a strong increase in recent years. And 2018, there was on average 22% um, of this region under um, concurrent hot days. And uh, if you're looking at uh, 2010 and 2012, this was a bit less, but it's also a large area of, of around 20%. So um, if you focus on this uh, time frame between May and July, we find that actually for 2018, like record-breaking area, so it was never observed before, 
that such a large area is under concurrent for taste between May and July in this region. And if you are looking now, for example, on this area which was affected between May and August, then we see that 2010 was even a bit larger than 2018, and it was a, um, again around 23%, um, this around 22 And if you're looking at the area between May and September, then we see 2010 and 2018 are more the same of, uh, of around 21%. So uh, it's depending a bit on the time period, how large this area is, but it was uh, around uh, 22%. And what is clear is that these large events are actually unprecedented prior to 2010. So before, never had areas which were above this 20%. And uh, this large area, which was concurrently affected by these sort of extremes, then led to our next question. So if we can really then attribute such large areas to human-induced climate change. And uh, therefore, we um, built on this attribution framework, which also Mike Wiener was mentioning before. So we compute the probabilities of exceeding area thresholds without climate change, and this is our P0. And you see this here now on the x-axis, we have these different area thresholds, and on the y-axis, we have the probability of this area to be exceeded. And in order to compute these probabilities, we use 29 model simulations from the CMAP5 ensemble and um, from a historical time period from 1958 to 1988, where we expect that the climate change signal was small. And um, we focus on the 2018 area with an um, area threshold of around 22%. And now you can see the distribution of these probabilities for the 29 model simulations and for the um, observed um, and the observed distribution. And what we can see is that actually the models capture quite well um, the observed probability. But on the other hand, we can also see that the area from 22% from 2018 was never um, exceeded in this um, 29 model simulations for this historical period. So building from this, we can conclude that such a 2018 Northern Hemisphere concurrent heat events could not have occurred without human-induced climate change, because this probability is zero. Coming from this, then the question would be, how will this then change in the future? So how are areas concurrently affected by hot extremes are projected to change in the future? And therefore, now we compute probabilities of exceeding different area thresholds with climate change. So we, again, we show the different area thresholds on the x-axis and the probability this time in the case with climate change on the y-axis. And with climate change means we use again this 29 model simulation from the CMA5 ensemble, but this time we use, uh, use a business as usual RCP 8.5 high emission scenario. And um, now I show again the distribution um, for different warming levels. And you can see now this uh, distribution for under one degree warming and um, we can see that from time to time, this 2018 um, threshold is exceeded. So it's, it's not so likely, but it's not uh, unexceptional. And if you are increasing now and going to a warming level of 1.5 degree, we can see that it's getting more likely that a 2018 event will occur, but also the areas which are exceeded um, are increasing. And this is even more so if you're going now to a two degree warming world, we can see that the areas, the probabilities for larger area, areas increases and also for 2018. And now this, I will focus on the 2018 um, area threshold and show the distributions for the 29 model simulations. And we can see here, this is the distribution for one degree warming. And the multimodal median shows around 16%. So that means that a 2018-like area would occur on average one out of six years. So it's not very likely, but it's not unexceptional. If we are going now to a 1.5 degree warming world, we find that this uh, distribution has much larger spread, but also the multimodal median increases to nearly 66%. Um, so that means a 2018-like area would occur nearly two out of three years for 1.5 degree warming world. And if you're now um, showing the distribution for two degree warming, you can see that on average, 
a 2018-like event would occur nearly every year. We really have this um, strong increase of the probabilities for 2018-like areas um, with global warming. And uh, with this, I will summarize my results. So firstly, we find that we have really reported heat-related impacts across multiple regions in the Northern Hemisphere in 2018. Secondly, we find that we have 22% of the study area which was currently experiencing hot extremes between May and July, focusing on this period as a new record. And thirdly, we can say that actually this 2018 concurrent hot extremes in this NHA egg crop area could not have occurred without human-induced climate change possibly constitutes one of the first events which can be attributed to human induced climate change on land. And uh, lastly, we, we find that this observed 2018-like area is well simulated and modeled and projected to occur nearly every year for two degree global warming. And yeah, with this, I thank you and I'm open for questions now. Very much. I'm sure there are questions. Yes, there is one in the very in the back. Closer. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is Michael Weiner from Berkeley. Um, I appreciate very much that you've shown that the influence of climate change here is very large, but you made a statement that the event of 2018 could not have happened in the absence of climate change. And I, I would take issue with that because the CMIP-5 um, ensemble is horribly undersampled. And so even though this event didn't occur in any of those uh, simulations, that does not mean that the underlying probability is actually zero. And so what I would suggest before making such a statement is to verify that um, the probability of this event in some co by some by by uh, quantifying some confidence interval, um, is um, you know below some critical threshold. Tails on these things tend to be somewhat long, and so um, uh, I would caution against that particular statement. But your other statements are quite uh, compelling, quite frankly. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, we based our um, findings on these uh, twenty-nine five model simulations and. We also changed the time periods to, uh, to check for sensitivity due to the um, time period and also if you use like pre-industrial time period and it's still like virtually certain that this was not simulated in the SIMA 5 model and so on. Okay. Um, more questions? Yes. Okay. Um, thanks for the nice talk. Are there ways in which you think the fact that you had this very broad area that was impacted by heat stress, kind of the effects of different areas non-linearly added in the impact space? Have you thought about that at all? I realize that's a little bit outside of what you discussed in this presentation, but. Uh, I didn't hear the question acoustically, could you? Oh. Just say it again. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if you've thought about whether the um, the impacts of each region that were affected kind of non-linearly added. So having all these regions affected by heat stress at once created impacts that were greater than the sum of the parts. Yeah, I mean, um, we really focused here on the reported impacts, but of course, this is maybe um, like from one uh, conclusion from the outlook that it can be really um, that uh, can be really strong impacts if, for example, many crop regions are affected simultaneously by extreme heat and we have crop failure in many regions at the same time. That then this can also affect food prices and or food trade. Or on the other hand, we have seen uh, last year that there was lots of regions which were concurrently affected by fires and then. Some countries ask for emergency state and assistance for fire um, to fight the fires. And then if many regions would ask for this uh, emergency at the same um, time, then at some point we would be also limited by infrastructure. So I think there's uh, lots of potential audits um, that there were 
nonlinear impacts. But we didn't really study this, but I think this is really a one point of our conclusions that this can be highly relevant if you have large areas that are concurrently affected by extreme events. Thank you very much. I think we need to move on. And I would like to introduce okay, our... Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. And I would like to introduce our next speaker, who is also an invited speaker, Kai Kornhuber from the University of Oxford, now just transferring to Colombia, and he will talk about Rossby Wave and simultaneous weather extremes. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, so first of all, thanks a lot to, to Colin and uh, Radley to, uh, for putting this together. It has been really an excellent day so far. And uh, yeah, I will talk about uh, recurrent Rossby waves and simultaneous weather extremes, which is somewhat um, yeah, relevant for this topic of recurrence and concurrence. It's um, kind of a cross-cutting uh, talk in that way. And uh, this is work that I did with colleagues in, in Oxford and uh, at PIK in uh, Potsdam, together with uh, uh, Dim Kama, who's here also today, and we'll have a talk tomorrow. Um, so I put up this uh, quote from Ed Lawrence because I think it's a very beautiful way to talk about atmospheric teleconnections, and it also gives kind of the motivation for, for my talk in kind of finding out uh, to what extent that is uh, maybe also true for extreme weather events, so this, this hemispheric uh, perspective on the circulation. Um, oh yeah, like this? All right, All right. That's, that's good. All right. Um, so uh, Marta just talked about uh, 2018 and, and these concurrent uh, weather extremes, and I will uh, provide a bit of an atmosphere dynamics perspective on that summer and more uh, sp uh, specifically on a very uh, uh, specific period of that summer that is um, yeah, mid-June, uh, uh, mid-July. And uh, yeah, we can play a little game uh, now together when I start this uh, simulation or the, the, this um, uh, yeah, little movie about the meridional winds, which I uh, want to call like Spot the Rossby Wave. And um, I'll just run this. So this is the meridional winds uh, in the upper troposphere. And um, you'll see that there's a lot of chaos going on. It's fairly unordered. Uh, and then kind of uh, end of June, you see this uh, pattern emerging there over a large part of the northern hemisphere, specifically over uh, Europe and uh, Eurasia. And um, now, coming back to the weather extremes that happened during that summer, um, there were many of those. We just heard the, the impact and the uh, influence of anthropogenic climate change on them. And this is like the, the absolute temperature here, but if you look at the temperature anomalies, you'll see that the temperatures uh, occurred in very specific regions, and that those regions uh, fit very well um, uh, those meridional wind patterns that form kind of a wave-like uh, structure in the, in the jet, right? And this is something um, that is called a Rossby wave, and uh, I'll just quickly go through um, yeah, the theoretical background, or basically the methodolo uh, methodology, how we quantify those Rossby waves. And um, in our approach, those are um, based on, on meanders and the upper tropospheric circulation and they are characterized by their zonal wave number and phase speed. So um, the, the wave number basically gives you the number of uh, ridges and troughs that form around the, the whole hemisphere. And the phase gives you uh, an idea of where those ridges and troughs are um, situate. And uh, we uh, put uh, in place a few assumptions. So we, we look at the upper troposphere, that's at 300 millibar. Um, we assume them to be strictly zonally elongated, so in parallel to the longitudes. And um, they are also horizontal, so that's not uh, like a vertical movement. Uh, and uh, we apply this filter of uh, seven-day mean, 
Um, so we look at the quasi-stationary or slow-moving component of the circulation. And this whole analysis is based on summer. Um, so um, I'm particularly interested in uh, heat extremes. Um, so this is the, the meridional wind. Uh, and this is the situation from the 2010 heat wave. You see also quite a well-ordered pattern here. And uh, it's basically moving up and down. Um, and this can be then quantified by just um, applying a mean on the meridional wind field, so over pretty much all this uh, meridional uh, uh, belt that, that we see here. So here are the continental coastlines. You see Europe there and the US there. It's a bit uh, yeah, light, but, but I hope you can kind of refer to that. This is basically the whole hemisphere here, right? So if we have uh, made this average, we, we get this uh, wavy pattern here. And this we can then decompose into the basic components and get uh, yeah, an amplitude and a phase, so basically every wave number there is. So in this situation, the wave 6 was uh, anomalously high. And um, yeah, uh, that is um, basically then quantified as a wave 6 event. Um, I will first focus on uh, the question of uh, if there are like preferred uh, places where these waves kind of originate and, and position themselves. And for this, we have to look at the phase position. And um, we can uh, then analyze this by doing uh, probability density functions of uh, uh, those waves and compare situations where the wave uh, is normal versus those situations where the wave is amplified. And this we um, determine by this threshold based on the statistics of the amplitude. And um, so the red lines refer to uh, the probability density functions during amplified waves, and the black ones are somewhat the climatological position, like the normal. And um, if you look at this, um, there's something that kind of uh, uh, it comes up. There are two waves that, that have this very um, confined phase position here. It's a one peak. It's pr uh, fairly narrow. And there are these other two waves, wave six, wave, wave eight, which are way more broad in their distribution. And uh, those wave five and wave seven um, then uh, show very interesting patterns when we do uh, yeah, just a very blunt composite of all these weeks where those waves are of high amplitude. So this is really a mean of, of 40 weeks. And uh, this is the pattern that then emerges. And it's a very uh, confined pattern. And if you count, there are uh, five troughs or ridges here. Um, so you have to follow a bit the higher latitudes here. And uh, five uh, and seven troughs and ridges in the, in the case of wave seven. So the temperature anomalies uh, that are associated with these patterns, they basically follow this uh, ridge and trough pattern. So if you have like a ridge here, there's usually a, uh, a hot uh, situation on the surface. So this is the temperature anomalies that, that we see when these events occur. And uh, if we have a, a trough, then it uh, gets colder than, than uh, normal. And uh, yeah, interestingly, those, those patterns look really similar over the US, or fairly similar, uh, but really differ in phase over the Atlantic and uh, European uh, sector. And uh, yeah, the same, uh, not as uh, robust, but also a few significant spots here uh, holds for precipitation. So we have uh, a dry um, east coast and uh, rain in Europe during a wave five pattern and a wet um, east coast and very dry Europe and wet uh, Balkans during a wave seven pattern. And um, yeah, if you remember that uh, first temperature anomaly that I showed initially, um, it looks really similar uh, to that composite. And uh, that is not a coincidence, um, I would argue, uh, as we um, can characterize that uh, heat extreme in 2018 also as a wave seven pattern. So these conditions also hold there. And uh, 
In fact, these temperature anomalies uh, occurred basically where this composite would have uh, assumed them to, uh, um, to occur. And also, um, in agreement with that, we had uh, a flood event over Greece and the Balkans during the same time, and uh, also over Japan. So uh, we would argue that this was basically uh, the product of that very um, confined pattern that was visible during this uh, uh, two weeks period uh, in June, July. Interestingly, that was not the only extreme year that followed that pattern. There are a few um, yeah, years in there that, that are probably well known amongst most of you. So yeah, 2003 is, uh, as one of those years uh, that, that is also characterized by a wave seven pattern, uh, 2006 and 2012 and 2015 as well. And uh, if you remember Marta's talk, um, the three um, the three years that she mentioned uh, alongside 2018 are basically all in here as well, except for 2010, which we would characterize as rather wave five, wave six. Uh, event um, uh, according to the pattern. Um, so in the next part I will talk about um, yeah, the quantification of, of uh, simultaneous and coinciding heat waves because from that composite we don't know yet if those heat extremes really occur at the same time or if this is just a product of, of doing an average. And uh, this is important of course because all these regions are major bread baskets and, and we heard that before uh, during these talks today that um, yeah, concurrent bread baskets failure are a problem, right? So um, the way we analyze this is uh, fairly simple. It's, it's a method uh, that, that was uh, developed earlier by, by Donges and in Schleusner in uh, a couple of publications and uh, it is called coincidence analysis which basically just counts coinciding events in two time series and then gives you uh, a ratio based on the number of coinciding events and the number of total events in that time series. So th in this case, this would be uh, a co coincidence rate of um, 0 0.5 because we have six events and of those three uh, coincide with uh, events in the other time series. Um, the regions that we will look at are those that we identify as uh, those that have significantly uh, elevated temperatures during these uh, wave seven events. And um, yeah, we reduce that analysis to uh, those anomalies that occurred over land uh, areas. Um, the heat events, um, we, we rank by severity, by um, the spatial coverage in each of those regions and um, by the uh, magnitude of temperature anomaly based on their statistics. So this is uh, uh, based on their uh, standard deviation. And then we condition those heat events um, by um, wave events. So we compare those uh, heat events that occur du during a wave seven event um, and those that occur um, without a wave seven event. And uh, this we can then kind of illustrate in a type of heat map. So the spatial coverage here is on the y-axis and the temperature normally on the x-axis. So the further um, up we go to the uh, left corner, um, the more severe the heat extremes get, right? And uh, this is an example showing um, basically the coincidence of heat extremes in um, Central uh, North America and Western Europe during um, wave seven events. These white dots um, indicate uh, statistical significance and the color uh, refers to the coincidence rate. So dark red means basically all of the events coincide and uh, orange half of the events coincide and so on. So there's um, quite a lot of coincidence happening there. And then we can compare it, of course, to other events um, when uh, no wave seven is present. And 
that basically shows um, uh, yeah, far lower values. And uh, that difference uh, is basically the, the key message here. So um, when we don't have that wave pattern present, the um, co coincidence of heat extremes is just far lower um, in general. And this, of course, we can do with all these regions and do kind of um, yeah, iteratively the same analysis, and it's kind of a general signal um, with like regionally uh, a few differences. So the, the um, yeah, amount of, of coupled heat extremes is apparently lower in those two regions, but that might also be because this is just a really big region. Um, so um, that, that might probably play into this, uh, this measure here. Um, so about the observed changes of, this, uh, of these situations, so this is now focusing on wave seven events. Um, it is not so easy to give a clear answer here. Um, we see an increase in currents, but those um, uh, trends are non-significant when we just uh, focus on the amplitude alone. Um, when we include the phase position, uh, we see uh, clearer trends, um, but also not for all um, amplitude thresholds. So in order to get a proper statistics, so um, yeah, a sufficient number of events to analyze, we have to lower the, the amplitude threshold to, to, to the average, basically. Then we see a significant trend, but um, yeah, it is important to note that this is a fairly short time series, and uh, there are like multi-decadal um, uh, you know, variations happening in the Earth system, of course. So they might play into that, and yeah, I, w I would say model studies will be necessary to to shed light on the anthropogenic influence. And Dim will talk about that a bit more uh, in his talk tomorrow. Um, so the key points. Um, we identify these two recurrent uh, Rossby waves, uh, wave patterns in, in the summer. It's a wave five and a wave seven pattern. I mostly discussed the wave seven pattern, uh, but wave five pattern is uh, behaving in a very similar way. Um, we uh, saw this pattern in uh, several um, prominent uh, extreme summers over the last decade, and uh, the last one was 2018. Um, and these hotspots are all situated in, in breadbasket re regions, which makes this whole thing quite relevant. Um, so uh, they favor these uh, simultaneous heat extremes. And there was a recent increase in frequency, but we uh, need to look into this a bit further and identify the re relevant drivers for this. Um, just a few com comments. Uh, the, the knowledge about such teleconnection patterns, of course, is very important for predictability, and predictability is extremely bad, specifically in, in Europe. Um, so maybe this, uh, in, in, uh, yeah, after a bit more research, will help us to um, install some type of early warning warn, uh, uh, system for uh, extreme heat events. And um, with this, I don't mean that this is kind of an alternative to, to blocking indices. This is just a comment because this extreme summer 2018 was basically not captured by those blocking indices that focus on pressure inversion. Um, this is just a situation that, that is not really linked to extreme heat events in summer. It is rather a slow-moving ridge. And um, in another analysis that I haven't shown here, um, we see that the the four most extreme heat events are basically all uh, linked to this wave seven pattern. So um, there's some um, reason to, to follow up on this and, and discuss this also in this uh, blocking indice um, discourse. Um, there's a proposed mechanism that, that can lead to these amplified waves, and I have not discussed this in this talk. Uh, it's planetary wave resonance. Um, I, put, I will put some uh, literature here uh, that, that uh, is, is relevant in that uh, perspective, and uh, I'm happy to talk about this um, yeah, later or tomorrow in, in the breaks. Um, and finally, there is uh, um, this 
uh, session at the AGU that we proposed um, uh, together with uh, Colin, Radlin, and Jakob. Um, and uh, yeah, I just felt that this might be a good uh, place to promote this and uh, hope that many of you will submit interesting abstracts to that. And uh, yeah, with this, I, I will yeah, stop talking and hope for good questions. Thank you very much. We have time for one quick question. Yes. So is there any connection here to uh, the circum hemispheric uh, teleconnection pattern that Brent Stutter was talking about uh, quite a while ago? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, that is uh, rele relevant for the wave five pattern. Uh, he analyzed the winter circulation. Um, well, he discussed, well, in his, in his first paper, paper 2002, he was uh, analyzing winter circulation. And, uh, but yeah, of course, this is exactly the same type of, of mechanism, only that he doesn't discuss this wave seven pattern. Due to time constraints, we have to move on, but there will be time in the end of this session for more discussion. It's a pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Carly Toser from CSIRO, and she will talk about Southern Hemisphere, global scale wave trains, and compound and concurrent weather extremes in Tasmania. Thank you very much. Sorry for the uh, epic title. Um, so perhaps just a little introduction. Um, I'm part of the Decadal Climate Forecasting Project um, at CSIRO. Um, our group is primarily based in Hobart, Tasmania, um, and we're charged with developing a multi-year to decadal climate prediction system, uh, which we've called the Climate Analysis Forecast Ensemble System. If you'd like to know a bit more about our project, please see the link. Um, so there's various components to our uh, project. Um, obviously, one is the model development side of things. Um, but we're also interested in processes and understanding processes associated with climate variability, in particular in Australia. And so my particular interests um, are understanding the atmospheric processes associated with extremes at varying timescales in Australia. Uh, so to start with, um, I'll, have a, I'll talk a bit about the focus region, why I'm looking at Tasmania. It's not just because we're based there and we're not purely parochial. Um, it's actually because uh, Tasmania is home to Australia's largest water manager, or sort of one of the reasons is that it's home to uh, the largest water manager, Hydro Tasmania. And Hydro Tas is Australia's largest generator of renewable energy, primarily through hydropower. Um, and we know that water resources, it's a very climate sensitive sector. Um, so we are interested in, in understanding um, w what leads to extreme weather and climate in the region. So a bit more about Tasmania. Um, there's quite a, a stark sort of climate uh, um, regime change from west to east. So Western, if I get this right, Western Tasmania see is very wet relative to east. We've got topography running sort of through the centre of the state, um, and I guess fortunately, um, all the the hydro tas. Tasmania catchments, so hydropower catchments are located in western Tasmania. Um, and just identifying Tasmania in relation to the rest of the southern hemisphere, um, just identified it there in the black box. Um, and the rest of this plot shows, it's very colourful, it shows Rosby wave number, which, uh, or, or KS, uh, and that's di a diagnostic used to identify regions where Rosby wave packets, Rosby wave trains propagate. And I feel fortunate to follow Kai because I don't have to talk too much about <laughs> what these uh, wave trains are all about. And so the colours represent um, a sort of wave number. And so what I guess I wanted to highlight here was, um, we call this here, this is the polar jet and it's a polar jet wave guide because uh, Rosby wave uh, trains propagate um, in this in this channel, um, and they're sort of wave three to four, no, wave number three to four. 
Okay, so moving on to the actual extremes. Um, so I wanted to focus on both wet and dry multi-day extreme events in Western Tasmania. And I have a focus location, Queenstown, um, just, just in a picture there. Um, so my first step was to identify the extreme events. Um, so dry events, um, this was a persistence threshold rather than magnitude. We know you, you can't sort of get um, less than no rain. So um, we wanted to look at, we had a persistence criteria. Um, and so we picked events where they had at least six days in a ray of no rainfall. I mean, most events were longer than that. Um, on the wet side of things, we had a, a magnitude based criteria. Um, and so we first identified a list of events based on consecutive rain days and then refined that uh, events list based on just sort of picked the events that were at the tail so that had really high um, event rainfall. And I, um, my, I had a paper published late last year and that's got sort of more explanation about the definitions. Um, so if you're interested, please see that. And so I'll just uh, point you to this plot here, this perhaps gives a bit more um, motivation as to why we're focusing on multi-day extremes. Um, I've plotted here um, the number of extreme wet event days as defined by uh, the defi using the definition I presented earlier, um, plotted against total annual rainfall at uh, Queenstown. As you can see, there's a strong relationship. Um, so, you know, the more wet, extreme wet days we have, the higher, annual the, higher the annual rainfall. Uh, so these um, extreme, multi-day extreme events um, contribute significantly to seasonal, to annual anomalies. So they really impact the longer term. Uh, so that's sort of further um, motivation for us to look at this time scale. Okay, so we've identified the extremes. Now we want to look around, look about, look at the uh, processes associated with them. So I'm looking at the atmospheric flow. And what I've done is produced composites um, of the flow around these events. Um, and the idea is to, I've, I've got a sample of events, um, I pull out the, um, the flow and then average that. And, and if there is like a coherent signal that is associated with each of these events, we expect it to come out in this, this mean or the, in the, the composite. Um, in this case, I've used um, geopotential height anomalies at 500 hectopascals to represent my circulation. And we're using the JRA, uh, JRA 55 analysis uh, over the period 58 to 2016. Okay, so I'm going to go through some of my composites now. Um, and just to orientate you, so I'm going to look at wet events to start with. Um, so what we did was define the beginning of the event as day zero. We looked 10 days prior and 10 days after. So we could look at the life cycle of the event. So the onset, the event, and then the decay. Um, and so this uh, number is, so day minus 10, so 10 days before the start of the event. This is my sample size, so I had 174 wet events over uh, that 60 year period, so I, I guess it's about three per year. Um, and ooh, the actual continents are very faint on this, but um, we've got Australia here. Um, and I've got my contour lines represent these geopotential height anomalies. Uh, the dash contours represent uh, negative anomalies, so low pressure systems. The solid contours represent positive anomalies, so high pressure systems. So I'll just step through now and we'll see what happens. Um, sorry, I should just say, because we're sort of far enough out of the event, we don't expect too much to be happening, um, which, which is the case. Um, so there's not too much order or coherency to these anomalies. We're at day minus nine now. So a lot of movement. Okay, day minus five. So this is five days before the event. Looks like something might be happening in the uh, Indian Ocean. Day minus four. So there's definitely some organisation occurring. Uh, day minus two. So we can definitely say we're, we're looking at a, a Rosby wave train here. We've got these alternating uh, high and low pressure systems. Um, so day minus one, day zero. And so if we can't see, so Tasmania's sitting sitting under here. So it's sitting under uh, a trough, so a, a low pressure system. So we'll be getting rain. Um, so we'll just keep travelling a bit further through. So day one, so this is the event now. Um, and this sort of, we're getting this, I guess, really this uh, amplification of, of these anomalies. Um, so some points to make is that this wave is, wave train is propagating in the polar jet, as I mentioned. Um, polar jet waveguide. 
uh, these are, they're, they're large anomalies and the, the wave train is sort of almost hemispheric wide, so I, I guess we could call it circumglobal. Um, so it's large scale. And um, I guess the key with these wave trains is that they um, are creating sort of meridional flow. So, so we're getting an extreme event because of this meridional flow. Uh, so day three, and you can see that they're persisting a long time. And this, this block is, uh, I guess, holding this trough in place, just holding it over Tasmania. Um, and day five, I should say that these wet events had a median length of about 10 days. And so this block, again, is, is really important. We see we are getting some propagation now that the event is getting on a bit um, and sort of this wave train is propagating into the Pacific Ocean. Okay, so moving on to dry events now. I've just started at day minus five, just to, to cut it off a bit. Um, and we're just moving through. And again, we're getting the same sort of structure, but obviously we're getting kind of like an, an opposite. So it's like an opposite phase. Um, we've now got, so at day zero, we've got a high pressure system sitting over Tasmania, so it's bringing stable, dry conditions to the region. But again, we're getting, it's a large scale um, structure, very um, broad. And these events, uh, I think, were at least about a, a median event length of about seven days. So we've got persistence, large scale, and then we're shifting off, uh, propagating into the Pacific Ocean again. So what can we say so far? Um, summary thus far is that wet and dry multi-day extremes in Western Tasmania are associated with coherent, persistent, large-scale wave train structures uh, propagating in the polar jet waveguide. Okay, so this is all well and good. This is for Tasmania. I haven't actually covered anything about compound or concurrent or the beyond Tasmania part of my uh, long title. Um, so I guess the keys that I wanted to point out was these wave trains were persistent and large scale. So we've got persistent anomalies occurring over Tasmania. Um, they're large scale, so they extend well beyond Tasmania, and we're, so we're getting persistent anomalies uh, to, to regions remote from Tasmania. Um, so we're likely then to be getting extremes in these other in other locations in the southern hemisphere um, at the same time or or with some lag um, relative to wet extremes or dry extremes in Tasmania. So I wanted to explore this a bit more. Um, so just remember that I identified these extremes based on rainfall, um, and so these wave trains are associated with rainfall extremes. But what I had a look at was, well, what's the temperature doing at, at the same time? So I pulled out the surface temperature anomalies um, and so created composites, again, for my, for my events. And then I wanted to put those anomalies into some context. Were they actually extreme? So I did sort of some ra random sampling, produced some random composites, and then looked at where my extreme, wet extreme temperature anomalies <laughs> sit in, in that sort of sample. Um, so what I've done here, I'm just showing the dry events. Um, I've got, again, my um, geopotential height anomalies, the contours, but this time I've overlaid the uh, temperature anomalies, and so my red is showing uh, high temperature, so I think it's the 99th percentile uh, temperature anomalies, and the blue is the sort of very negative temperature anomalies, so the, the first percentile. So what we'll do is step through again. So this wave train structure is developing again. We've seen this. And obviously what you'll see now is we're getting this similar sort of pattern in the temperature. So as we, we travel along here, we're getting uh, as this block or sort of high pressure system sits over Tasmania, we're also getting um, very high uh, temperature anomalies. And conversely, associated with these low pressure systems, we're getting um, um, negative temperature anomalies. And so I guess our idea is that, well, we're likely to be getting this compound extreme event in Tasmania. These uh, sort of, in this case, dry events are associated with high temperatures. Um, but broader than that, um, we're getting um, temperature anomalies at regions outside of Tasmania. And this type of pattern was similar um, in the wet extremes as well. So we're just moving through now. Okay, I'm at the end. Um, so rainfall extremes, just to summarize, 
everything. Rainfall extremes in Western Tasmania are associated with large-scale circulation structures. I showed that at the start. These wave train structures organise a persistent meridional flow, and this is the mechanism for generating extremes. Um, and what we know is that this is a large-scale mechanism, and so it generates extremes across the southern hemisphere, uh, so remote to Tasmania, and a at the same, I say approximately the same time because we know there is some propagation in this wave train, so maybe some sort of lag to these remote extremes. And I, what we think is compounds, so we, we're likely to be getting rainfall and temperature extremes in Tasmania around the same time, um, and also perhaps concurrently um, in association with these rainfall extremes in Tasmania, there may be concurrent temperature extremes across uh, the southern hemisphere. Um, and also just to alert you to a uh, poster of my colleague James Risby, um, he's presenting tomorrow um, and sort of similar sort of types of things. So um, I think that's the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure there are questions. Yes. There is. Um, how similar are the individual events to the composite? That's a good question. Um, so it's difficult to, I guess, produce the same types of maps because there is a, a lot more noise associated with the individual events. Um, in the paper, we did, I guess, like an example, of, um, sorry, an analysis into the within sample spread. So how variable um, are is each event? And um, I guess there are some, there is some variability, um, but I think we sh we showed that that these events are sort of unlikely to occur just by chance. Um, so uh, probably if you're interested to have a look at the paper, we, we did quite a, a decent sort of analysis into within sample and out of sample variability in these individual events. Yeah, thanks a lot, a very nice study. So. Uh, you seem to stress the persistence of these waves um, quite a bit, but then uh, it seemed to me a bit in conflict with the fact that they were propagating quite pronouncedly. So could you explain that, maybe? Yeah, I guess um, I was meaning like these anomalies, for example, over Tasmania, that there was persistence, so we're talking, um, and maybe there's, maybe persistence is a subjective word, but Way, I'm talking about, you know, persisting over sort of six, seven days in this one spot over Tasmania and then sort of the associated regions. Um, I guess I would call that a persistent structure, but but then noting that there is some propagation. And I guess um, it, it there is propagation, but it's at a very slow pace. Um, yeah, that's, that's my thought, so... Thank you very much. I think we need to move on, but we'll have time for some more questions in the end of this session. So, um, our next speaker. Yes, our next speaker is Bradfield Lyon from uh, University of Maine, and he will talk about projected increase in the spatial extent of contiguous U.S. summer heat waves and associated attributes. Looking forward. Okay, thank you. I guess we have a correlated extremes. We have some severe weather moving in while we're talking about <laughs> correlated extremes here. I'm going to talk about... Uh, Heat waves today uh, worked on in collaboration with my colleagues listed here. I'm particularly grateful to Ethan who made the data available. Without uh, that, I wouldn't have been able to do the study. A little in the way of motivation, people think, well, in terms of projected changes in climate, heat waves are pretty straightforward, right? Um, here's an example taken out of the, uh, the Climate Science Special Report. Uh, the, the upper left just showing the projected change in annual average temperature for two different forcing scenarios. So if we increase the forcing and learn how to use the, the pointer, 
And that's not how you use the point. <laughs> um, upper left, right? So RCP 4.5, ubiquitous warming. There's some spatial structure to it. Uh, you increase the radiative forcing. You increase the temperature response. Expected, obviously. On the right-hand side, if we look at a specific season, instead of looking at annual average temperature, and we aggregate, say, the number of days above a certain threshold, in this case, they looked at 90 degrees Fahrenheit as some indicator of extreme temperatures. Again, basically ubiquitous warming, right? Consistent. And the bottom, you're, you're seeing an example of a, a, an impact of that on the peak energy demand, daily energy demand. Again, aggregated for some future climate, and you basically see uh, red everywhere, in this case, defined locally being at the, uh, the, the county level with white areas being um, where they didn't have data. But what I'm interested in is the episodic nature, of course, heat waves. I mean, we don't expect them to be uh, a heat wave covering the entire United States at any given time. The past two talks got at the wave dynamics and some of this sort of thing. So I'm interested in the spatial extent of heat waves and their associated attributes. It'd be interesting future work to look at some of the circulation patterns that are associated with these, but this will mainly just look at the statistics. So here's kind of the motivating idea. Here's uh, a heat wave in the upper Midwest in the top plot defined as daily surface temperatures in the NSEP reanalysis exceeding the 95th percentile for that day, and you see this region over the Midwestern states. Let's just say I added a uniform warming just arbitrarily added two degrees C warming to that daily temperature, I'd get the pattern that I see below, where red would be the region that you see above, and the orange being the extra area, the expansion of the heat wave due to the warming, right? So we're increasing the spatial extent of the heat waves, which certainly will have um, impacts of its own, or exacerbating impacts associated with the heat wave in the current uh, climate. So basically what I'm going to do here is uh, compare observations, observation really being the North American Regional Reanalysis, or NAR data. I have daily data from May to September that I'm going to be looking at. I have daily output from 11 CMIP-5 models at the daily time scale. Um, we define a heat wave locally uh, using a relative measure when the maximum, daily maximum, daily minimum, daily mean, or daily apparent TA temperature, actually the maximum daily apparent temperature, exceeds the 95th percentile for at least three consecutive days. Okay. The key bit is the third point that I'm going to then apply an algorithm to the gridded data, whether it be NAR or the CMIP-5, to identify contiguous regions that are in heat waves, and then look at the various attributes within that region. So I'm going to look at the frequency of occurrence of these, the spatial extent, the duration, the normalized magnitude, get that, to that in a second, cooling degree days, and exposed population, at least relative to the population in 2015. Okay. So by normalized anomaly, I'm showing a little plot here at the bottom. Basically, the idea is that as we go from May to September, the variance in daily temperature is going to be changing. So if I want to look at the normalized uh, anomaly tries to get away from that by saying if I have my observed temperature here where this would be the median value I take this difference this is my say 95th uh, percentile threshold this is the observed I take this difference and divide it by the difference between the median and the threshold so as my uh, distribution changes either geographically or within the season uh, that's uh, taken care of by this normalization. In some cases, such as cooling degree days, we actually are interested in the absolute values. So those are computed as well. So the algorithm, this is something out of MATLAB. Actually, I think I stumbled upon this. I was looking up convergence of a horizontal field for a student, and I tumped in CON and MATLAB, and I came up with connected components, and I said, wow, this is a lot more interesting than convergence. And I got the idea, hey, I could apply this to, uh, to temperature data. So the idea is this connectivity. Um, let's say we're at a grid point X here. I can look at my adjacent grid points. This would be a four-point connectivity. I could also include the diagonals, which would be eight-point connectivity to define uh, a region. 
Okay, so what is done is that I have my gridded temperature data, and let's say the gray shaded areas are where locally at each grid point my heat wave has been defined, and I can identify these coherent structures from that. In this case, I'd have these two regions that are distinct from one another. Okay. So I'm going to apply this algorithm, and then over each of these spaces, I can calculate its spatial extent. I can compute the, anything I'd like. I can compute uh, the cooling degree days, the, the exposed population within each of those grid points. So that's, that's the, the idea. idea. Here's an example from NAR of how this algorithm would actually look like. This is just from uh, August of 1980, August 2nd here on the top. It might be a little difficult to see, but in the central part of the country, there's gray shading. That would be a heat wave event that as of that day, the temperature exceeded the 95th percentile for at least three days. Okay, so that's one distinct heat wave region. The following day, we see along the east coast a separate region from that. So that would be a distinct heat wave from what we're looking at in the central part of the country. And in the subsequent day, this event was much of a flash in the pan. It lasted three days, went away. Our region over the uh, south central part of the United States has expanded southward. Okay. So that's what it kind of looks like in the, in the observational data. If we're going to be looking at projections, one thing we might want to consider is, well, how well do the models <laughs> capture what's going on in the current climate before we jump to projections? You could look at this in many different ways. It's a very simple example. If I just look at the frequency of heat wave days, so on the left-hand side is for NAR for three different variables. The top is for maximum daily temperature. The middle is maximum daily apparent temperature. And the bottom is the daily minimum temperature, 1979 to 2009. And the right-hand side is the multi-model mean, or MMM, for 1980 to 2005 of my 11 models. So just the frequency of occurrence. Generally, we get a good correspondence. The little numbers on the lower right panel are the pattern correlations, the main exception being uh, for minimum temperature, which generally tends not to be as frequent as for maximum temperature but particularly over the southern plains of the U.S. I think one possibility of what's going on there is that in this period during observations there were several droughts in, in the United States that we wouldn't expect to be phase-locked within the CMIP-5 models and averaged over 11 models to boot. I think that's part of it. But generally, um, to zeroth order, we're on the same planet. If we look at how the models change relative to themselves. Now we're looking at the left-hand side as the same three variables. We're looking at the frequency of heat wave days in the historical simulation runs, but on the right-hand side are in the projections, the RCP 8.5 forcing for what I'm calling mid-century 2031 to 2055. The patterns remain generally the same, but, but if you look at the scale, we have an order of magnitude difference in terms of the Shade, but generally speaking, a substantial increase in heat wave occurrence in these coherent regions um, over the southern and uh, somewhat southwestern part of the United States across the different variables. Okay. Well, once I have computed these contiguous coherent regions, again, I can integrate across those for different measures. So this is the main summary slide of the results. If I look at the upper left, for example, panel A, the number of events. So the different coloring are for the different temperature variables. So the pinkish, reddish are for daily maximum temperature. The green is for the daily maximum apparent temperature, just trying to get at if you're looking at health impacts, for example, that might be more relevant. The blue is for minimum temperature, and gray is for the daily mean temperature. So in the left panel, say we look at the upper left in the pink colors, the first bar is for NAR, that's the observed uh, number of events averaged across the full period, the roughly 30 years, and we see on average we get about 12 events per year. And I was quite impressed that in aggregate, if we look at historical, the next bar to that 
is the average across the 11 models with the little whiskers being the range across those models. That in aggregate, the, the models actually do a, a very good job in capturing the observed statistics. And that's not just true for maximum temperature. Um, we see that it's true for the other variables in the upper left panel. And we see that in projections, the, the darker shading colors, that the number of events roughly double um, when we get to uh, the, the mid-century under RCP 8.5, which is a rather strenuous amount of forcing, but unfortunately the trajectory we seem to be on is more in the business as usual as of current day. Um, duration in the upper right, we see the same sort of picture that the models do a good job at capturing the observed uh, values across the different variables. Again, roughly a doubling of, of the duration of these contigu contiguous regions. Uh, the middle on the uh, panel C on the left, uh, the maximum daily extent. So the spatial extent of these events, now we're looking at square kilometers, we're saying it's roughly, again, something like an 80% increase uh, by mid-century across the variables, the least increase uh, for minimum uh, daily temperature, the dark blue bar. Um, the average daily extent, we see less of an increase because we're averaging across all events. And some of those are just now becoming in the future with more radiative forcing are just reaching the 95th percentile threshold. So we don't expect all events to be huge. So when we average across all of them, um, they're increasing, but not as dramatically when we include all of them. Similar story for the maximum normalized magnitude and the, the average um, magnitude. So what we're seeing is that we have a substantial increase in all these different components, again, across these contiguous regions, which we can take that much further, something not done in this study, but to look at associated impacts. So for example, let's say we focus in on cooling degree days uh, if we look at the, there's the NAR value on the upper plot on the left, the historical runs again with the range across the 11 models and the daily maximum cooling degree days. So all I'm doing is I'm integrating across, I, I have a defined region, I find its maximum value and that's what's plotted here, averaged across all the heat wave events in projections as well as observations and historical runs. Um, effectively a doubling of that in the, by mid-century. In the bottom, we see a doubling of exposed population to the green being the apparent daily maximum temperature and the gray being the uh, daily mean temperature. The idea there from a health impacts point of view, if you don't get relief from the stress of the daily maximum temperature at night, that has been shown to be uh, a contributing factor to health impacts. Okay, And if we looked at just the extreme events <clears throat> defined here as the 90th percentile uh, for each of these attributes. So for example, if I'm looking at the number of events, so <clears throat> I can compute the average number of events over my 30 year period, right? I have all the events within a given year. If I take the top 10% that have the largest number of events, the highest duration, the top 10 in duration, top 10 in maximum error, and so forth. And I just compute the ratio, in this case, of the projected change relative to historical values. We see that the number of events uh, of the most extreme events that I'm defining here as the 90th percentile increases by a factor of about 1.5 times. The duration um, more than doubles for the most extreme events. The maximum area more than doubles. Uh, the maximum cooling degree days increases by about a factor of 2.5, which is actually, in terms of absolute numbers, it's, it's roughly an order of magnitude greater than the average number of cooling degree days that we see in coherent regions today. So a substantial increase. And same thing for changes in uh, the maximum population exposed to this 
uh, the contiguous heat wave regions, roughly a doubling of the maximum population. Okay. So, in conclusion, um, we've applied this technique looking at these contiguous regions uh, in the CONUS, uh, in observations being NAR and the CMIP-5 models. We see that across most of these attributes, they roughly double uh, by mid-century. And in terms of this conference, I think what's particularly interesting is we can take this further now to say, well, let's think of how this relates to specific inputs, uh, impacts, one of them being something I'm interested in, in impacts on the energy sector, particularly meeting peak demand, which is particularly troublesome uh, in that realm. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Time for one quick question. Yes. Um, thanks for the presentation. You do this analysis uh, using the threshold from the historical period, right, and keeping the same threshold throughout? Right. Do you think, um, have you looked at whether you see any changes in the average area or max area if you allow the threshold to change, so sort of like you're assuming that people are adapting to their local temperatures? Yeah, I mean, you can define them however you would like. In this case, it's, I mean, that's an important point that how well will people adapt to these future changes. That's something that I'm not really looking at here. Relative, to, I'm just saying relative to the baseline of the current climate, this would be the, the changes that we're seeing. Now, the impacts, as you're suggesting, may not be as bad as what some of these numbers may be, say, exposed population. As people become acclimated to slowly increasing temperatures over time, that impact might not be as big as comparing it to the current climate. That would certainly be, I think, true. So. Right, right. Yeah, I was just wondering if I could imagine there, if there is some change in variance or something happening, maybe even if you're changing the threshold, you'd see some change in area. So, but I would expect it's probably not large. Yeah, I, I didn't, this is totally non-parametric, so I didn't assume anything about the distribution or variance changes or anything like that, but, it, you know, that's something of interest to cover. I'm sorry, I think I have to postpone your question to the discussion. Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to announce our last speaker of this session, Lisa Ankautz from KIT. And she will talk about forecast variability of the blocking system over Russia in summer 2010. Good, good evening, everybody, and thanks for the introduction. Today I show some results of my PhD thesis, which was already defended in 2017 and was part of the Pandova project. And first of all, I want to thank my co-authors. And special thanks go to my supervisors, Sarah Jones and Olivia. <laughs> so I will start with some facts about the Russian heat wave in 2010. It lasted around six weeks in summer and it caused around 56,000 fatalities and was related to an economic loss around 15 billion US dollar. And a special thing about the seed wave was its linkage to the Pakistan floods occurring in July. And um, the responsible synoptic flow pattern was an omega block at 40 degrees east which shows the importance why we should care about the predictability of atmospheric blocking. So this is just an overview showing you the duration of the heat wave itself and also the dates for the rain events in Pakistan and um, the evolution of the atmospheric blocking event. And today I just want to focus on the onset phase of the blocking system with focus on its forecast variability the impact of the forecast variability on surface conditions as well as sources of uncertainty in the synoptic pattern. So this is an overview of our approach. And we use medium range multimodal ensemble forecast from the TIGI project. And we include three ensemble prediction systems so that we have in total 96 ensemble members 
and um, we selected three ensemble forecasts and um, one forecast for each phase of the um, life cycle phase of the block respectively and to investigate the forecast variability we did an empirical orthogonal function analysis and with these patterns um, we made a fuzzy clustering and with the fuzzy clustering we could identify different development scenarios with blocked and unblocked situations and another comparison of these development scenarios was um, for the surface and we calculated two heat indices as well as commonly used temperature thresholds and uh, fire risk index to quantify the heat evolution. And independently from these um, investigations, we also did an ensemble sensitivity analysis, which was developed in 2008 by Torn and Hakim, and we used this approach to identify sources of uncertainty which were important for the predictability of the blocking system. So this is the forecast which includes the onset phase of the block. Um, it was initialized on the 14th of June. You see here in this Hofmüller plot um, longitude against time and uh, the shading is the ensemble spread in the 500 hectopascal geopotential height. And the black dotted area is some kind of blocking index um, calculated from the analysis. And as the um, um, atmospheric block evolves here, you see an increase in the ensemble spread. And the red horizontal line shows you our clustering time, which is equal to the metric time. You need the metric time for the ensemble sensitivity approach. And there's another investigation time here, a gray horizontal line. And this is a point in time where we looked at the differences in the development scenarios as well as the surface impacts. Here are the results from the EOF approach and the fuzzy clustering. On the left-hand side, you have the leading and the second EOF as contours. And the shading is the ensemble mean of the 500 hectopascal geopotential height. And um, here the leading EOF shows you here in, in the area of the blocking system, which could be seen here in the ensemble mean. There, there are differences in the ensemble regarding the amplitude of the blocking system. And the second EOF shows you that the um, ensemble members could be shifted to the east or to the west. So it's some kind of amplitude pattern here and the shift pattern here. And with these EOFs, um, you can uh, trigger this clustering algorithm. You see in the phase space of the first and the second principal component, the four cluster solution. And each symbol is one ensemble member. Um, for comparison, here is the, um, the analysis members. And for example, here the second cluster includes ensemble members having an amplified blocking ridge a little bit shifted to the west. And then we selected for each cluster a representative member close to the cluster means. So, um, that we can identify development scenarios. So for four clusters, we have four scenarios. Um, here as shading the geopotential height, once again, and mean sea level pressure as contour. And um, as reference, the analysis, and you see there's a blocking ridge in three or four scenarios. So you have a high predictability of the blocking system. However, there are differences in the amplitude, the shape, and the exact position of the block. And there's also an 
impact on the surface. Here you have a heat index, the Canadian hu Humidex, averaged over an area of hottest temperatures around Moscow. And you see in the time evolution that scenarios with block have an increase in heat intensity, um, which is similar to the development in, in the analysis, while you have a moderate values of the humidex in the scenario without block. And this shows you some kind of dynamical linkage between the atmospheric blocking pattern and the heat evolution at the surface. And it also shows you that there is a transfer of the predictability of the block to the predictability of the heat wave in the medium range perspective. Okay, and independently from these results, you make a little jump to um, other results from the ensemble sensitivity analysis. You have here the metric time, and in this approach, you describe a metric, in this case, the blocking system, and um, this metric is correlated to different state variables where you go back in time. So this is one, two, and three days before the metric time. And you have as contours, once again, the ensemble B of the different corresponding state variables.